So my first day of being a full-time streamer, I wanted to do something a little ridiculous. So I read through the entire Neovim user manual in one 10-hour stream. My hope is that now, instead of telling your friends that you are RTFM, reading the friendly manual, you'll be able to tell them that you are LTFM, listening to friendly manual. If you learned anything really cool or something new and interesting, let me know in the comments and let's get listening. See ya! Chapter 1. About the manuals. This chapter introduces the manuals available with them. Read this to know the conditions under which the commands are explained. Chapter 1, Part 1. Two manuals. The Vim documentation consists of two parts, the user manual, task-oriented explanations from simple to complex, reads from start to end like a book, the reference manual, precise description of how everything in Vim works. The notations in these manuals is explained here in notation. Jumping around, the text contains hyperlinks between the two parts, allowing you to quickly jump between the description of an editing task and a precise explanation of the commands and option used for it. Use these two commands, press Control right bracket to jump to a subject under the cursor, and press Control O to jump back. Repeat to go further back. Many links are in vertical bars like this, bar, bars, bar. The bars themselves may be hidden or invisible, see below. An option name like single quote, number, single quote, a command in double quotes like quote, colon, write, quote, and any other word can also be used as a link. Try it out. Move the cursor to control right bracket and press control right bracket on it. <clears throat> other subjects can be found with the help command, see help.txt. The bars and stars are usually hidden with the conceal feature. They also use hl-ignore using the same color for the text as the background. You can make them visible with set conceal level equals zero, high link help bar normal, and high link help star normal. Chapter two, chapter one, part two, Vim installed. To create an empty VimRC, call make dir of standard path of config with the second argument of p. Execute, edit, standard path config, concatenated with init.vim, and write. For more info, see vimrc. Chapter 1, Part 3, Using the Vim Tutor. Instead of reading the text, boring, you can use colon tutor to learn your first Vim commands. This is a 30-minute tutorial that teaches the most basic Vim functionality hands-on. To start the tutorial, execute colon tutor from within NeoVim. The tutorial will lead you from that point. Have fun! Chapter 1, Part 4 Copyright. The Vim User Manual and Reference Manual are copyright 1988 by Bram Molinar. This material may be distributed only subject to the terms and conditions set forth in the Open Publication License, V1.0 or later. The latest version is presently available at www.opencontent.org slash openpub. People who contribute to the manuals must agree with the above copyright notice. Parts of the user manual come from the book VI Improved-Vim by Steve Olean. Sorry, Steve, I'm not sure if that's how you say your name. Published by New Riders Publishing, ISBN 07357-10015. The open publication license applies to this book. Only selected parts are included, and these have been modified, for example, by removing the pictures and updating the text for Vim 6.0 and later, fixing mistakes. The omission of the from book tag does not mean that the text does not come from the book. Many thanks to Steve O and New Writers for creating this book and publishing it under the OPL. It has been a great help while writing the user manual not only by providing literal text, but also by setting the tone and style. If you make money through selling the manuals, you are strongly encouraged to donate part of the profit to help AIDS victims in Uganda. See ICCF. Chapter two, the first steps in Vim. This chapter provides you just enough information to edit a file with Vim. Not well or fast, but you can edit. 
Take some time to practice with these commands. They form the base for what follows. Chapter 2, Part 1. Running Vim for the first time. To start Vim, enter this command, gvim file.txt. On Unix, you can type this at any command prompt. If you are running Microsoft Windows, open a command prompt and enter the command. In either case, Vim starts adding an, editing a file called file.txt. Because this is a new file, you get a blank window. Your screen will look like an empty screen with your cursor on the first line, followed by tildes on all the next lines, and then file.txt new on the last line. The tilde lines indicate lines not in the file. In other words, when Vim runs out of file to display, it displays tilde lines. At the bottom of the screen, a message line indicates the file is named file.txt and shows that you are creating a new file. The message information is temporary and other information overwrites it. The Vim command. The gvim command causes the editor create a new window for editing. If you use this command, vim file.txt, the editing occurs inside your command window. In other words, if you are running inside an xterm, the editor uses your xterm window. If you are using this command under Microsoft Windows, the editing occurs inside this window. The text in the window will look the same for both versions, but with gvim you have extra features, like a menu bar. More about that later. Chapter 2, Part 2, Inserting Text The Vim editor is a modal editor. That means that the editor behaves differently depending on which mode you are in. The two basic modes are called Normal Mode and Insert Mode. In Normal Mode, the characters you type are commands. In Insert Mode, the characters are inserted as text. Since you have just started Vim, it will be in Normal Mode. To start Insert Mode, you type the I command. I for Insert. Then you can enter the text. It will be inserted into the file. Do not worry if you make mistakes, you can correct them later. To enter the following programmer's limerick, this is what you will type. I, a very intelligent turtle, found programming Unix a hurdle. After typing turtle, you press the enter key to start a new line. Finally, you press the escape key to stop insert mode and to go back to normal mode. You now have two lines of text in your Vim window, which will look like the first line, a very intelligent turtle, and the second line, found programming Unix a hurdle, and any remaining lines will be tildes. What is the mode? To be able to see what mode you are in, type this command, set show mode. You will notice that when typing the colon, Vim moves the cursor to the last line of the window. That's where you type colon commands, or commands that start with a colon. Finish this command by pressing the Enter key. All commands that start with a colon are finished this way. Now, if you type the I command, Vim will display dash dash insert dash dash at the bottom of the window. This indicates you are in insert mode. If you press escape to go back to normal mode, the last line will be made blank. Getting out of trouble. One of the problems for Vim novices is mode confusion, which is caused by forgetting which mode you are in or by accidentally typing a command that switches modes. To get back to normal mode, no matter what mode you are in, press the escape key. Sometimes you have to press it twice. If Vim beeps, beeps back at you, you are already in normal mode. Chapter two, part three, moving around. After you return to normal mode, you can move around by using these keys, H for left, J for down, K for up, and L for right. At first, it may appear that these commands were chosen at random. After all, who ever heard of using L for right? But actually, there's a very good reason for these choices. Moving the cursor is the most common thing you do in an editor, and these keys are on the home row of your right hand. In other words, these commands are placed where you can type them the fastest, especially when you type with 10 fingers. Note, you can also move the cursor by using the arrow keys. If you do, however, you greatly slow down your editing because to press the arrow keys, you must move your hand from the text keys to the arrow keys. Considering that you might be doing it hundreds of times an hour, this can take a significant amount of time. Also, there are keyboards which do not have arrow keys 
or which locate them in unusual places. Therefore, knowing the use of the HJKL keys helps in those situations. One way to remember these commands is that H is on the left, L is on the right, J points down. So in a picture, if you think about it, H for left, J for down, K for up, and L. The best way to learn these commands is by using them. Use the I command to insert some lines of text. Then use the HJKL keys to move around and insert a word somewhere. Don't forget to press escape to go back to normal mode. Colon Tutor is also a nice way to learn by doing. For Japanese users, Hiroshi Iwatani suggested using this. H for Huan Ho, the Yellow River, K, Komsomsk, and L for Los Angeles, and J for Java, the island, not the programming language. <clears throat> Chapter 2, Part 4, Deleting Characters. To delete a character, move the cursor over it and type X. This is a throwback to the old days of the typewriter, when you deleted things by typing XXX over them. Move the cursor to the beginning of the first line, for example, and type XXX, XXXX, which is seven X's, to delete a very. The result should look like this. From your previous limerick, you now only have intelligent turtle in the first line and found programming Unix a hurdle on the second. Now you can insert new text, for example, I to go back into insert mode and A young escape. This begins an insert, inserts the word a young, and then exits insert mode, which is the final escape. The result is a young intelligent turtle found programming Unix a hurdle. <clears throat> deleting a line. To delete a whole line, use the dd command. The following line will then move up to fill the gap. Deleting a line break. In Vim, you can join two lines together which means that the line break between them is deleted. The capital J command does this. Take these two lines, a young intelligent, and then on another line, turtle. Move the cursor to the first line and press capital J. They will now be joined to one single line of a young intelligent turtle. Chapter two, part five, undo and redo. Suppose you delete too much. Well, you can type it in again, but an easier way exists. The U command undoes the last edit. Take a look at this in action. After using DD to delete the first line, U brings it back. Another one. Move the cursor to the capital A on the first line of A Young Intelligent Turtle. Type XXXXX to delete it A Young, and the result is as follows intelligent turtle. <clears throat> Type U to undo the last delete. That delete removed the G, so the undo restores that character. The next U command restores the next to last character deleted, which would be an N, and the next U command gives you a U, and so on. If you undo too many times, you can press Control R for redo to reverse the preceding command. In other words, it undoes the undo. To see this in action, press Control R twice. The character A and the space after it disappear. There's a special version of the undo command, the capital U for undo line command. The undo line command undoes all the changes made on the last line that was edited. Typing this command twice cancels the preceding capital U. So if you deleted very and turtle from the line and all you had was a intelligent, you could restore the entire line with a capital U to a very intelligent turtle. And if you pressed capital U again, you could undo that with U. The capital U command is a change by itself, which the lowercase u command undoes and capital R redoes. This might be a bit confusing, don't worry. With U and Control R, you can go to any of the situations you had. More about that in section 32.2. Chapter 2, Part 6. Other editing commands. Vim has a large number of commands to change the text. See Q underscore in and below. A 
appending. The I command inserts a character before the character under the cursor. That works fine, but what happens if you want to add stuff at the end of the line? For that, you need to insert text after the cursor. This is done with the A for append command. For example, to change the line, and that's not saying much for the turtle to, and that's not much that's not saying much for the turtle exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark move the cursor over to the dot at the end of the line then press x to delete the period the cursor is now positioned at the end of the line on the e in turtle now type a exclamation mark exclamation mark exclamation mark escape to append three more exclamation points after the e in turtles <clears throat> opening up a new line the o command creates a new empty line below the cursor and puts vim in insert mode. Then you can type the text for the new line. Suppose the cursor is somewhere in the first of these two lines, a very intelligent turtle found programming Unix a hurdle. If you now use the O command and type new text, O, that liked using vim, escape, the result is now a very intelligent turtle that liked using vim found programming Unix a hurdle. The capital O command opens a line above the cursor using a count. Suppose you want to move up nine lines. You can type KKK, 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 or you can enter the command 9K. In fact, you can proceed many commands with a number. Earlier in this chapter, for instance, you added three exclamation points to the line by typing A, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, escape. Another way to do this is to use the command 3 a exclamation mark escape. The count of three tells the command that follows to triple its effect. Similarly, to delete three characters, use the command 3x. The count always comes before the command it applies to. <clears throat> Chapter 2, Part 7, Getting Out. To exit, use the capital Z, capital Z command. The command writes the file and exits. Unlike many other editors, Vim does not automatically make a backup file. If you type zz, your changes are committed and there's no turning back. You can configure the Vim editor to produce backup files. See chapter seven, part four. Discarding changes. Sometimes you will make a sequence of changes and suddenly realize you were better off before you started. Not to worry. Vim has a quit and throw things away command. It is colon Q exclamation mark. Don't forget to press enter to finish the command. For those of you interested in the details, the three parts of this command are the colon, which enters command line mode, the Q, which tells the editor to quit, and the override command mo modifier, which is the exclamation mark. The override command modifier is needed because Vim is very reluctant to throw away changes. If you were to just type colon Q, Vim would display an error message and refuse to exit. Error 37, no write since last change. Use exclamation to override. By specifying the override, you are in effect telling Vim, I know that what I'm doing looks stupid, but I really want to do this. If you want to continue editing with Vim, the E exclamation mark command reloads the original version of the file. Chapter two, part eight, finding help. Everything you always wanted to know can be found in the Vim help files. Don't be afraid to ask. If you know what you're looking for, it's usually easier to search for it using the help system instead of using Google, because the subjects follow a certain style guide. Also, the help has the advantage of belonging to your particular Vim version. You won't see help for commands added later. These would not work for you. To get generic help, use this command, help. You could also use the first function key, F1. If your keyboard has a help key, it might work as well. If you don't supply a subject, help displays the general help window. The creators of Vim did something very clever, or very lazy, with the help system. They made the help window a normal editing window. You can use all the normal Vim commands to move through the help information. Therefore, H, J, K, L, move left, down, up, and right. To get out of the help window, use the same command you would to get out of the editor, ZZ. This will only close the help window and not exit Vim. As you read the help text, you will notice some text enclosed in vertical bars, for example, help. This indicates a hyperlink. 
If you position the cursor anywhere between the bars and pr press control right bracket, which is jump to tag, the help system takes you to the indicated subject. For reasons not discussed here, the Vim terminology for a hyperlink is tag. So control right bracket jumps to the location of the tag given by the word under the cursor. After a few jumps, you might want to go back. Control T for pop tag takes you back to the preceding position. Control O, jump to older position, also works nicely here. At the top of the help screen, there is the notation help.txt. This name between the star characters is used by the help system to define a tag, which is a hyperlink destination. See chapter nine, part one for details about using tags. To get help on a given subject, use the following command, colon help, and then the subject. To get help on the X command, for example, enter the following, colon help, X. To find out how to delete text, use this command, colon help, deleting. To get a complete index of all Vim commands, use the following command, colon help, index. When you need help for a particular control character command, for example, control A, you need to spell it with the prefix control dash. So colon help, CTRL dash A. The Vim editor has many different modes. By default, the help system displays the normal mode commands. For example, the following commands display help for the normal mode, control H command, colon help, CTRL dash H. To identify other modes, use a mode prefix. If you want the help for the insert mode version of a command, use I underscore. For control H, this gives you the following command, colon help, I underscore CTRL dash H. When you start the Vim editor, <clears throat> you can use several command line arguments. These all begin with a dash. To find out what the dash T argument does, for example, use the command colon help dash T. The Vim editor has a number of options that enable you to configure and customize the editor. If you want help for an option, you need to enclose it in single quotation marks. To find out what the number option does, for example, use the following command colon help, single quote, number, single quote. The table with all mode prefixes can be found below help dash summary. Special keys are enclosed in angle brackets. To find help on the up arrow key in insert mode, for example, use this command, colon help, I underscore left angle bracket, UP right angle bracket. If you see an error message that you don't understand, for example, E37, no write since last change, you can use the error ID at the start to find help about it. Colon help E37. <clears throat> help summary. Use control D after typing a topic and let Vim show all available topics or press tab to complete. For example, colon help sum tab. More information on how to use the help can be found in colon help, help, help. Follow the links in bars to related help. You can go from the detailed help to the user documentation, which describes certain commands more from a user perspective and less detailed. For example, after help pattern.txt, you can see the user guide topics, chapter three, part nine, and user 27.txt in the introduction. If you only know you are looking for certain option, you can also do helpoptions.txt. To open the help page, which describes all option handling, and then search using regular expression, for example, text with, certain options have their own namespace, for example, colon help, CPO, dash, and then there's letters, for the corresponding flag of the CPO option settings. Substitute letter for a specific flag, for example, help, CPO dash semicolon. And for GUI options, the same thing with help, GO dash, and then the letter. Normal mode commands do not have a prefix. To go to the help page for GT command, just write colon help GT. Insert mode commands start with I underscore. Help for deleting a word is colon help I underscore control dash W. Visual mode commands start with V underscore. Help for jumping to the other side of the visual area is colon help V underscore O. 
Command line editing and arguments start with C underscore. Help for using the command argument percent would be colon help C underscore percent. X commands always start with colon. So to go to the colon S command, you would write colon help colon S. Commands specifically for debugging start with the right angle bracket. To go to the help for the cont debug command, write colon help right bracket right angle bracket cont. Key combinations. They usually start with a single letter indicating the mode for which they can be used. For example, colon help I underscore control dash X takes you to the family of control X commands for insert mode, which can be used to autocomplete different things. Note that certain keys will always be written the same. For example, control will always be written CTRL. For normal mode commands, there is no prefix and the topic is available at colon help control dash letter. For example, colon help control dash W in contrast with colon help C underscore control dash R, which will describe what the control R does when entering commands in the command line and colon help V underscore control dash A talks about incrementing numbers in visual mode and help G underscore control dash A talks about how the G control A command, for example, when you have to press G, then control A. Here the G stands for the normal command G, which always expects a second key before doing something similar to the commands starting with Z. Regex items always start with a forward slash. So to get help for the plus quantifier in Vim regexes, you must write colon help forward slash backslash plus. If you need to know everything about regular expressions, start reading at colon help pattern.txt. Registers always start with double quotes. To find out about the special colon register help quote colon. Vim script is available at help eval.txt. Certain aspects of the language are available at help expert dash x, where x is a single letter. For example, colon help expert dash exclamation will take you to the topic describing the exclamation or not operator from VimScript. Also important is help function dash list to find a short description of all functions available. Help topics for VimScript functions always include the left parenthesis and right parenthesis. So colon help append left parenthesis right parenthesis talks about the append VimScript function rather than how to append text in the current buffer. <clears throat> Mappings are talked about in the help page, colon help map.txt. Use colon help map mode dash i to find out about the imap command. Also use the colon map dash topic to find out about certain subtopics particular for mappings. For example, colon help colon map dash local for buffer local mappings or colon help map dash bar for how the bar is handled in mappings. Command definitions are talked about colon help command dash topic. So use colon help command dash bar to find out about the bang exclamation for custom commands. Window management commands always start with control W. So you find the corresponding help at colon help control dash W underscore letter. For example, colon help control dash W underscore P for moving the previous accessed window. You can also access colon help windows.txt and read your way through if you are looking for window handling commands. Use colon help grep to search in all help pages and also of any installed plugins. Use help grep for how to use it. <clears throat> to search for a topic, colon help grep topic. This takes you to the first match. To go to the next one, colon see next. All matches are available in the quick fix window, which can be opened with colon C open. Move around to the match you like and press enter to jump to that help. The user manual. This describes help topics for users in a beginner friendly way. Start at user toc to find the table of content. 
as you might have guessed, health, user underscore toc.txt. Skim over the contents to find interesting topics. The digraphs and entering special character items are in chapter 24. So to go to that particular help page, help user underscore 24.txt. Also, if you want to access a certain chapter in the help, the chapter number can be accessed directly like this, colon help 10.1, which goes to chapter 10.1 in user 10 and talks about recording macros. Highlighting groups. Always start with HL dash group name. For example, colon help HL dash warning message talks about the warning message highlighting group. Syntax highlighting is namespaced to syn dash topic. For example, help syn dash conceal talks about the conceal argument for the colon syn or syntax command. Quick fix commands usually start with colon c, while location list commands usually start with colon l. Auto command can, events can be found by their name, colon help buff win leave. To see all possible events, colon help events. Command line switches always start with dash. For the help of the dash f command, switch of vim, use colon help dash f. Optional features always start with plus. To find out about the conceal feature, use colon help plus conceal. Documentation for included file type specific functionality is usually available in the form of ft dash, the file type, dash functionality. So, colon help ft dash c dash syntax talks about the C syntax file and the options it provides. Sometimes additional sections for omni-completion or file type plugins are available. Error and warning codes can be looked up directly in the help. So, help E297 takes you exactly to the description of the swap error message and colon help W10 talks about the warning changing a read-only file. Sometimes, however, those error codes are not described but are rather listed at the vim command that usually causes this. So, colon help E128 takes you to the function command. <clears throat> Chapter 3, Moving Around Before you can insert or delete text, the cursor has to be moved to the right place. Vim has a large number of commands to position the cursor. This chapter shows you how to use the most important ones. You can find a list of these commands below Q underscore LR. Chapter 3, Part 1, Word Movement To move the cursor forward one word, use the W command. Like most Vim commands, you can use a numeric prefix to move past multiple words. For example, 3W moves three words. For example, if your cursor is on this is a line with example text, and it's within the word this, when you press W, it will move to is, and then W again to a, and then W again to line. If you press 3W, you will move past three words, line with example. Notice that W moves to the start of the next word if it is already at the start of a word. The B command moves backward to the start of the previous word. So, if you're in the middle of the word example and you press B, you'll move to the E. And if you press 2B, you would move back two words. There's also the E command that moves to the next end of a word and GE, which moves to the previous end of a word. If you are at the last word of a line, the W command will take you to the first word in the next line. Thus, you can use this to move through a paragraph much faster than using L. B does the same in the other direction. A word ends at a non-word character, such as dot, dash, or right parenthesis. To change what Vim considers to be a word, see the is keyword option. If you try this out in the help directly, is keyword needs to be reset for the examples to work colon set is keyword ampersand. It is also possible to move by whitespace separated words. This is not a word in the normal 
sense. That's why it's uppercased, capital W, capital O, capital R, capital D. The command for moving by words, all uppercase, is as the fi is as the figure below shows, which would be if you were in some kind of special word like special slash separated slash words, a small w would only move you past the first slash while a capital W would move you past that entire word. With this mix of lowercase and uppercase commands, you can quickly move forward and backward through a paragraph. Chapter 3, Part 2. Moving to the start or end of a line. The dollar sign command moves the cursor to the end of a line. If your keyboard has an end key, it will do the same. The caret command moves to the first non-blank character of the line, and the zero command moves to the very first character of the line, and the home key does the same thing. In a picture where dot indicates a space, if you have empty space before this is a line with example text, zero would move you to the very beginning before the space, a caret would move you to the capital T at the beginning of this, and a dollar sign would move you all the way to the end. The dollar sign command takes account, like most movement commands, but moving to the end of the line several times doesn't make sense. Therefore, it causes the editor to move to the end of another line. For example, one dollar sign moves you to the end of the first line, the one you're on. Two dollar sign moves you to the end of the next line, and so on. The zero command doesn't take a count argument because the zero would be part of the count. Unexpectedly, using a count with caret doesn't have any effect. Chapter 3, Part 3, Moving to a Character One of the most useful movement commands is the single character search command. The command fx searches forward in the line for a single character x. Hint, f stands for find. For example, you are at the beginning of the following line. Suppose you want to go to the h of human. Just execute the command fh and the cursor will be positioned over the h. So if you are anywhere before to air is human and you press FH, you will move to the H of human. This also shows that the command FY moves to the end of the word really. You can specify a count. Therefore, you can go to the L of foul with three FL. So you could skip the two L's of to really foul. You could skip the two L's and move to the L in foul with three FL. The capital F command searches to the left. The TX command works like the FX, except it stops one character before the search character. Hint, the T stands for two. The backward version of this is capital TX. These four commands can be repeated with semicolon, and comma repeats in the other direction. The cursor is never moved to another line, not even when the sentence continues. Sometimes you will start a search only to realize that you have typed the wrong command. If you type F to search backward, for example, only to realize that you really meant capital F. To abort a search, press escape. So F escape is an aborted search and doesn't do anything. Note, escape cancels most operations, not just search. Chapter three, part four, matching a parenthesis. When writing a program, you often end up with nested, left parenthesis, right parenthesis constructs. Then the percent command is very handy. It moves to the matching parent. If the cursor is on a left parent, it will move to the matching right parent. If it's on a right parent, it will move to the matching left parent. This also works for brackets and squirrely braces. This can be defined with a match pairs option. When the cursor is not on a useful character, the percent will search forward to find one. Thus, if the cursor is at the start of a line of the previous example, percent will search forward and find the first parenthesis, and then it moves to it match. So if you're at the beginning of line with an if statement and you press parenthesis, it will take you to the corresponding matching parenthesis. Other ways to move around in the code can be found in chapter 29. Chapter 3, Part 5, Moving to a Specific Line If you're a C or C++ programmer, you are familiar with error messages such as the following. 
prog c colon 33 colon j undeclared first use in this function this tells you that you might want to fix something on line 33 so how do you find line 33 one way is to do 99999k to go to the top of the file and 32j to go down 32 lines it is not a good way but it works a much better way of doing things is to use the capital g command with account this command positions you at a given line number for example 33 capital g puts you on line 33. for a better way of going through a compiles error list see user 30 for information on the make command with no argument g positions you at the end of the file a quick way to go to the start of a file is using gg lowercase one capital g will do the same but is a tiny bit more typing another way to move to the line using the percent command with account for example 50 percent moves you halfway through the file and 90 percent goes to near the end the previous assumes that you want to move to a line in the file no matter if it's currently visible or not but what if you want to move to one of the lines you can see this figure shows the three commands you can use h m and l h stands for home and all of these are capital capital m for middle and capital l for last alternatively it could be capital h for high capital m for middle and capital l for low so h will move you to the top line of your current screen m to the middle line of your current screen and l to the lowest line of your current screen chapter three part six telling where you are to see where you are in a file there are three ways use the control g command you get a message like this user 3.txt line 233 of 650 35 percent columns 45 to 52. this shows the name of the file you are editing the line number where the cursor is the total number of lines and the percentage of the way through the file and the column of the cursor sometimes you will see a split column number for example call 2-9 this indicates that the cursor is positioned on the second character but because a character one is a tab occupying eight spaces worth of columns the screen column is nine another option is set the quote number option this will display a line number in front of every line so you can write colon set number and to switch this off again colon set no number since number is a boolean option prepending no to its name has the same effect of switching it off a boolean option only has these two values it is either on or off BIM has many options. Besides the Boolean ones, there are options with a numerical value and string options. You will see examples of this where they are used. And your third option is to set the ruler option. This will display the cursor position in the lower right corner of the VIM window, colon set ruler. Using the ruler option has the advantage that it doesn't take much room. Thus, there is more space for your text. Chapter three, part seven, scrolling around. The control U command scrolls down half of a screen of text. Think of looking through a viewing window at the text and moving this window up by half the height of the window. Thus the window moves up over the text, which is backward in the file. Don't worry if you have a little trouble remembering which end is up. Most users have the same problem. Control D moves the viewing window down a half screen in the file, thus scrolls the text up half a screen. To scroll one line at a time, use control E, which is for scroll up, and control Y for scroll down. Think of control E to give you one line extra. If you use MS Windows compatible key mappings, control Y will redo a change instead of scroll. To scroll forward by a whole screen, except for two lines, use control F. To scroll backwards, use control B. These should be easy to remember, F for forwards and B for backwards. A common issue is that after moving down many lines with J, your cursor is at the bottom of the screen. You would like to see the context of the line with the cursor. That's done with the lowercase z, lowercase z command. The zt command puts the cursor line at the top and zb at the bottom. There are a few more scrolling commands, cq underscore sc. To always keep a few lines of context around the cursor, use the scroll off option. Chapter three, part eight, simple searches. To search for a string, use the slash string command. To find the word include, for example, use the command slash include. 
You will notice that when you type the slash, the cursor jumps to the last line of the Vim window, like with colon commands. This is where you type the word. You can press the backspace, back arrow or backspace key, to make corrections. Use the left or right cursor keys when necessary. Pressing enter executes the command. Note, the characters dot, star, left bracket, right bracket, caret, percent, slash, backslash, question mark, tilde, and dollar sign have special meanings. If you want to use them in a search, you must put a backslash in front of them. See below. To find the next occurrence of the same string, use the n command. Use this to find the first include after the cursor, so slash, pound, include. And then type n several times. You will move to each include in the text. You can also use a count if you know which match you want. Thus, 3n finds the third match. You can also use a count with the colon, for slash the goes to the fourth match of the. The question mark command works like slash, but searches backwards. So question mark word searches backwards. The capital N command repeats the last search in the opposite direction. Thus using capital N after slash searches backwards, but capital N after question mark searches forwards. Ignoring case. Normally, you have to type exactly what you want to find. If you don't care about upper or lower case in a word, set the ignore case option. If you now search for word, it will also find capital W word or capitals all uppercase word. To match case again, you can do set no ignore case. History. Suppose you do three searches, slash one, slash two, and slash three. Now let's start searching by typing a simple slash without pressing enter. If you press up the cursor key, Vim puts slash three on the command line. Pressing enter at this point searches for three. If you do not press enter but press up instead, Vim changes the prompt to slash two. Another press of the up key moves you to one. You can also use the down cursor key to move through the history of search commands in the other direction. If you know what a previously used pattern starts with and you want to use it again, type the character before pressing up. With the previous example, you can type slash o up and Vim will put slash one on the command line. The commands starting with colon also have a history. That allows you to recall a previous command and execute it again. Those two histories are separate. Searching for a word in the text. Suppose you see the word, the long function name, in the text and you want to find the next occurrence of it. You could type slash the long function name, but that's a lot of typing. And when you make a mistake, Vim won't find it. There is an easier way. Position the cursor on the word and use the star command. Vim will grab the word under the cursor and use it as the search string. The pound command does the same in the other direction. You can prepend a count. So three star searches for the third occurrence of the word under the cursor. Searching for whole words. If you type this, if you type slash the, it will also match there. To only find words that end in the, use slash the and then a backslash right bracket, right angle bracket. The slash right angle bracket item is a special marker that only matches at the end of the word. Similarly, slash left angle bracket only matches at the beginning of a word. Thus, to search for the word the only, use slash backslash left angle bracket and then the and then a backslash right angle bracket. This does not match there or soothe. Notice the star and pound commands use the start of word and end of word markers to only find whole words. You can use the G star and g pound to match partial words. Highlighting matches. While editing a program, you see a variable called nr. You want to check where it's used. You could move the cursor to nr and use the star command and press n to go to all the other matches. Vim will highlight all the matches. That's a very good way to see where the variable is used without the need to type commands. To switch this off, use set no hl search. Then you need to switch it on again if you want to use it for the next command, set hl search. If you only want to remove the highlighting, use the command colon no hl search. 
This doesn't reset the option. Instead, it disables the highlighting. As soon as you execute a search command, the highlighting will be used again, also for the N and capital N commands. Tuning searches. There are a few options that change how searching works. These are the essential ones. Set, no wrap scan. This stops the search at the end of the file. Or when you are searching backwards, it stops the search at the start of the file. The wrap scan option is on by default, thus searching wraps around the end of the file. Set no ink search. This disables the display of matches while you are still typing the search. Intermezzo. If you like one of the options mentioned before and set it each time you use Vim, you can put the command in your Vim startup file. Edit the file, for example, with colon edit tilde slash dot config slash nvim slash init dot vim, and then add a line with the command to set the option, just like you typed it into vim. Example, colon set hl search escape, right? So you can type that in. G moves to the end of the file, O starts a new line where you type the set command, and you end insert with, with escape. Then write and close the file with capital ZZ. If you now start Vim again, the HL search option will already be set. Chapter 3, Part 9 Simple Search Patterns. The Vim editor uses regular expressions to specify what to search for. Regular expressions are an extremely powerful and compact way to specify a search pattern. Unfortunately, this power comes at a price because regular expressions are a bit tricky to specify. In this section, we mention only a few essential ones. More about search patterns and commands can be found in chapter 27. You can find the full explanation here with pattern. Beginning and ending of a line. The caret character matches the beginning of a line. On an English US keyboard, you can find it above the six. The pattern include matches the word include anywhere on the line, but the pattern character include matches the whole matches the word include only if it is at the beginning of a line. The dollar sign character matches the end of a line. Therefore, was dollar sign matches the word was only if it's at the end of a line. <clears throat> Let's mark the places where slash the matches in the example line with X's. So the soldier holding one of the chips melted and the is the sentence. It matches all of the thes. When using slash the dollar sign, we only match the very last the of the sentence at the end of the line, and with slash caret the, we find that only the first the at the beginning of the line is matched. The solder holding one of the chips. That makes more sense. Dan, fix that later. You can try searching with slash caret the dollar sign, and it will only match if a single line consists entirely of the. White space does matter here. Thus, if a line contains a space after the word, like the, the pattern will not match. Matching any single character. The dot character matches any existing character. For example, the pattern c.m matches a string whose first character is a c and whose second character is anything and whose third character is m. For example, computer, it would match, and became, it would also match. Matching special characters. If you really want to match a dot, you must avoid its special meaning by putting a backslash before it. If you search for ter dot, you will find the matches computer with a space or winter with a dot. Searching for ter backslash dot only finds the end of the sentence with winter period. Chapter 3, Part 10. Using Marks. When you make a jump to a position with the capital G command, Vim remembers the position from before this jump. This position is called a mark. To go back to where you came from, use this command. Backtick, backtick. This is a backtick or open single quote character. If you use the same command a second time, you will jump back again. That's because the backtick command is a jump itself, and the position from before this jump is remembered. Generally, every time you do a command that can move the cursor farther than within the same line, this is called a jump. This includes the search commands slash and n, it doesn't matter how far away the match is, but not the character searches with fx and tx or the word jumps w and e. Also, j and k are not considered to be a jump even when you use a count to make the 
make them move the cursor quite a long way away. The backtick backtick command jumps back and forth between two points. The control O command jumps to older positions, hint O for older, and control I then jumps to newer positions, hint. For many keyboard layouts, I is just next to O. Consider this sequence of commands, 33G slash caret the and control O. You first jump to line 33, then search for a line that starts with the. Then with control O, you jump back to line 33. Another control O takes you back to where you started. If you now use control I, you jump to line 33 again and to match for the the with another control I. The colon jumps command gives a list of positions you jump to. The entry you used last is marked with a right angle bracket. Named marks. Vim enables you to place your own marks in the text. The command MA marks the place under the cursor as mark A. You can place 26 marks, A through Z, in your text. You can't see them, it's just a position that Vim remembers. To go to a mark, use the command mark, where mark is the letter. So, to move to a mark, tick A. The command single quote mark is a single quotation mark or apostrophe moves you to the beginning of the line containing the mark. This differs from tick mark command, which also moves you to the marked column. The marks can be very useful when working on two related parts in a file. Suppose you have some text near the start of the file you need to look at, while working on some text near the end of the file. Move to the text at the start and place the S start mark there, MS. Then move to the text you want to work on <clears throat> and put the E end mark there, ME. Now you can move around and when you want to look at the start of the file, you can use this to jump there, single quote S. And then you can use single quote single quote to jump back to where you were or single quote E to jump to the text you were working on at the end. There is nothing special about using S for start and E for end. They are just easy to remember. You can use this command to get a list of marks, colon marks. You will notice a few special marks. These include the single quote, which is the cursor position before doing a jump, a double quote, the cursor position when last editing the file, a left bracket, which is the start of the last change, and a right bracket, which is the end of the last change. <clears throat> chapter 4 Making Small Changes This chapter shows you several ways of making corrections and moving text around. It teaches you the three basic ways to change text operator motion, visual mode, and text objects. Chapter 4, Part 1 operators and motions. In chapter 2, you learned the x command to delete a single character, and using a count, 4x deletes 4 characters. The dw command deletes a word. You may recognize the w command as the move word command. In fact, the d command may be followed by any motion command, and it deletes from the current location to the place where the cursor winds up. The 4w command, for example, moves the cursor over 4 words. The d4w command deletes 4 words. Vim only deletes up to the position where the motion takes the cursor. That's because Vim knows you probably don't want to delete the first character of a word. If you use the e command to move to the end of the word, Vim guesses that you do want to include the last character. So if you do d2e, it will also delete the last character. Whether the character under the cursor is included depends on the command you use to move that character. The reference manual calls this exclusive when the character isn't included and inclusive when it is. The dollar sign command moves to the end of the line. The d dollar sign command deletes from the cursor to the end of the line. 
This is an inclusive motion, thus the last character of the line is included in a delete operation. There is a pattern here, operator motion. You first type an operator command, for example D is the delete operator. Then you type a motion command like 4L or W. This way you can operate on any text you can move over. Chapter 4 Part 2 Changing Text Another operator is C for change. It acts just like the D operator except it leaves you in insert mode. For example, CW changes a word. Or more specifically, it deletes a word and then puts you in insert mode. You will have noticed something strange. The space before human isn't deleted in the case of using C2WBE escape, which is a bit complicated, but if you think of to air is human, and we're on the word air, and we do C2W, that's going to be change two words, and then BE is the words we type in insert mode, and then we hit escape to go back to normal mode. So, in this example, the space before human isn't deleted. There is a saying that for every problem there is an answer that is simple, clear, and wrong. That is the case with this example used here for the CW command. The C operator works just like the D operator, with one exception, CW. That actually works like CE, change to end of word. Thus, the space after the word is not included. This is an exception that dates back to the old VI. Since many people are used to it now, the inconsistency has remained in Vim. More changes. Like DD deletes a whole line, CC changes a whole line. It keeps the existing indent, leading white space though. Just like D$ dollar sign deletes until the end of a line, C$ dollar sign changes until the end of a line. It's like doing D$ dollar sign to delete the text and then A to start insert mode and append new text. Shortcuts. Some operator motion commands are used so often that they have been given a single letter command. X stands for DL, delete character under cursor. Capital X stands for DH, delete character left of the cursor. Capital D stands for D dollar sign, delete to the end of the line. Capital C stands for C dollar sign, change to the end of the line. S stands for CL, change one character, and capital S stands for changing a whole line. Where to put the count. The commands 3DW and D3W delete three words. If you want to get really picky about things, the first command 3DW deletes one word three times, and the command D3W deletes three words once. This is a difference without a distinction. You can actually put in two counts, however. For example, 3D 2W deletes two words repeated three times for a total of six words. Replacing with one character. The R command is not an operator. It waits for you to type a character and will replace the character under the cursor with it. You could do the same with CL or with S command, but with R you don't have to press escape to get back out of insert mode. So if you're at the beginning of a word there and you want to capitalize the first letter, you could do R and then a capital T that will just replace that letter. Using a count with R causes that many characters to be replaced with the same character. For example, 5RX will replace the next five letters with X. To replace a character with a line break, use R enter. This deletes one character and inserts a line break. Using a count here only applies to the number of characters deleted. 4R enter replaces four characters with one line break. Chapter 4, Part 3, Repeating a Change. The dot command is one of the simplest yet po powerful commands in Vim. It repeats the last change. For example, suppose you're editing an HTML file and you want to delete all the B tags. You position the cursor on the first and delete the B tag with the command DF right angle bracket. You then go to the left angle bracket of the next B tag and use and delete it using the dot command. The dot command executes the last change command, in this case df right angle bracket, and to delete another tag position the cursor on the left angle bracket and use the dot command. 
The dot command works for all changes you make except for U, which is undo, control R for redo, and commands that start with a colon. Another example, you want to change the word four to five. It appears several times in your text. You can do this quickly with a sequence of commands, slash, four, and enter, which is finding the string four, change word five, CW five, escape, changes the word to five. You can press N to go to the next four and dot to repeat the change, N and dot, N and dot. Chapter four, part four, visual mode. To delete simple items, the operator motion changes work quite well. But often it's not so easy to decide which command will move you over the text you want to change. Then you can use visual mode. To start visual mode, press V. You move the cursor over the text you want to work on. While you do this, the text is highlighted. Finally, type the operator command. For example, to delete from the middle of the word to the middle of another, you could do V, E to move to the end of the word, and L, 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 L to move to the middle of the next, and then D. When doing this, you don't really have to count how many times you have to press L to end up in the right position. You can immediately see what text will be deleted when you press D. If at any time you decide you don't want to do anything with the highlighted text, just press escape and visual mode will stop without doing anything. Selecting lines. If you want to work on whole lines, use capital V to start visual line mode. You will see right away the whole line is highlighted without moving around. And when you move left or right, nothing changes. When you move up or down, the selection is extended whole lines at a time. For example, select three lines with capital V, J, J. Selecting blocks. If you want to work on a rectangular block of characters, use control V to start visual mode. This is very useful when working on tables. If you have columns name, Q1, Q2, Q3, and you want to delete the middle Q2 column, move the cursor to the Q of Q2. Press control V to start blockwise visual mode. Now move the cursor three lines down with three J and to the next word with W. You can see the first character of the last column is included. To exclude it, use H. Now press D and the middle column is gone. Going to the other side. If you have selected some text in visual mode and discover that you need to change the other end of the selection, use the O command. Hint, O for other. The cursor will go to the other end and you can move the cursor to change where the selection starts. Pressing O again brings you back to the other end. When using blockwise selection, you can have four corners. O only takes you to one of the corners diagonally. Use capital O to move to the other corner in the same line. Note that O and capital O in visual mode work very differently from normal mode where they open a new line below or above the cursor. Chapter four, port Part five, moving text. When you delete something with D, X, or another command, this text is saved. You can paste it back by using the P command. The Vim name for this is put. Take a look at how this works. First, you will delete an entire line by putting the cursor on the line you want to delete and typing DD. Now move the cursor to where you want to put the line and use the P command. The line is inserted on the line below the cursor. Because you deleted an entire line, the P command placed the text line below the cursor. If you delete part of a line, a word for example, the P command puts it just after the cursor. More on putting. The capital P command puts text like P, but before the cursor. When you deleted a whole line with DD, capital P will move it back before the cursor. When you deleted a word with DW, capital P will put it back just before the cursor. You can repeat putting as many times as you like. The same text will be used. You can use a count with P and capital P. The text will be repeated as many times as you specified with the count. Thus, DD and 3P puts three copies of the same deleted line. Swapping two characters. Frequently, when you are typing, your fingers get ahead of your brain, or the other way around. The result is a typo such as T-E-H for the. Vim makes it easy to correct such problems. Just put the cursor on the T of, T -E of the E of T-E-H and execute the command X-P. 
This works as follows. X deletes the character E and places it in a register. P puts the text after the cursor, which is after the H. So we have T-E-H, we use X on the E, so now we only have T-H, we press P, and now we have T-H-E, or the. Chapter 4, Part 6, Copying Text. To copy text from one place to another, you could delete it, use U to undo the deletion, and then P to put it somewhere else. There's an easier way, yanking. The Y operator copies text into a register, then a P command can be used to put it. Yanking is just a Vim name for copying. The C letter was already used for change operator and Y was still available. Calling this operator yank made it easier to remember to use the Y key. Since Y is an operator and you can use YW to yank a word. A count is possible as well. To yank two words, use y to w. Example, if you have let square equals long variable star and your cursor is in long variable, you can do y to w, which will yank the entire uh, up until the star for long variable. Notice that y w includes the white space after a word. If you don't want this, use y e for yank till end. The YY command yanks a whole line, just like DD deletes a whole line. Capital Y was originally equivalent to yank the entire line, as opposed to D, which is delete to end of line. Y has thus been remapped to mean yank to end of line to make it consistent with the behavior of D. Mappings will be covered in later chapters. Chapter 4, Part 7, Using the Clipboard if you are using the GUI version of Vim, GVim, you can find the copy item in the edit menu. First select some text with the visual mode, then use the edit slash copy menu item. The selected text is now copied to the clipboard. You can paste the text in other programs, in Vim itself too. If you have copied text to the clipboard in another application, you can paste it in Vim with the edit slash paste menu item. This works in normal mode and insert mode. In visual mode, the selected text is replaced with the pasted text. The cut menu deletes the item before it's put in the clipboard. The copy, cut, paste items are available in the pop-up menu, only where there is a pop-up menu, of course. If your Vim has a toolbar, you can also find these items there. If you are not using the GUI, or you don't like using a menu, you have to use another way. You use the normal Y, yank, and P put commands, but you must prepend double quote star before it. To copy a line to the clipboard, do double quote star yy. To put text from the clipboard back into the text, use double quote star p. This only works on versions of Vim that include clipboard support. More about clipboard can be found in section 9, part 3, and here for help clipboard. Chapter 4, part 8, text objects. If the cursor is in the middle of a word and you want to delete that word, you need to move back to its start before you can do DW. There is a simpler way to do this. D-A-W. So if you're in the middle of the word example and you type D-A-W, it will delete example. <clears throat> the D of D-A-W is the delete operator. A-W is a text object. Hint, A-W stands for a word. Thus, D-A-W is delete a word. To be precise, the white space after the word is also deleted, or the white space before the word if at the end of a line. Using text objects is the third way to make changes in Vim. We already had operator motion and visual mode. Now we add operator text objects. It is very similar to operator motion, but instead of operating on the text between the cursor position before and after a movement command, the text object is used as a whole. It doesn't matter where in the object the cursor was. To change a whole sentence, use CIS for change in sentence. Take this text. Hello there. This is an example, just some text. Move to the start of the second line, which is the be in the middle of this is an example. Now use CIS to change inside that sentence. The cursor is in between the blanks in the first line. Now you type the new sentence, another line. And now you have hello there, another line, just some text. CIS consists of C for change operator and the IS text object. This stands for inner sentence. There is also AS for 
a sentence object. The difference is that AS includes the white space after the sentence and IS doesn't. If you would delete a sentence, you want to delete the white space at the same time, then you would use DAS. If you want to type new text, then white space can remain, thus you could use CIS. <clears throat> You can also use text objects in visual mode. It will include the text object in the visual selection. Visual mode continues, thus you can do this several times. For example, visual mode with V and select a sentence with AS. Now you can repeat AS to include more sentences. Finally, you use an operator to do something with the selected sentences. You can find a long list of text objects here in help text objects. Chapter 4, Part 9, Replace Mode. The capital R command causes Vim to enter replace mode. In this mode, each character you type replaces the one under the cursor. This continues until you type escape. In this example, you start replace mode on the first T of text. And you write, the original sentence is, this is text. And then in text, you type capital R and then interesting, escape. Now the new sentence is, this is interesting. You may have noticed that this command replaced five characters in the line with 12 others. The capital R command automatically extends the line if it runs out of characters to replace. It will not continue on the next line. You can switch between insert mode and replace mode with the insert key. When you use backspace to make a correction, you will notice that the old text is put back. Thus it works like an undo command for the previously typed character. Chapter 4, Part 10 Conclusion. The operators, movement commands, and text objects give you the possibility to make lots of combinations. Now that you know how they work, you can use capital N operators with M movements to make N by M commands. You can find a list of operators here in help operator. For example, there are many other ways to delete pieces of text. Here are a few common ones. X for delete character under cursor, capital X for delete character before cursor, capital D for delete from cursor to end of line, DW for delete word, DB to delete back of word, DIW for delete inner word, DAW for delete A word, D capital G to delete until the end of the line, and DGG delete until the start of the file. If you use C instead of D, they become change commands, and with Y, you yank the text, and so forth. There are a few common commands that make changes to text that didn't fit somewhere else. Tilde changes the case of the character under the cursor and move the cursor to the next character. This is not an operator, thus you can't use it with a motion command. It does work in visual mode where it changes case for all selected text. Capital I starts insert mode after moving the cursor to the first non-blank in the line, and capital A starts insert mode after moving the cursor to the end of the line. Chapter 5, Set Your Settings Vim can be tuned to work like you want it to. This chapter shows you how to make Vim start with options set to different values, add plugins to extend Vim capabilities, or define your own macros. Chapter 5, Part 1, The VimRC File You probably got tired of typing commands that you use very often. To start Vim with all your favorite option settings and mappings, you write them in what is called the init.vim file. Vim executes the command in this file when it starts up. If you already have an init.vim file, for example, when your sysadmin has set one up for you, you can edit it this way. 
colon edit dollar sign with all caps my vimrc if you don't have a vimrc file yet see init vim to find out where you can create a vimrc file this file is always used and is recommended often found in config and vim init.vim or on windows app data local and vim init.vim the vimrc file can contain all the commands that you type after a colon the simplest ones are for setting options for example if you want vim to always start with the ignore case option on add this line to your vimrc file set ignore case for this new line to take effect, you need to exit Vim and start it again. Later, you will learn how to do this without exiting Vim. This chapter only explains the most basic items. For more information on how to write a Vim script file, see Chapter 41. Chapter 5, Part 2. Example VimRC Contents In the first chapter, it was explained how to create a VimRC file. Execute, edit, standard path of config concatenated with init.vim. In this section, we will explain the various commands that can be specified in this file. This will give you hints about how to set up your own preferences. Not everything will be explained though. Use the help command to find out more. First example, set backup. This tells Vim to keep a backup copy of a file when overwriting it. The backup file will have the same name as the original with a tilde added. See chapter seven, part four. Set history equals 50. Keep 50 commands and 50 search patterns in the history. Use another number if you want to remember fewer or more lines. Map capital Q to GQ. This defines a key mapping. More about that in the next section. This defines capital Q command to do formatting with the GQ operator. Otherwise, the Q command repeats the last recorded register. Another example could be vno remap underscore G which does y colon exe space quote grep slash quote concatenated with escape at double quote comma quote backslash backslash slash quote concatenated with quote slash star dot c star dot h enter. This mapping yanks the visually selected text and searches for it in C files. This is a complicated mapping. You can see that mappings can be used to do quite complicated things. Still, it is just a sequence of commands that are executed like you typed them. File type plugin indent on. Some of the following section is not applicable to NeoVim. This switches on three very clever mechanisms. Number one, file type detection. Whenever you start editing a file, Vim will try to figure out what kind of file this is. When you edit main.c, Vim will see the .c extension and recognize this as a C file type. When you edit a file that starts with pound bang bin sh, Vim recognizes this as an sh file type, which is for shell. The file type detection is used for syntax highlighting and other two items below. C help file types. Using file type plugin files. Many different file types are edited with different options. For example, when you edit a C file, it's very useful to set the C indent option to automatically indent the lines. These commonly useful option settings are included with them in file type plugins. You can also add your own C help write file type plugin. Using indent files. When editing programs, the indent of a line can often be computed automatically. Vim comes with these indent rules for a number of file types. C, file type indent on, and indent expr. You can also have an auto command to restore the cursor from the last position that you had. For more information, see help restore cursor for the exact code. This time, this is used after reading any file. The complicated stuff after it checks the single quote, double quote, mark is defined and jumps to it if so. It doesn't do that for a commit or rebase message, which are likely to be a different rebase or commit message than last time, or when using XXD to filter and edit binary files, which transforms input files back and forth, causing them to have dual nature, so to speak. See also using XXD. The backslash at the start of the line is used to continue the command from the previous line. That avoids a line getting very long. C, help line continuation. This only works in a Vim script file, not when typing a command at the command line. 
Command diff orig, which does vert new bar set bt equals no file bar r plus plus edit pound bar zero d underscore bar diff this bar win command p bar diff this. This adds the diff orig command. Use this in a modified buffer to see the differences with the file it was loaded from. See diff and help diff orig. Set no lang remap. Prevent the langmat option applies to characters that results from a mapping. If set, default. This may break this may break plugins, but it's backwards compatible. See help lang remap. Chapter 5, Part 3. Simple mappings. A mapping enables you to bind a set of vim commands to a single key. Suppose, for example, that you need to surround certain characters with curly braces. In other words, you need to change a word such as amount into curly brace, amount, curly brace. With the colon map command, you can tell them that the F5 key does this job. The command is as follows. Colon map, left angle bracket, F5, right angle bracket, I, squirrely brace, escape, EA, squirrely brace, escape. Note, when entering this command, you must press F5 by typing four characters. That's when you're typing the command. Similarly, escape is not entered by pressing the escape key, but by typing left angle bracket ESC, right angle bracket. Watch out for this difference when reading the manual. Let's break this down. The left angle bracket F5 right angle bracket is the F5 function key. This is the trigger key that causes the command to be executed as the key is pressed. I, curly brace escape, is insert the curly brace character. The escape ends insert mode. E moves to the end of the word and A curly brace escape appends the squirrely brace to the end of the word. After you execute the colon map command, all you have to do to put squirrely brace squirrely brace around a word is to put the cursor on the first character and press F5. In this example, the trigger is a single key, but it can be any string. But when you use an existing Vim command, that command will no longer be available. You better avoid that. One key that can be used with mappings is the backslash. Since you probably want to define more than one mapping, add another character. You could map slash P to add parentheses around a word and slash C to add curly braces with the same idea from before, except now for slash P, you would do I left curl left parenthesis escape EA right parenthesis escape. You need to type the backslash and the P quick and the P quickly after another. So Vim knows they belong together. The map command with no arguments lists your current mappings, at least the ones for normal mode. More about mappings in section 40, part one. Chapter five, part four, adding a package. You may use colon pack add to enable packages on demand. This is useful for plugins you want to enable only sometimes. To enable example package, use the following command, pack add example package. That's all. Now you can find help about this plugin, help example package. This works because when pack add loaded the plugin, it also added the package directory in runtime path so that the help file can be found. A package is a set of files that you can add to Vim. There are two kinds of packages, optional and automatically loaded on startup. You can find packages on the internet in various places. It usually comes as an archive or as a repository. For an archive, you can follow these steps. Create the package directory using makedir-p home slash dot local share and vim site pack and fancy. Fancy can be any name of your liking. Use one that describes the package. Then you unpack the archive in that directory. This assumes the top directory in the archive is start. So cd to your local share nvim site pack fancy and unzip slash temp fancy zip. If the archive layout is different, make sure that you end up with a path like this. Local share nvim site pack, that's the base path, fancy for the name, and then start fancy text plugin fancy.vim. Here fancy text is the name of the package. It can be anything you want. For more information about packages, you can see help packages. Chapter five, part five, adding a plugin. Vim's functionality can be extended by adding plugins. 
A plugin is nothing more than a Vim script file that is loaded automatically when Vim starts. You can add a plugin very easily by dropping it in your plugin directory. There are two types of plugins, global plugin, which is used for all kinds of files, and file type plugin, only used for a specific type of file. The global plugins will be discussed first and then the file type ones. Global plugins. When you start Vim, it will automatically load a number of global plugins. You don't have to do anything for this. They add functionality that most people will want to use, but which was implemented as a Vim script instead of being compiled into Vim. You can find them listed in the help index for help standard plugin list. Also see help load plugins. You can add a global plugin to add functionality that will always be present when you use Vim. There are only two steps for adding a global plugin. Get a copy of the plugin and drop it in the right directory. Getting a global plugin. Where can you find plugins? Some are always loaded. You can see them in the directory $VimRuntime slash plugin. And some come with Vim. You can find them in the directory VimRuntime slash macros and its subdirectories under Vim, Vim files, pack, dist, opt. You can download them from the net. There's a large collection on Vim.org. They are sometimes posted in a Vim mail list. Or you can write one yourself. See help write plugin. Using a global plugin. First, read the text in your plugin itself to check for any special conditions, then copy the file to your plugin directory. On Unix, that would be .local slash share slash envim slash site slash plugin. Once you've copied the file to that location, that's it. Now you can use the commands defined in that plugin. Instead of putting plugins directly into the plugin folder, you may better organize them by putting them into subdirectories under plugin. As an example, consider using .local share and vim site plugin perl slash star dot vim for all your perl plugins. File type plugins. The vim distribution comes with a set of plugins for different file types that you can start using this command, file type plugin on. That's all. See, help vimrc file type. If you are missing a plugin for a file type you are using, or you found a better one, you can add it. There are two steps for adding a file type plugin. Get a copy of the plugin and drop it in the right directory. Getting a file type plugin. You can find them in the same places as the global plugins. Watch out if the type of file is mentioned, then you know if the plugin is a global or file type one. The scripts in Vim runtime macros are global ones and the file type plugins are in Vim runtime slash FT plugin. Using a file type plugin. You can add a file type plugin by dropping it in the right directory. The name of this directory is in the same directory mentioned above for global plugins, but the last part is FT plugin. Suppose you found a plugin for the stuff file type and you are on Unix. Then you can move this file to the FT plugin directory. So the final place would be .local slash share and vim site FT plugin stuff dot vim. If that file already exists, you already have a plugin for stuff. You might want to check if the existing plugin doesn't conflict with the one you are adding. If it's okay, you can give the new one another name, stuff underscore two dot vim. The underscore is used to separate the name of the file type from the rest, which can be anything. If you use other stuff dot vim, it wouldn't work. It would only be loaded for the other stuff file type. The generic names for file type plugins are FD plugin slash file type dot vim or fd plugin file type underscore additional name dot vim or fd plugin slash file type slash name dot vim here name can be any name that you prefer examples for the stuff file type on unix would be local share and vim site fd plugin that'll be the same for each stuff dot vim or stuff underscore def dot vim or stuff slash header dot vim the file type part is the name of the file type the plugin is to be used for. Only file types, only files of this file type will use the settings from the plugin. The name part of the plugin file doesn't matter. You can use it to have several plugins for the same file type. Note that it must end in .vim or .lua. For further reading, check file type plugins, which is documentation for the file type plugins and information about how to avoid uh, the mappings that cause problem load plugins which is when the global plugins are loaded during startup 
FT plugin overrule, which is overruling the settings from a global plugin, or write plugin, how to write a plugin script, plugin details, for more information about using plugins or when your plugin doesn't work, or new file type, which is how to detect a new file type. Chapter 5, Part 6 Adding a Help File. If you're lucky, the plugin you installed also comes with a help file. We will explain how to install the help file so that you can easily find help for your new plugin. Let us suppose a plugin, we'll call My Plugin, which comes with a help file in a non standard place. It's usually residing in a subfolder called doc. First, create a doc directory in one of the directories in runtime path. So make der dash b local share envim site slash doc. Now copy the help file to the doc directory. So copy my plugin slash my plugin dash doc to that doc directory. Here comes the trick, which allows you to jump to the subjects in the new help file. Generate the local tags file with the colon help tags command. So help tags local share envim site doc. You can see an entry for the local help file now when you do help local dash additions. The title lines from the local help files are automatically added to this section. There you can see which local fi help files have been added and jump to them through the tag. For writing a local help file, see write local help. Chapter 5, part 7, the option window. If you're looking for an option that does what you want, you can search in the help file here help options. Another way is using this command, colon options. This opens a new window with a list of options with a one line explanation. The options are grouped by subject. Move the cursor to a subject and press enter to jump there. Then press enter to jump back or use control O. You can change the value of an option. For example, move to the displaying text subject. Then move the cursor down to this line, set wrap or no wrap. When you hit enter, the line will change to set no wrap, wrap. The option has now been switched off. Just above this line is a short description of the wrap option. Move the cursor one line up to place down this line. Now hit enter and you jump to the full help on the wrap option. For options that take a number or string argument, you can edit the value. Then press enter to apply the new value. For example, move the cursor a few lines up to this line set so equals zero position the cursor on the zero with dollar sign change it to a five with r5 then press enter to apply the new value when you now move the cursor around you will notice that the text starts scrolling before you reach the border this is what the scroll off or so option does it specifies an offset from the window border when scrolling starts chapter 5 part 8 often used options there are an awful lot of options. Most of them you will hardly ever use. Some of the more useful ones will be mentioned here. Don't forget you can find more help on these options with the help command with single quotes before and after the option name. For example, help wrap. In case you have messed up an option value, you can set it back to the default by putting an ampersand after the option name. For example, colon set is keyword ampersand. <clears throat> Not wrapping lines. Vim normally wraps long lines so that you can see all of the text. Sometimes it's better to let the text continue right of the window. Then you need to scroll the text left to right to see all of a long line. Switch wrapping off with this command. Set no wrap. Vim will automatically scroll the text when you move to the text that is not displayed. To see a context of 10 characters, do this. Colon set side scroll equals 10. This does not change the text in the file only the way it's displayed. Wrapping movement commands. Most commands for moving around will stop moving at the start and end of a line. You can change that with the which wrap option. This sets it to the default value. Set which wrap equals b comma s. This allows the backspace key when used in the first position of a line to move the cursor to the end of the previous line and the space key moves from the end of a line to the start of the next one. To allow the cursor keys left and right to also wrap, use this command, set which wrap equals b, comma, s, comma, left angle bracket, comma, right angle bracket. This is still only for normal mode. To let left and right do this in insert mode as well. Set insert, er, 
sorry, set which wrap equals B comma S comma left angle bracket, right angle bracket, comma left bracket, comma right bracket. There are a few other flags which can be added. C help which wrap. Viewing tabs. When there are tabs in a file, you cannot see where they are. To make them visible, set list. Now every tab is displayed as caret I, and a dollar sign is displayed at the end of each line, so that you can spot trailing spaces that would otherwise go unnoticed. A disadvantage is that this looks ugly when there are a lot of tabs in the file. If you have a color terminal or using a GUI, Vim can show the spaces and tabs as highlighted character using the list jars option. Set list jars equals tab colon right angle bracket dash comma trail colon dash. Now every tab will be displayed as right angle bracket dash 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 with more or less dashes depending on your tab stop size and trailing white spaces as dash. That looks a lot better, doesn't it? Keywords. The is keyword option specifies which characters can appear in a word. If you do colon set is keyword, you'll see something like is keyword equals at comma 48 to 57 comma underscore comma 192 to 255. The at stands for all alphabetic characters. 48 to 57 stands for ASCII characters 48 to 57, which are the numbers 0 to 9. 192 to 255 are the printable Latin characters. Sometimes you will want to include a dash in the keyword, so that commands like W consider upper dash case to be one word. You can do it like this, set keyword, or set is keyword plus equals dash. Now dash will be included in the list. If you look at the new value, you will see that Vim has added a comma for you. To remove a character, use minus equals. For example, to remove the underscore, do set is keyword minus equals underscore. This time, a comma is automatically deleted. Room for messages. When Vim starts, there's one line at the bottom that's used for messages. When a message is long, it is either truncated, thus you can only see part of it, or text scrolls and you have to press enter to continue. You can set the command height option to the number of lines used for messages. For example, set command height equals three. This does mean there's less room to edit text, Thus, it is a compromise. Chapter 6, Using Syntax Highlighting Black and white text is boring. With colors, your file comes to life. This not only looks nice, it also speeds up your work. Change the colors used for the different sorts of text. Print your text with the colors you see on the screen. Chapter 6, Part 1, Switching It On Syntax highlighting is enabled by default. NeoVim will automatically detect the type of file and load the right syntax highlighting. Chapter 6, Part 2, No or Wrong Colors. There can be a number of reasons why you don't see colors. Your terminal does not support colors. Vim will use bold, italic, and underlined text, but this doesn't look very nice. You will probably want to try and get a terminal with colors. Your terminal does support colors, but Vim doesn't know this. Make sure your term setting is correct. For example, when using an X term that supports colors, set env term x term dash color, or 
depending on your shell, term equals x term dash caller semicolon x word term. The terminal name must match the terminal you are using. Another option is the file type is not recognized. Vim doesn't know all the file types, and sometimes it's near to impossible to tell what language a file uses. Try this command, set file type. If the result is file type equals, then the problem is indeed that Vim <clears throat> doesn't know what type of file this is. You can set the type manually with colon set file type equals Fortran. To see which types are available, look in the directory Vim runtime slash syntax. For the GUI, you can use the syntax menu. Setting the file type can also be done with a mode line so that the file will be highlighted each time you edit it. For example, this line can be used in a make file, put it near the start or end of the file. Pound, vim colon, syntax equals make. You might know how to detect the file type yourself. Often the file name extension after the dot can be used. See help new file type for how to tell vim to detect that file type. There is no highlighting for your file type. You could try using a similar file type by manually setting it as mentioned above. If that isn't good enough, you can write your own syntax file, see, help, my syntax file. Or perhaps the colors are wrong. Maybe the color text is very hard to read. Vim guesses the background color that you are using. If it is black or another dark color, it will use light colors for text. If it is white or another light color, it will use dark colors for text. If Vim guessed wrong, the text will be hard to read. To solve this, set the background option. For a dark background, do set background equals dark, and for a light background, set background equals light. Make sure you put this before the syntax enable command, otherwise the colors will have already been set. You could do colon syntax reset after setting the background to make Vim set the default colors again. The colors are wrong when scrolling bottom to top. Vim doesn't read the whole file to parse text. It starts parsing wherever you are viewing the file. That takes a lot of time, but sometimes the colors are wrong. A simple fix is hitting control L or scroll back a bit and then forward again. For a real fix, see colon syn dash sync. Some syntax files have a way to make it look further back. See the help for a specific syntax file. For example, text.vim for the text syntax. Editor's note. This is no longer true if you're using TreeSitter. Chapter 6, Part 3, Different Colors. If you don't like the default colors, you can select another color scheme. In the GUI, use the edit slash color scheme menu. You can also type the command colon color scheme evening. Evening is the name of the color scheme. There are several others you might want to try out. Look in the directory vim runtime slash colors. When you found the color scheme that you like, add the color scheme command to your init.vim file. You could also write your own color scheme. This is how you would do it. Select a color scheme that comes close. Copy this file to your own vim directory. So for Unix, you could make a config nvim colors folder and then copy a file inside called mine.vim. This is done from vim because it knows the value of vim runtime. Then you can edit the color scheme of the edit the color scheme file. These entries are useful. C term, which are attributes in a color terminal, C term FG for foreground color in a color terminal, C term BG for background color in a color terminal, or GUI for attributes in the GUI, GUI FG for foreground color in the GUI, and GUI BG background color in the GUI. For example, to make comments green, do highlight comment C term FG equals green and GUI FG equals green. Attributes you can use for C term and GUI are bold and underline. If you want both, use bold, comma, underline. For details, see the help highlight command. Tell Vim to always use your color scheme. Put this line in your VimRC. Color scheme, mine. If you want to see what the most often used color combinations look like, use this command colon runtime syntax slash color test dot vim. You will see text in various color combinations. You can check which ones are readable and look nice. Chapter six, part four, with colors or without colors. Displaying text in color takes a lot of effort. If you find the displaying too slow, you might want to disable syntax highlighting for a moment with syntax clear. When editing another file or the same one, the colors will come back. If you want to stop highlighting completely, use syntax off. This will completely disable syntax highlighting and remove it immediately for all buffers. See help syntax off for more details. 
If you want syntax highlighting only for specific files, use this, colon syntax manual. This will enable the syntax highlighting, but not switch it on automatically when starting to edit a buffer. To switch highlighting on for the current buffer, set the syntax option with set syntax equals on. For further reading, check user 44, your own syntax highlighted, or syntax for all the details. <coughs> Chapter 7, Editing More Than One File No matter how many files you have, you can edit them without leaving Vim. Define a list of files to work on and jump from one to the other. Copy text from one file and put it in another. Chapter 7, Part 1, Edit Another File So far, you had to start Vim for every file you wanted to edit. There is a simpler way. To start editing another file, use this command, edit foo.txt. You can use any file name instead of foo.txt. Vim will close the current file and open the new one. If the current file has unsafe changes, however, Vim displays an error message and does not open the new file. E37, no write since last change, use bang to override. Note. Vim puts an error ID at the start of each error message. If you do not understand the message or what caused it, look in the help system for this ID. In this case, help E37. At this point, you have a number of alternatives. You can write the file using this command, write, or you can force Vim to discard your changes and edit the new file using the force character, edit, exclamation, foo.txt. If you want to edit another file but not write the changes in the current file yet, you can make it hidden with colon hide edit foo.txt. The text with changes is still there, but you can't see it. This is further explained in section 22 part four, the buffer list. Chapter seven, part two, a list of files. You can start Vim to edit a sequence of files. For example, Vim 1.c, 2.c, 3.c. This command starts Vim and tells it that you will be editing three files. Vim displays just the first file. After you have done your thing in this file, to edit the next file, you use this command, colon next. If you have unsaved in the current file, you will get an error message and the next command will not work. This is the same problem as with edit and mentioned in the previous section. To abandon the changes, use next exclamation. But mostly you want to save the changes and move on to the next file. There's a special command for this, colon w next. This does the same thing using two separate commands, colon write and colon next. Where am I? To see which file in the argument list you are editing, look in the window title. It should show you something like two of three. This means you are editing the second file out of three files. If you want to see the list of files, use this command, colon args. This is short for arguments. The output might look like this, one, and then a left bracket, two dot C, right bracket, three dot C. These are the files you started Vim with. The one you're currently editing, 2.c, is in square brackets. Moving to other arguments. To go back one file, colon previous. This is just like the next command, except that it moves you in the other direction. Again, there is a shortcut command for when you want to write the file first, colon w previous. To move to the very last file in the list, do colon last, and to move to the first one again, do colon first. There is no colon w last or colon w first command though. You can use a count for the next and previous. To skip two files forward, do colon two next. Automatic writing. When moving around the files and making changes, you have to remember to use write. Otherwise you'll get an error message. If you're sure you always want to write modified files, you can tell them to automatically write them with set auto write. When editing a file you may not want to write, switch it off with set no auto write. Editing another list of files. You can redefine the list of files without the need to exit Vim and start it again. Use this command to edit three other files, colon args, 5.c, 6.c, 7.h. Or use a wildcard like it's used in the shell, colon args, star.txt. 
Then we'll take you to the first file in the list. Again, if the current file has changes, you can either write the file first or use args exclamation to abandon the changes. <clears throat> Did you edit the last file? When you use a list of files, Vim assumes you want to edit them all. To protect you from exiting too early, you will get this error when you didn't edit the last file in the list yet. E173 colon 46 more files to edit. If you really want to exit, just do it again. Then it will work, but not when you did other commands in between. Chapter 7.3 Jumping from file to file. To quickly jump between two files, press Control Carrot. On English US keyboards, the caret is above the 6 key. For example, args 1c, 2c, 3c, are, and then now you are in 1.c. When you do colon next, you will now be in 2.c. Use control caret to go back to 1.c. Another control caret and you are now back in 2.c. Another control caret and you are back in 1.c again. If you now do next, you are in 3.c. Notice that control caret command does not change the idea of where you are in the list of files. Only commands like next and previous do that. The file you were previously editing is called the alternate file. When just started, when you just started vim, control caret will not work since there is no previous file. <clears throat> Predefined marks. After jumping to another file, you can use two predefined marks which are very useful. Backtick double quote. This takes you to the position where the cursor was when you left the file. Another mark that is remembered is the position where you made the last change with backtick dot. Suppose you are editing the file 1.txt. Somewhere halfway through the file, you use X to delete a character. Then you go to the last line with capital G and write the file with colon W. You edit several other files and then use edit1.txt to come back to 1.txt. If you now use backtick double quote, Vim jumps to the last line of the file. Using backtick dot takes you to the position where you deleted the character. Even when you move around in the file, backtick double quote and backtick dot will take you to the remembered position, at least until you make another change or leave the file. File marks. In section 3, part 10, we explained how you can place a mark in a file with MX and jump to that position with backtick X. That works within one file. If you edit another file and place marks there, those are specific for that file. Thus, each file has its own set of marks and they are local to the file. So far, we were using marks with a lowercase letter. There are also marks with an uppercase letter. These are global and they can be used from any file. For example, suppose that we're editing the file foo.txt. Go to halfway down the file, 50%, and place the capital F mark there, F for foo. So you do 50% and then M capital F. Now edit the file bar.txt and place the capital B mark there, B for bar, at its last line. So capital G. M capital B. Now you can use the single quote F command to jump back to halfway of foo.txt or edit yet another file and single quote capital B and you jump to the end of bar.txt. The file marks are remembered until they are placed somewhere else. Thus you can place the mark, do hours of editing, and still be able to jump back to that mark. It's often useful to think of a simple connection between the mark letter and where it's placed. For example, use the H mark in a header file, M in a make file, and C in a code file. To see where a specific mark is, give an argument to the marks command. So marks space capital M. You can also give several arguments, such as marks MCP. Don't forget that you can use control O and control I to jump to older and newer positions without placing marks there. Chapter 7, Part 4, Backup Files. Usually Vim does not produce a backup file. If you want to have one, all you need to do is execute the following command. Set backup. The name of the backup file is the original file with a tilde appended to the end. If your file is named data.txt, for example, the backup file is named data.txt 
tilde. If you do not like the fact that the file backup files end with tilde, you can change the extension with colon set backup x equals dot bak, for example. And now this will create data.txt.bak instead of data.txt tilde. Another option that matters here is backup dir. It specifies where the backup file is written. The default to write the backup in the same directory as the original file will mostly be the right thing. <clears throat> when the backup option isn't set, but the right backup is, Vim will still create a backup file. However, it is deleted as soon as writing the file was completed successfully. This functions as a safety against losing your original file when writing fails in some way. Disk full is the most common cause, or being hit by lightning might be another, although less common. Keeping the original file. If you are editing source files, you might want to keep the file before you make any changes. But the backup file will be overwritten each time you write the file. Thus it only contains the previous version, not the first one. To make Vim keep the original file, set the patch mode option. This specifies the extension used for the first backup of a changed file. Usually you would do something like this, set patch mode equals dot -orige. Now, when you edit the file data.txt for the first time, make changes and write the file, Vim will keep a copy of the unchanged file under the name data.txt.orig. If you make further changes to the file, Vim will notice that data.txt.orig already exists and leave it alone. Further backup files will then be called data.txt tilde or whatever you specify with backup x. If you leave patch mode empty, which is the default, the original file will not be kept. <clears throat> Chapter 7, Part 5, Copy Text Between Files. This explains how to copy text from one file to another. Let's start with a simple example. Edit the file that contains the text you want to copy. Move the cursor to the start of the text and press V. This starts visual mode. Now move the cursor to the end of the text and press Y. This yanks, or copies, the selected text. To copy the above paragraph, you would do colon edit this file, slash, capital this, and then V, J, 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 dollar sign y. Now edit the file you want to put the text in. Move the cursor to the character where you would want the text to appear after and use p to put the text there. Edit other file slash there and then p. Of course you can use many other commands to yank the text. For example to select whole lines start visual mode with capital V or press Control v to select a rectangular block or use yy to yank a single line or yaw to yank a word etc. The P command puts the text after the cursor. Use capital P to put the text before the cursor. Notice that Vim remembers if you yanked a whole line or block and puts it back that way. Using registers. When you want to copy several pieces of text from one file to another, having to switch between the files and writing the target file takes a lot of time. To avoid this, copy each piece of text to its own register. A register is a place where Vim stores text. Here we will use the registers named A to Z. Later you will find out there are others. Let's copy a sentence to the F register. F stands for first. So double quote F Y A S. The Y A S yanks a sentence like before. The double quote F tells Vim that this text should be placed in the F register. This must come before the yank command. Now yank three whole lines to the L register. L for line. Double quote L three Y Y. The count before could be the double quote L just as well. The yank of blocks of text to the B for block register do control V, JJ, WW, double quote, BY. Notice that the register specification double quote B is just before the Y command. This is required. If you would have put it before the W command, it would not have worked. Now you have three pieces of text in the F, L, and B registers. Edit another file, move around and place the text where you want it. Double quote FP. Again, the register specification double quote F comes before the P command. You can put the registers in any order and the text stays in the register until you yank something else into it. Thus you can put it as many times as you like. When you delete text, you can also specify a register. Use this to move several pieces of text around. For example, to delete a word and write it into the W register, do double quote W D A W. Again, the register specification becomes before the delete command D. Appending to a file. 
When collecting lines of text into one file, you can use this command, colon write, right angle bracket, right angle bracket, log file. This will write the text of the current file to the end of log file. Thus, it is appended. This avoids that you have to copy the lines, edit the log file, and put them there. Thus, you save two steps. But you can only append to the end of a file. To append only a few lines, select them in visual mode before typing write. In chapter 10, you will learn other ways to select a range of lines. Chapter 7, part 6. Viewing a file. Sometimes you only want to see what a file contains without the intention to ever write it back. There is the risk that you type colon w without thinking and overwrite the original file anyways. To avoid this, edit the file read only. To start vim in read only mode, use this command, vim r file. On Unix, this command often does the same thing, view file. You are now editing file in read only mode. When you try using colon w, you will get an error message and the file will not be written. When you try to make a change in the file, vim will give you a warning, w10 colon warning, changing a read only file. This change will be done though. This allows for formatting the file, for example, to be able to read it easily. You make changes to a file, forgot that it was read only, you can still write to it. Add the bang to the write command to force writing. If you really want to forbid making changes in a file, do this, vim dash capital M file. Now every attempt to change the text will fail. The help files are like this. For example, if you try to make a change, you will get this error message, E21 cannot make changes. Modifiable is off. You could use the dash M argument to set up Vim to work in a viewer mode. This is only voluntary though, since these commands will remove the protection. Colon set modifiable, colon set right. Chapter seven, part seven, changing the name of a file. A clever way to start editing a new file is by using an existing file that contains most of what you need. For example, you start writing a new program to move a file. You know that you already have a program that copies a file, thus you start with edit copy.c. You can delete the stuff you don't need, and now you need to save the file under a new name. The colon save as command can be used for this. So colon save as move.c. Vim will write the file under the given name and edit that file. Thus the next time you do write, it will write to move.c. Copy.c remains unmodified. When you want to change the name of the file you're editing, but don't want to write the file, you can use the command file move.c. Vim will mark the file as not edited. This means that Vim knows this is not the file you started editing. When you try to edit the file, you might get this message, E13, file exists, use bang to override. This protects you from accidentally overwriting another file. Chapter eight splitting windows. Display two different files above each other, or view two locations in the file at the same time. See the difference between two files by putting them side by side. All this is possible with split windows. Chapter 8, Part 1. The easiest way to open a new window is to use the following command, split. This command splits the screen into two windows and leaves the cursor in the top one, so you would have the same file on the top and the bottom. What you see here is two windows on the same file. The line with all the equals is the status line. It displays information about the window above it. In practice, the status line will be in reverse video. The two windows allow you to view two parts of the same file. For example, you could make the top window show the variable declarations of a program and the bottom one show the code that uses these variables. The control W W command can be used to jump between the windows. If you are in the top window, control W, W, jump you to the window below it. If you are in the bottom window, it will jump you to the first window. Control W, control W does the same thing in case you let go of the control key a little bit later. Close the window. To close a window, use the command close. Actually, any command that quits editing a file works, like quit and zz, but close prevents you from accidentally editing vim when you close the last window. Closing all other windows. If you have opened a whole bunch of windows, but now want to concentrate on just one of them, this command will be useful, colon only. This closes all windows except for the current one. If any of the other windows has changes, you'll get an error message and that window won't be closed. 
Chapter 8, Part 2. Split a window on another file. The two following the following commands open a second window and starts editing the given file. Split 2.c. If you were editing 1.c, the file looks like this. File 2.c on the top and 1.c on the bottom. To open a new window with an empty file, use this, colon new. You can repeat the split and new commands to create as many windows as you like. Chapter 8, Part 3. Window size. The split command can take an argument. If specified, this will be the height of the new window. For example, the following opens a new window three lines high and starts editing the file alpha.c. Colon three split alpha.c. For existing windows, you can change the size in several ways. When you have a working mouse, it's easy. Move the mouse pointer to the status line that separates the two windows and drag it up or down. To increase the size of a window, do Control W plus, and to decrease it, do Control W minus. Both of these commands take account and increase or decrease the window size by that many lines. Thus, four Control W plus make the window four lines longer. To set the window height to a specified number of lines, do a height Control W and underscore. That's a number for height Control W and then an underscore. To make a window as high as it can be, use control W underscore command without a count. Using the mouse. In Vim, you can do many things very quickly from the keyboard. Unfortunately, the windows resizing commands require a bit of typing. In this case, sometimes using the mouse is faster. Position the mouse pointer on a status line. Now press the left mouse button and drag. The status line will move, thus making the window on one side higher and the other one smaller. Options. The win height option can be set to a minimal desired height of a window and win min height to a hard minimum height. Likewise, there is a win width for the, e for the minimal desired width and win mid width for the hard minimum width. The equal always option, when set, makes Vim equalize the window sizes when a window is opened or closed. Chapter 8, Part 4, Vertical Splits. The split command creates the window above the current one. To make the window appear at the left side, use colon vsplit or vsplit2.c. The result looks something like a file on the left and a file on the right. Actually, the bar lines in the middle will be in reverse video. This is called the vertical separator. It separates the two windows left and right of it. There is also, the colon vnew command to open a vertically split window on a new empty file. Another way to do this is colon vertical space new. The colon vertical command can be inserted before another command that splits a window. This will cause that window to split the window vertically instead of horizontally. If the command doesn't split a window, it works unmodified. Moving between windows. Since you can split windows horizontally and vertically as you like, you can create almost any layout of windows. Then you can use these commands to move between them. Control W H, Control W J, Control W K, and Control W L move respectively to the left, below, above, or right windows. You can also do Control W T to move to the top window and Control W B to move to the bottom window. You will notice the same letters as you used for moving the cursor, and the cursor keys can also be used if you like. More commands to move to other windows can be found in Q underscore WI. Chapter 8, Part 5, Moving Windows. You have, a split, you have a split few windows, but now they are in the wrong places. Then you need a command to move the window somewhere else. For example, you have three windows like this, with 2.c on the top, 3.c in the middle, and 1.c on the bottom. Clearly, the last one should be at the top. Go to that window using Control WW, and then type this command, Control W, capital K. This uses the uppercase letter K. What happens is that the window is moved to the very top. You will notice that K is again used for moving upwards. When you have vertical splits, Control W K will move the current window to the top and make it occupy the full width of the Vim window. So if you have three vertical splits with 2.c, 3.c, and 1.c, when you press Control W capital K, you will now have one window across the top and two vertical splits below it. The other three similar commands, and you can probably guess them now, is Control W capital H, 
control W J and control W capital L, all of them being capitals, and they'll move to the left, bottom, and right respectively. Chapter eight, part six, commands for all windows. When you have several windows open and you want to quit Vim, you can close each window separately, but a quicker way is using this command, colon Q all. This stands for quit all. If any of these windows contain changes, Vim will not exit. The cursor will automatically be positioned in a window with changes. You can then either use write to save the changes or quit exclamation to throw them away. If you know there are windows with changes, you want to save all of these changes, you can use colon W all. This stands for write all, but actually it only writes files with changes. Vim knows it doesn't make sense to write files that were not changed. And then there is the combination of Q all and W all, the write and quit all command, which is W Q all. This writes all modified files and quits Vim. Finally, there is a command that quits Vim and throws away all the changes, colon Q all exclamation. Be careful, there's no way to undo this command. Opening a window for all arguments. To make Vim open a window for each file, start it with the dash O argument. Vim dash O, 1.txt, 2.txt, 3.txt, and this results in having three separate splits for each. The dash O argument is used to get vertically split windows with a capital O. When Vim is already running, the all command opens a window for each file in the argument list. The vertical all command does it with vertical splits. Chapter 8, Part 7. Viewing differences with diff mode. There is a special way to start Vim, which shows the differences between two files. Let's take a file, main.c, and insert a few characters in one line. Write this file with the backup option set so that the backup file, main.c, will contain the previous version of the file. Type this command in a shell to start NeoVim in diff mode. nvim-d, main.c tilde, and main.c. Vim will start with two windows side by side. You will only see the line in which you added characters and a few lines above and below it. So there will be some folds and then some changed lines and deleted lines and some text. There will be highlighting inside to show the additions, subtractions, and changes. The lines that were not modified have been collapsed into one line. This is called a closed fold. They are indicated in the picture with an arrow sign and fold. Thus, the single fold line at the top stands for 123 text lines. These lines are equal in both files. The line marked with an arrow and change line is highlighted and the inserted text is displayed with another color. This clearly shows what the difference is between the two files. The line that was deleted is displayed with dashes in the main.c window, so the deleted line marker in the picture. These characters are not really there. They just fill up main.c so that it displays the same number of lines as the other window. The fold column. Each window has a column on the left with a slightly different background. In the picture above, these would be indicated with the VV. You notice there is a plus character there in front of each closed fold. You are able to move the mouse pointer to that plus and click the left button. The fold will open and you can see the text that it contains. The fold column contains a minus sign for an open fold. If you click on this minus, the fold will close. Obviously, these only work when you have a working mouse. You can also use ZO to open a fold and ZC to close it. Diffing in Vim. Another way to start diff mode can be done from inside Vim. Edit the main.c file and make a split to show the differences. Edit main.c and then vertical diff split main.c tilde. The vertical command is used to make the window split vertically. If you omit this, you will get a horizontal split. If you have a patch or diff file, you can use the third way to start diff mode. First edit the file to which the patch applies, then tell Vim the name of the patch file. Edit main.c, vertical diff patch main.c.diff. Warning, the patch file must contain only one patch for the file you are editing. Otherwise, you will get a lot of error messages and some files might be patched unexpectedly. The patching will only be done to the copy of the file in Vim. The file on your hard disk will remain unmodified until you decide to write the file. Scroll binding. When the files have more changes, you can scroll in the usual way. Vim will try to keep both windows start at the same position so you can easily see the differences side by side. When you don't want this for a moment, use the command set no scroll bind. Jumping to changes. 
When you have disabled folding in some way, it may be difficult to find the changes. Use this command to jump forward to the next change, which is right bracket C. To go the other way, use left bracket C. Prepend a count to jump further away. Removing changes. You can move text from one window to the other. This either removes differences or adds new ones. Vim doesn't keep the highlighting updated in all situations. To update it, use this command, colon diff update. To remove a difference, you can move the text in a highlighted block from one window to another. Take the main.c and main.c till the example above. Move the cursor to the left window, and on the line that was deleted in the other window, now type dp. This change will be, will be removed by putting the text of the current window in the other window. dp stands for diff put. You can also do it the other way around. Move the cursor to the right window. Do the line where changed was inserted. Now type this command, do. The change will now be removed by getting the text from the other window. Since there are no changes left now, Vim puts all text in a closed fold. do stands for diff obtain. dg would have been better, but that already has a different meaning. dgg deletes from the cursor until the first line. For details about diff mode, see help diff mode. Chapter 8, Part 8, Various. The last status option can be used to specify when the last window has a status line. Zero means never. One means only when there are split windows, the default. Two is always, and three have a global status line at the bottom instead of one for each window. Many commands that edit another file have a variant that splits the window. For command line command, that is done generally by prepending in S. For example, tag jumps to a tag, while s tag splits the window and jumps to a tag. For normal mode commands, a control w is prepended. Control caret jumps to the alternate file. Control w control caret splits the window and edits the alternate file. The split below option can be set to make a new window appear below the current window, and the split right option can be set to make a vertically split window appear right of the current window. When splitting a window, you can prepend a modifier command to tell the window can When splitting a window, you can prepend a modifier command to tell where the window is to appear. So you could go left above command, which is left or above the current window, above left, same idea. Right below is right or below the current window, and below right is the same idea. Top left command is at the top or left of the Vim window, and bot right is at the bottom or right of the Vim window. Chapter 8, Part 9, Tab Pages. You will have noticed that windows never overlap. That means you quickly run out of screen space. The solution for this is called Tab Pages. Assume you are editing this file. To create a new tab, use this command, tab edit that file. This will edit the file, that file, in a window that occupies the whole Vim window. And you will notice a bar at the top with these two file names, something like that file and this file, with that file now being bold. You now have two tab pages. The first one has a window for this file, and the second one has a window for that file. It's like two pages that are on top of each other, with the tab sticking out of each page showing the file name. Now use the mouse to click on this file in the top line. The result is now that this file is bold, and you're looking at this file's tab. Thus, you can switch between tab pages by clicking on the label in the top line. If you don't have a mouse or don't want to use it, you can use the GT command. The mnemonic for that is go to tab. Now, let's create another tab page with the command tab split. This makes a new tab page with one window that is editing the same buffer as the window we were in. You can put tab before any X command that opens a window. The window will be open in a new tab. Another example will be tab help GT. This will show the help text for GT in a new tab page. A few more things that you can do with tab pages. Click with the mouse in the space after the last label. The next tab will be selected, like with GT. Click with the mouse on the X at the top right corner. The current tab page will be closed, unless there are unsafe changes in the current tab page. Double clip with the mouse in the top line. A new tab page will be created. The tab only command. 
Closes all tab pages except the current one, unless there are unsafe changes in other tab pages. For more information, see Tab Page. <laughs> Chapter 9, Using the GUI Vim works in an ordinary terminal, while GVim has a graphical user interface, GUI. It can do the same things, and a few more. The GUI offers menu, a toolbar, scroll bars, and other items. This chapter is about the extra things that the GUI offers. Editor's Note NeoVim does not ship with GVim, so this is particular to GVim. Chapter 9, Part 1. Parts of the GUI. You might have an icon on your desktop that starts GVim. Otherwise, one of these commands should do it. GVim file.txt. Vim dash g file.txt. If this doesn't work, you don't have a version of Vim with GUI support. You will have to install one first. Vim will open a window and display file.txt in it. What the window looks like depends on the version of Vim. It should resemble something like the following picture, which is as close as we can be done in ASCII or voice. You'll have a window title at the top with an X to close the window. You'll have file, edit, tools, syntax, buffers, window, help as a menu bar. Then you'll have some toolbar with some example things that can be done, a scroll bar on the far left, and then the file contents itself. The largest space is occupied with the file text. This shows the file in the same way as in the terminal with some different colors and another font, perhaps. The window title at the very top is the window title. This is drawn by your window system. Vim will set the title to show the name of the current file. First comes the name of the file, then some special characters and the directory of the file and parents. The special characters can be present, R, dash, for the file cannot be modified, plus, the file contains changes, equals, the file is read-only, or equals plus, the file is read-only, but contains changes anyway. If nothing is shown, you have an ordinary, unchanged file. The menu bar. You know how menus work, right? Vim has the usual items, plus a few more. Browse them to get an idea of what you can use them for. A relevant submenu is edit slash global settings. You will find these entries. Toggle toolbar, which makes the toolbar appear or disappear. Toggle bottom scroll bar to make a scroll bar appear or disappear at the bottom. Toggle left scroll bar, make a scroll bar appear or disappear at the left. And toggle right scroll bar to make a scroll bar appear or disappear at the right. The toolbar. This contains icons for the most often used actions. Hopefully the icons are self-explanatory. There are tool tips to get an extra hint. Move the mouse pointer to the icon without clicking and don't move it for a second. The edit slash global settings slash toggle toolbar menu item can be used to make the toolbar disappear. If you never want a toolbar, use this command in your vimrc file, colon set GUI options minus equal capital T. This removes the T flag from the GUI options. Other part of the GUI can also be enabled or disabled with this option. See the help for it. The scroll bars. By default, there's only one scroll bar on the right. It does the obvious thing. When you split the window, each window will get its own scroll bar. You can make a horizontal scroll bar appear with the menu item for edit, global settings, toggle bottom scroll bar. This is useful in diff mode or when the wrap option has been reset. More about that later. When there are vertically split windows, only the window on the right side will have a scroll bar. However, when you move the cursor to a window on the left, it will be this one that has scroll bar controls. This takes a bit of time to get used to. When you work with vertically split windows, consider adding a scroll bar on the left. This can be done with a menu item or with the GUI options option of set GUI options plus equals L. This adds the L flag to the GUI options. Chapter 9, Part 2. Using the mouse. Standards are wonderful. In Microsoft Windows, you can use the mouse to select text in a standard manner. The X window system also has a standard system for using the mouse. Unfortunately, these two standards are not the same. Fortunately, you can customize Vim. The following commands make the mouse work more like a Microsoft Windows mouse. 
set selection equals exclusive, set select mode equals mouse comma key, and set key model equals start cell comma stop cell. The mouse can be further tuned. Check out these options if you want to change the way how the mouse works. Mouse, which the mode the mouse uh, can be used in Vim. Mouse model, what effect a mouse click has. Mouse time, time between clicks for a double click. Mouse hide, for hiding the mouse while typing. Or select mode, whether the mouse starts visual or select mode. Chapter nine, part three, the clipboard. In section four, part seven, the basic use of the clipboard was explained. There's one essential thing to explain about X dash windows. There are actually two places to exchange text between programs. MS Windows doesn't have this. In X Windows, there is the current selection. This is the text that is currently highlighted. In Vim, this is the visual area. This assumes you are using the default option settings. You can paste this selection in another application without any further action. For example, in this text select a few words with the mouse. Vim will switch to visual mode and highlight the text. Now start another GVim without a file name argument so that it displays an empty window. Click the middle mouse button and the selected text will be inserted. The current selection will only remain valid until some other text is selected. After doing the paste in the other GVim, now select some characters in that window. You will notice that the words that were there previously selected in the other GVim window are displayed differently. This means that it is no longer the current selection. You don't need to select text with the mouse. Using the keyboard commands for visual mode works just as well. The real keyboard. Now, for the other place with which text can be exchanged, we call this the real clipboard to avoid confusion. Often, both the current selection and the real clipboard are called clipboard. You'll have to get used to that. To put text on the real clipboard, select a different word in one of the GVIMs you have running. Then use the edit slash copy menu entry. Now the text has been copied to the real clipboard. You can't see this unless you have some application that shows the clipboard contents. For example, KDE's Clipper. Now select the other GVIM, position the cursor somewhere and use edit slash paste menu. You will see the text from the real clipboard is inserted. Using both. This use of both the current selection and the real clipboard might sound a bit confusing, but it's very useful. Let's show this with an example. Use one GVIM with a text file and perform these actions. Select two words in visual mode. Use the edit copy menu to get the words onto the clipboard. Select one word in visual mode. Use the edit paste item. That what will happen is the single selected word is replaced with the two words from the clipboard. Move the mouse pointer somewhere else and click the middle button. You will see that the word you just overwrote with the clipboard is inserted here. If you use the current selection and real clipboard with care, you can do a lot of useful editing with them. Using the keyboard. If you don't like using the mouse, you can access the current selection and the real clipboard with two registers. The double quote star register is for the current selection. To make text become the current selection, use visual mode. For example, to select a whole line, just use capital V. To insert the current selection before the cursor, use double quote star capital P. Notice the uppercase capital P. The lowercase p puts the text after the cursor. The double quote plus register is used for the real clipboard. For example, to copy the text from the cursor position until the end of the line to the clipboard, use double quote plus Y dollar sign. Remember, Y is for yank, which is Vim's copy command. To insert the contents of the real clipboard before the cursor, use double quote plus capital P. It's the same as for the current selection, but uses the plus register instead of the star register. <coughs> Chapter 9, Part 4, Select Mode. And now something that is used more often on MS Windows than on X Windows, but both can do it. You already know about visual mode. Select mode is like visual mode because it can also be used to select text, but there's an obvious difference. When typing text, the selected text is deleted and the type text replaces it. To start working with select mode, you must first enable it. For MS Windows, it's probably already enabled, but you can do this anyways. Set select mode plus equals mouse. Now use the mouse to select some text. It's highlighted like in visual mode. Now press a letter. The selected text is deleted and the single letter replaces it. You're now in insert mode, thus you can continue typing. Since typing normal text causes the selected text to be deleted, you cannot use the normal movement commands H, J, K, L, W, etc. Instead, use the shifted function keys like shift left, shifted cursor and left key, which moves the cursor left. This selected check text is changed like in visual mode. 
the uh, the other shifted cursor keys do what you expect along with shift and end and shift home also work you can tune the way select mode works with the select mode option <clears throat> chapter 10 making big changes in chapter 4 several ways to make small changes were explained this chapter goes into making changes that are repeated or can affect a large amount of text the visual mode allows doing various things with blocks of test text use an external program to do really complicated things Chapter 10, Part 1, Record and Playback Commands. The dot command repeats the preceding change, but what if you want to do something more complex than a single change? That's where command recording comes in. There are three steps. Step 1, the Q register command starts recording keystrokes into the register named register. The register must name must be between A and Z. Part 2, type your commands. And... Part 3, to finish recording, press Q without any extra character. You can now execute the macro by typing the command at and then the register name. Take a look at how to use these commands in practice. You have a list of file names that look like this. Standard.io.h, functioncontrol.h, unistandard.h, and standardlib.h. And what you want to do is include the following. Pound include standard io.h, pound include function control.h, pound include uni, and pound include standard lib as follows. You start by moving the first character of the first line. Next, you execute the command QA to start recording a macro in register A. Then you press caret to move to the beginning of the line. Now you type I to start insert mode and then pound include double quote escape to put pound include at the beginning of the line. Move to the end of the line. Press A to append text, double quote, and then escape to end. Now you go down one line with J and you press Q to stop recording the macro. Now that you've done this work once, you can repeat the change by typing the command at A three times. The at A command can be preceded by a count, which will cause the macro to be executed that number of times. In this case, you would type three at A. <clears throat> Move and execute. You might have the lines you want to change in various places. Just move the cursor to each location and use the at a command. If you've done that once, you can do it again with at at. That's a bit easier to type. If you now execute register b with at b, the next at at will use register b. If you compare the playback, playback method with using dot, there are several differences. First of all, dot can only repeat one change. As seen in the example above, at A can do several changes and move around as well. Secondly, dot can only remember the last change. Executing a register allows you to make any changes and then still use at A to replay the recorded commands. Finally, you can use 26 different registers. Thus, you can remember 26 different command sequences to execute. Using registers. The registers used for recording are the same ones you used for yank and delete commands. This allows you to mix recording with other commands to manipulate the registers. Suppose you have recorded a few commands in register n. When you execute this with at n, you notice you did something wrong. You could try recording again, but perhaps you'll make another mistake. Instead, use this trick. Use capital G to go to the end of the file. Press O to create a new line and then escape. Do quote np. This puts the text from re the n register, and you now see the command you typed as text in the file. Make any edits that you need to change the commands that were wrong. This is just like editing text. Press 0 to go to the start of the line, and now do double quote ny dollar sign to yank the corrected command into the n register. Now write dd to delete the scratched line. Now you can execute the corrected command with at n. If your recorded command includes line lakes, if your recorded commands include line breaks, adjust the last two items in the example to include all the lines. Appending to a register. So far we have used a lowercase letter for the register name. To append to a register, use an uppercase letter. Suppose you have recorded a command to change a word to register C. It works properly, but you would like to add a search for the next word to change. This can be done with 
Q, capital C, slash word, enter Q. You start with Q, capital C, which records to the C register and appends. Thus, writing to an uppercase register name means to append to the register with the same letter, but lowercase. This works both with recording with yank and delete commands. For example, you want to collect a sequence of lines into a register. Yank them first with quote A, Y, Y. Now, move to the second line and type quote capital A, Y, Y. Repeat this for all lines. The A register now contains all those lines in the order that you yanked them. Chapter 10, Part 2, Substitution. The substitute command enables you to perform string replacement on a whole range of lines. The general form of this command is as follows. Colon, an optional range, substitute, and then a slash, from, slash, to, slash, optional flags. This command changes the from string to the to string in the lines specified with range. For example, you can change professor to teacher in all the lines with the following command colon percent substitute slash professor slash teacher. Note, the substitute command is almost never spelled out completely. Most of the time people use the abbrevi abbreviated version colon s. From here on, the abbreviation will be used. The percent before the command specifies the command works on all lines. Without a range, colon s only works on the current line. More about ranges in the next section, 10.3. By default, the substitute command changes only the first occurrence on each line. For example, the preceding command changes the line Professor Smith criticized Professor Johnson today to Teacher Smith criticized Professor Johnson today. To change every occurrence on the line, you need to add the G or global flag. So the command colon percent s slash colon percent s slash professor slash teacher slash G results in, if we started with the original line, Teacher Smith criticized Teacher Johnson today. Other flags include P for print, which causes the substitute command to print out the last line it changes. The C, or confirm flag, tells substitute to ask you for confirmation before it performs each substitution. So enter the following, colon percent S slash professor slash teacher slash C, and Vim finds the first occurrence of professor and displays the text it is about to change. You get the following prompt. Replace with teacher, yes, no, A, Q, L, care, E, care, W, which at this point means Y for yes, make this change, N, no, skip this match, A for all, make this change and all remaining ones without further confirmation, Q, quit, don't make any more changes, L, last, make this change and then quit, Control E, scroll the text one line up and Control Y, scroll the text one line down. The from part of the substitute command is actually a pattern. The same kind is used for the search command. For example, this command only substitutes the the when it appears at the start of the line. If we did colon s slash caret the slash these. If you are substituting with a from or to part that includes a slash, you need to put a backslash before it. A simpler way is to use another character instead of a slash. A plus, for example, can work. So colon s plus instead of a slash. 1 slash 2 plus 1 or 2 plus. Chapter 10, Part 3, Command Ranges. The substitute command and many other colon commands can be applied to a selection of lines. This is called a range. The simple form of a range is number comma number. For example, 1 comma 5 s, this, that, g, executes the substitute command on the lines 1 to 5. Line 5 is included. The range is always placed before the command. A single number can be used to address one specific line, colon 54s, president slash fool. Some commands work on the whole file when you do not specify a range. To make them work on the current line, the dot address is used. The colon write command works like that. Without a range, it writes the whole file. To make it write only the current line in a file, do colon dot write other file. The first line always has number one. How about the last line? The dollar sign character is used for this. For example, to substitute in the lines from the cursor to the end, you can do colon dot comma dollar sign and then your substitution command, so s slash yes slash no. The percent range that we used before is actually a short way to write one comma dollar sign from the first to the last line. Using a pattern in a range. 
Suppose you're editing a chapter in a book and want to replace all occurrences of gray with an E to gray with an A, but only in this chapter, not in the next one. You know that the only chap you know that only chapter boundaries have the word chapter in the first column. This command will work then. Colon question mark and then you do a caret for chapter question mark comma and then you do the substitution that you wanted to see which is caret chapter slash and then s equals gray equals gray with the two alternate spellings equals g. You can see a search pattern is used twice. The first question caret chapter question finds the line above the current position that matches this pattern. Thus the question pattern question range is used to search backwards. Similarly, slash caret chapter slash is used to search forward for the start of the next chapter. To avoid confusion with the slashes, the equals character was used in the substitute command here. A slash or another character would have worked just as well. Add and subtract. There is a slight error in the above command. If the title of the next chapter has included gray with an E, it would be replaced as well. Maybe that's what you wanted, but what if you didn't? Then you can specify an offset. To search for a pattern and then use the line above it, do slash, chapter, slash, and then minus one. You can use any number instead of the one. To address the second line below the match, you could do slash, chapter, slash, plus two. Offsets can also be used with other items in a range. Look at this one. So if you have dot plus three comma dollar minus five, this specifies the range that starts three lines below the cursor and ends five lines before the last line in the file. Using marks. Instead of figuring out the line numbers of certain positions and remembering them and typing in a range, you can use marks. Place the marks as mentioned in chapter three. For example, use MT to mark the top of an area and MB to mark the bottom. Then you can use this range to specify the lines between the marks, including the lines with the marks. So you can do quote T comma quote B. Visual mode and ranges. You can select text with visual mode. If you then press colon to start a colon command, you will see this quote left angle bracket comma quote right angle bracket. Now you can type the command and it will be applied to the range of lines that was visually selected. When using visual mode to select part of a line or using control V to select a block of text, the colon commands will still apply to the whole lines. This may change in a future version of Vim. The quote left angle bracket and the quote right angle bracket are actually marks placed at the start and end of the visual selection. The marks remain at their position until another visual selection is made. Thus, you can use the quote left angle bracket command to jump to position where the visual area started and you can mix the marks with other items. For example, quote, right angle bracket, comma, dollar sign. This addresses the lines from the end of the visual area to the end of the file. A number of lines. When you know how many lines you want to change, you can type the number and then colon. So for example, you can type five colon and you will get colon dot comma dot plus four. Now you can type the command you want to use. It will use the range dot current line until dot plus four, four lines down. Thus, it spans five lines. Chapter 10, part four, the global command. The global command is one of the most powerful, powerful features of Vim. It allows you to find a match for a pattern and execute a command there. The general form is an optional range global slash pattern slash command. This is similar to the substitute command, but instead of replacing the match text with the other text, the command is executed. Note: The command executed for global must be one that starts with a colon. Normal mode commands cannot be used directly. The colon normal command can do this for you. Suppose you want to change foobar to bar foo, but only in C++ style comments. These comments start with a slash slash. Use this command colon g plus slash slash plus s slash foo bar slash bar foo slash g. Let's break that down. This starts with colon g. That's short for global, just like s is short for substitute. Then the pattern, enclosed in plus characters, since the pattern we're looking for contains a slash, this uses the plus character to separate the pattern. Next comes the substitute, substitute command that changes foo bar into bar foo. The default range for the global command is the whole file. Thus, no range was specified in this example. This is different from substitute, which works on one line without a range. 
The command isn't perfect, since it also matches lines where slash slash appears halfway through a line, and the substitution will also take place before the slash slash. Just like with substitute, any pattern could be used. When you learn more complicated patterns later, you can use them here. Chapter 10, Part 5, Visual Block Mode. With Control v you can start selection of a rectangular area of text. There are a few commands that do something special with the text block. There is something special about using the dollar sign command in visual block mode. When the last motion used was dollar sign, all lines in the visual selection will extend until the end of the line, also when the, line, when the cursor is shorter. This remains effective until you use a motion command that moves the cursor horizontally, thus, keeping, thus using J keeps it and H stops it. Inserting text. The command, capital I, string, escape, inserts the text string in each line, just to the left of the visual block. You can start by pressing Control v to enter visual block mode. Now you move the cursor to define your block. Next you type capital I to enter insert mode, followed by the text to enter. As you type, the text appears on the first line only. After you press escape to end the insert, the text will magically be inserted in the rest of the lines contained in the visual selection. Example, if you have include 1, include 2, include 3, include 4, all on separate lines, and you move the cursor to the O of 1 and press Control v move it down with 3J to 4. You now have a block selection that spans four lines. Now type capital I main dot escape. The result will be include main.1, include main.2, include main.3, and include main.4. If the block spans short lines that do not extend into the block, the text is not inserted in that line. For example, make a block selection that includes the word long in the first and last line of this text and thus has no text selected in the second line. So if you have this is a long line and then short, and then any other long line, and you select that long and insert I vary, you will not insert vary on the short line. If the string you insert contains a new line, the I acts just like a normal insert command and affects only the first line of the block. The capital A command works the same way, except that it appends after the right side of the block and does not insert text in a short line. Thus, you can make a choice whether you do or don't want to append text to a short line. There is one very special case for A. Select a visual block and then use dollar sign to make the text block extend to the end of each line. Using A will now append to the text on the end of each line. Using the same example above, if you do dollar sign A, XXX, you get the result where XXX is added to each line, including the short line. This really requires using the dollar sign command. Vim remembers that it was used. Making the same selection by moving the cursor to the end of the longest line with other movement commands will not have the same result. Changing text. The visual block C command deletes one block and then throws you into insert mode to enable you to type in a string. The string will be inserted in each line in the block. Starting with the same selection of the long words as above, then typing C underscore long underscore escape, you will get the situation where long is now changed to underscore long underscore. Just like with I, the short line is not changed. Also, you can't enter a new line in the new text. The C command, capital C, command deletes text from the left edge of the block to the end of the line. It then puts you in insert mode so that you can type in a string, which is added to the end of each line. Starting with the same text again and typing new C new text escape, you get new text on the long lines and nothing changed about the short line. Again, short lines do not reach into the block that are excluded. Other commands that change characters in the block are, for example, tilde, which swaps case, capital U to make everything uppercase, and lowercase u to make lowercase. Filling with a character. To fill the whole block with one character, use the R command. Again, starting with the same example from above and typing RX, the two longs are replaced and nothing is changed about the short line. If you want to include characters beyond the end of the line in the block, check out the virtual edit feature in chapter 25. Shifting. The command right angle bracket shifts the selected text to the right one shift amount, inserting white space. The starting point for this shift is the left edge of the visual block. With the same example again, the right angle bracket is now that this A and then a large space long line, short with no spaces, and any other large space long line. 
the shift amount is specified with the shift width option. To change it to use four spaces, use set shift width equals four. The left angle bracket removes one shift amount of white space at the left edge of the block. This command is limited by the amount of text that is there. So if there is less than a shift amount of white space available, it removes what it can. Joining lines. The capital J command joins all selected lines together into one line. Thus it removes the line breaks. Actually, the line break, leading white space, and trailing white space is replaced by one space. Two spaces are used after a line ending, but that can be changed with the join spaces option. Let's use the command that we got so familiar with now. The result of using the capital J command is this is a long line short any other line, all on one line. The J command does not require a block, block wise selection. It works with V and with capital V selection in exactly the same way. If you don't want the white space to be changed, use the G capital J command. Chapter 10, part 6. Reading and writing part of a file. When you're writing an email message, you may want to include another file. This can be done with colon read file name command. The text of the file is put below the cursor line, starting with this text. Hi John, here's the diff that fixes the bug. Bye, Pierre. Move the cursor to the second line and type colon read patch. The file name patch will be inserted with this result. Hi John, here's the diff that fixes the bug, and then the patch contents, and then bye Pierre. The read command accepts a range. <clears throat> The file will be put below the last line of the number of this range. Thus, $R patch appends the file patch to the end of the file. What if you want to read the file above the first line? This can be done with the line number 0. This line doesn't really exist, and you will get an error message when using it with most commands, but with this command it's allowed. 0 read patch. The file patch will be put above the first line of the file. Writing a range of lines. To write a range of lines to a file, the write command can be used. Without a range, it writes the whole file. With a range, it writes only the specified lines that are written. Colon dot comma dollar sign write tempo. This writes the line from the cursor until the end of the file into the file tempo. If this file already exists, you will get an error message. Vim protects you from accidentally overwriting an existing file. If you know what you're doing and want to overwrite the file, append bang. Careful. The bang must follow the write command immediately, without whitespace. Otherwise, it becomes a filter command, which is explained later in this chapter. <clears throat> Appending to a file. In the first section of this chapter, it was explained how to collect a number of lines into a register. The same can be done to collect lines into a file. Write the first line with this command, dot write collection. Now move the cursor to the second line you want to collect and type this, dot write, and then two right angle brackets collection. The two right angle brackets tells Vim the collection file is not to be written as a new file, but the line must be appended at the end. You can repeat this as many times as you like. Chapter 10, Part 7, Formatting Text When you are typing plain text, it's nice if the length of each line is automatically trimmed in the window. To make this happen while inserting text, set the text width option. So, set text width equals 78. You might remember that in the example vimrc file, this command was used for every text file. Thus, if you're using that vimrc file, you already are using it. To check the current value of text width, do set text width. Now lines will be broken to take only up to 78 characters. However, when you insert text halfway through a line, or when you delete a few words, the line might get too long or too short. Vim doesn't automatically reformat the text. To tell Vim to format the current paragraph, do GQAP. This starts with the GQ command, which is an operator. Following is the AP. This text object stands for A paragraph. A paragraph is separated from the next paragraph by an empty line. <clears throat> Note, a blank line, which also contains white space, does not separate paragraphs. This may be hard to notice. Instead of AP, Instead of AP, you could use any motion or text object. If your paragraphs are properly separated, you can use this command to format the whole file. GG, GQ, G. GG takes you to the first line, GQ is the format operator, and capital G is the motion that jumps you to the last line. In case your paragraphs aren't clearly defined, you can format just the lines you manually select. Move the cursor to the first line you want to format. Start the command with GQJ. This formats the current line and the one below it. 
If the first line was short, words from the next line will be appended. If it was too long, words will be moved to the next line. The cursor moves to the second line. Now you can use dot to repeat the command. Keep doing this until you are at the end of the text you'd like to format. Chapter 10, part eight, changing case. You have text with section headers in lowercase. You want to make the word section all uppercase. Do this with a G capital U operator. Start with the cursor in the first column. So if you are a cursor on section and you do G capital U word, you'll have all uppercase section. The G lowercase operator does exactly the opposite. And you can also use G tilde to swap case. All these are operators, thus they work without any mo or all these are operators, thus they work with any motion command, with text objects and in visual mode. To make an operator work on lines, you double it. The delete operator is D. Thus, to delete a line, you use DD. Similarly, GUGU -U makes a whole line lowercase. This can be shortened to GUU. -U. G capital U, G capital U is shortened to G capital U capital U and G tilde, G tilde to G tilde tilde. Example of G tilde tilde is all the text on one line has its case swapped. Chapter 10, part nine, using an external program. Vim has a very powerful set of commands. It can do anything, but there may be something that an external program can do better or faster. The command bang motion program takes a block of text and filters it through an external program. In other words, it runs the system command represented by program, giving it the block of text represented by motion as input. The output of this command then replaces the selected block. Because this summarizes badly if you're unfamiliar with Unix filters, take a look at an example. The sort command sorts a file. If you execute the following command, the unsorted file input.txt will be sorted and written to output.txt. This works both on Unix and Windows. So if you run the command sort with a left angle bracket input.txt and a right angle bracket output.txt. Now do the same thing in Vim. You want to sort lines 1 through 5 of a file. You start by putting the cursor on line one. Next, you execute the following command, bang 5G. The bang tells Vim you are performing a filter operation. The Vim editor expects a motion command to follow, indicating which part of the file to filter. The five capital G command tells Vim to go to line five, so it now knows that it is to filter lines one, the current line, through five. In anticipation of the filtering, the cursor drops to the bottom of the screen and a bang prompt displays. You can now type in the name of the filter program, in this case, sort. Therefore, your full command is as follows, bang, 5G, sort, enter. The result is that the sort program is run on the first five lines. The output of the program replaces these lines. So if you had line 55, line 33, and line 11, line 22, line 44, then you would have now, after running sort, line 11, line 22, line 33, line 34, and line 35. The bang bang command filters the current line through a filter. In Unix, the date command prints the current time and date. So bang bang date enter replaces the current line with the output of date. This is useful to add a timestamp to the file. When it doesn't work, Starting a shell, sending it text, and capturing the output requires that Vim knows how the shell works exactly. When you have problems with filtering, check the values of these options. Shell, which specifies the program that Vim uses to execute external programs. Shell command flag, which is the argument to pass a command to the shell. Shell quote, which is quote to be used around the command. Shell x quote, quote to be used around the command and redirection. Shell slash, use forward slashes in the command only for MS Windows and alikes, and shell reader, string used to write the command output into a file. On Unix, this is hardly ever a problem because there are two kinds of shells, sh shells and csh likes. Vim checks the shell option and sets related options automatically, depending on whether it's a C shell somewhere in shell. On MS Windows, however, there are many different shells and you might have to tune the options to make filtering work. Check the help for the options for more information. Reading command output. To read the contents of the current directory into the file, use this. On Unix, colon read bang ls, or on MS Windows, read bang dir. The output of the ls or dir command is captured and inserted in the text below the cursor. 
This is similar to reading a file, except that the bang is used to tell Vim that a command follows. The command may have arguments, and a range can be used to tell where Vim should put the lines. So for example, colon zero read bang date dash u. This inserts the current date and time in UTC format at the top of the file. Well, if you have a date command that accepts the dash u argument. Note the difference between using bang bang date that replaced a line and bang read date will insert a line. Write writing text to a command. The Unix command wc counts words. To count the words in the current file, you can do colon write bang wc. This is the same write command as before, but instead of a file name, the bang character is used and the name of an external program. The written text will be passed to the specified command as its standard input. The output could look something like this, 4, 47, 249. The wc command isn't verbose. This means you have four lines, 47 words, and 249 characters. Watch out for this mistake, where you do colon write exclamation, the bang is before the space, and then wc. This will write the file to wc in the current directory with force. White space is important here. Redrawing the screen. If the external command produced an error message, the display may have been messed up. Vim is very efficient and only redraws those parts of the screen that it knows need redrawing, but it can't know about what other programs have written. To tell Vim to redraw the screen, use Control L. Chapter 11. Re Chapter 11. Recovering from a crash. Did your computer crash? And you just spent hours editing? Don't panic. Vim stores enough information to be able to restore most of your work. This chapter shows how to get your work back and explains how the swap file is used. Chapter 11, Part 1. Basic Recovery. In most cases, recovering a file is quite simple, assuming you know which file you are editing and the hard disk is still working. Start Vim on the file with the dash "-r", argument added. Vim dash "-r", help.txt. Vim will read the swap file, <clears throat> used to store text you are editing, and may read bits and pieces of the original file. If Vim recovered your changes, you will see these messages with different file names, of course. Using swap file dot help dot txt dot swap original file vim runtime doc help dot txt. Recovery completed. You should check if everything is okay. You might want to write out this file under another name and run diff with the original file to check for changes. You may want to delete the dot swap file now. To be on the safe side, write this file under another name, write help.txt.recovered. Compare the file with the original file to check if you ended up with what you expected. Diff mode is very useful for this. See chapter 8, part 7. For example, write help.txt.recovered, colon, edit, pound, and then diff split, help.txt. Watch out for the original file to contain a more recent version, you saved the file just before the computer crashed, and check that no lines are missing, something went wrong that Vim could not recover. If Vim produces warning messages when recovering, read them carefully. This is rare though. If the recovery resulted in text that is exactly the same as the file contents, you will get this message. Using swap file dot help dot txt dot swap, original file would be help dot txt, recovery completed. But for contents equal file contents, you may want to delete the dot swap file now. This usually happens if you already recovered your changes or you wrote the file after making changes. It's safe to delete the swap file now. It's normal that the last few changes cannot be recovered. Vim flushes the changes to disk when you don't type anything for about 4 seconds or after typing about 200 characters. This is set with update time and update count options. Thus when Vim didn't get a chance to save itself when the system went down, the changes after the last flush will be lost. If you were editing without a file name, give an empty string as an argument. Vim dash r double quote double quote. You must be in the right directory, otherwise Vim can't find the swap file. Chapter 11 part 2. Where is the swap file? Vim can store swap files in several places. To find it, change to the directory of the file and use vim-r. Vim will list the swap files that it can find. It will also look in other directories where the swap file for files in the current directory may be located. It will not find swap files in any other directories though. It doesn't search the directory tree. The output could look something like this. Swap files found. In current directory, number one, main.c.swap, owned by Molinar, dated Tuesday, May 29th, 2100 2005, 2001. File name, main.c, modified yes, 
Username Mool, hostname masaka.moolinar.net, process ID 12525, in directory temp, none, in directory var temp, none, in directory temp, none. If there are several swap files that look like they may be the one you want to use, a list is given of these swap files and you are requested to enter the number of the one you want to use. Carefully look at the dates to decide which one you want to use. In case you don't know which one to use, just try them one by one, check the resulting files if they are what you expected. Using a specific swap file. If you know which swap file needs to be used, you can recover by giving the swap file name. Vim will then find out the name of the original file from the swap file. For example, vim-r.help.txt.swo. This is also handy when the swap file is in another directory than expected. Vim recognizes files with the patterns .s and then a u, v, or w, and then a through z as swap files. If this still does not work, see what file names Vim reports and rename the files accordingly. Check the directory option to see where Vim may have put the swap file. Note, Vim tries to find the swap file by searching the directories in the dir option, checking for files that match the file name .sw question mark. If wildcard expansion doesn't work, for example, when the shell option is invalid, Vim does a desperate try to find the file, filename.swap. If this fails too, you will have to give the name to the swap file itself to be able to recover the file. Chapter 11, part three. Vim tries to protect you from doing stupid things. Suppose you innocently start editing a file, expecting the contents of the file to show up. Instead, Vim produces a very long error message. E325, attention, found a swap file by the name .main.c.swap, while opening file main.c. Number one, another program may be editing the same file. If this is the case, be careful not to end up with two different instances of the same file when making changes, quit or continue with caution. Or option two, an edit session crashed for this file. If this is the case, use recover or vim-r to recover the changes. See help recovery. If you did this already, delete the swap file to avoid this message. You get this message because when starting to edit a file, vim checks if a swap file already exists for that file. If there is one, there must be something wrong. It may be one of these two situations. Another edit session is active on the file. Look in the message for the line with process ID. It might look like something like this, process ID 12559, still running. The text still running indicates that the process editing this file runs on the same computer. When working on a non-Unix system, you will not get this extra hint. When editing a file over a network, you may not see the hint because the process might be running on another computer. In those two cases, you must find out what the situation is yourself. If there is another Vim editing the same file, continuing to edit will result in two versions of the same file. The one that is written last will overwrite the other one, resulting in loss of changes. You better quit this Vim. In option two, the swap file might be a result from a previous crash of Vim or computer. Check the dates mentioned in the message. If the date of the swap file is newer than the file you were editing, and this line appears, modified yes, then you very likely have a crashed edit session that is worth recovering. If the date of this file is newer than the date of the swap file, then either it was changed after the crash, perhaps you recovered earlier but didn't delete the swap file, or else the file was saved before the crash but after the last write of the swap file. Then you're lucky. You don't even need that old swap file. Vim will warn you for this with this extra line, newer than swap file. Note that in the following situation, Vim knows the swap file is not useful and will automatically delete it when the file is a valid swap file, so the magic number is correct, the flag that the file was modified is not set, and the process is not running. You can automatically deal with this situation with the file change shell auto command event. Unreadable swap file. Sometimes the line cannot be read will appear under the name of the swap file. This can be good or bad, depending on the circumstance. It's good if a previous editing session crashed without having made any changes to the file. This is a directory listing of the swap file will show that it has zero bytes. You may delete it and proceed. It's slightly bad if you don't have read permission for the swap file. You may want to view the file read only or quit. On multi-user systems, if you yourself did the last changes under a different login name, a logout followed by a login under that other name might cure the read error, or else you might want to find out who last edited or is editing the file and have a talk with them. It is very bad if it means there is a physical read error on the disk containing the swap file. Fortunately, this almost never happens. You may want to view the file read only at first, if you can, to see the extent of the changes that were forgotten. If you are the one in charge of that file, be prepared to redo your last change. 
What to do. If dialogues are supported, you will be asked to select one of the six choices. O for open the file read only. Use this when you just want to view the file and don't need to recover it. You might want to use this when you know someone else is editing, but you want to look at it and not make changes. E is for edit the file anyway. Use this with caution. If the file is being edited in another Vim, you might end up with two versions of the file. Vim will try to warn you when this happens, but better be safe than sorry. R is for recover the file from the swap file. Use this if you know that the swap file contains changes that you want to recover. Q for quit. This avoids starting to edit the file. Use if as there is another Vim editing the same file. When you just started Vim, this will exit Vim. When starting Vim with files in several windows, Vim quits only if there is a swap file for the first one. When using an edit command, the file will not be loaded and you are taken back to the previously edited file. A is for abort, like quick, like quit, but also abort further commands. This is useful when loading a script that edits several files, such as a session with multiple windows. D is for delete. Delete the swap file. Use this when you are sure you no longer need it. For example, when it doesn't contain changes or when the file itself is newer than the swap file. On Unix, this choice is only offered when the process that created the swap file does not appear to be running. If you do not get the dialog, you are running a version of Vim that does not support it, you will have to do it manually. To recover the file, use this command, recover. Vim cannot always detect that a swap file already exists for a file. This is the case when the other edit session puts the swap files in another directory, or when the path name for the file is different when editing it on different machines. Therefore, don't rely on Vim always warning you. If you really don't want to see this message, you can add the A flag, capital A, to the short mess option, but it's very unusual that you need this. For programmatic access to the swap file, see help swap info, parenthesis, parenthesis. For further reading, see Help Swap File, an explanation about where the swap file will be created and what its name is. Help Preserve, manually flushing the swap file to disk. Help Swap Name, to see the name of the swap file for the current file. Help Update Count, which is for the number of keystrokes after which the swap file is flushed to disk. Help Update Time, for timeout after which the swap file is flushed to disk. And Help Directory, for a list of directory names on where to store the swap file. Chapter 12, Clever Tricks. By combining several commands, you can make Vim do nearly everything. In this chapter, a number of useful com combinations will be presented. This uses commands introduced in the previous chapters and a few more. Chapter 12, Part 1, Replace a Word. The substitute command can be used to replace all occurrences of a word with another word. So, percent %s slash 4 slash the number 4 slash g. The percent range means to replace all replace in all lines. The G flag at the end causes all words in a line to be replaced. This will not do the right thing if your file also contains things like 34. It would be replaced with 30 and the number 4. To avoid this, use the backslash left angle bracket item to match the start of the word. Obviously, this still goes wrong with 14, so use the backslash right angle bracket to match the end of the word. If you're programming, you might want to replace 4 in comments but not in your code. Since this is difficult to specify, add the C flag to have the substitute command prompt you for each replacement. So your final command would be colon percent s slash backslash left angle bracket four backslash right angle bracket slash then the number four slash gc. Replacing in several files. <clears throat> Suppose you want to replace a word in more than one file. You could edit each file and type the command manually. It's a lot faster to use record and playback. Let's assume you have a directory with C++ files all ending in .cpp. There's a function called git resp that you want to rename to git answer. vim star .cpp. Start vim, defining the argument list with containing all the C++ files. You are now in the first file. You can start with qq, which starts recording into the q register. Now we do colon percent s slash word boundary git resp word boundary slash git answer slash g. So this replace does replacements in the first file. Then we do colon w next. That writes the file and moves to the next one. We can press q to stop recording. Now we do at q to execute the q register. This will replay the substitution and the w next. You can verify that this doesn't produce an error message. Now you can do 99 at q to execute the q register on the remaining files. At the last file, you will get an error message because colon w next cannot move to the next file. 
This stops the execution and everything is done. Note, when playing back a recorded sequence, an error stops the execution. Therefore, make sure you don't get an error message when recording. There is one catch. If one of the .cpp files does not contain the word get resp, you will get an error and replacing will stop. To avoid this, add the E flag to the substitute command. So same command except slash GE. The E tells substitute that not finding a match is not an error. Chapter 12, part two. Change last comma first to first last. You have a list of names in this form, Doe comma John and Smith comma Peter. You want to change that to John Doe and Peter Smith. This can be done with just one command. So we have colon percent s slash. So here is our from. And what we have is a backslash left parenthesis that starts a capture group. And we have a left bracket caret comma, which says anything not a comma star, which says any of the previous things repeated and then backslash right parenthesis to close this group. So now we're looking for everything up to the comma. Then we have a comma and a space, which matches literally. Then we have a backslash and a left parenthesis to start a new capture group, dot star to match anything, backslash uh, parenthesis to get the rest of that into the capture group. And now we have a slash. So that was our from. Now what we have is two with a backslash two and backslash one which takes the second capture group and does the first capture group. In the two part, we have the slash two and slash one. These are called back references. They refer to the text matched by the group parts in the pattern. Backslash two refers to the text matched by the second backslash left parenthesis backslash right parenthesis, which is the first name. Backslash one refers to the first backslash parenthesis backslash parenthesis, which is the last name. You can use up to nine back references in the two part of a substitute command. Backslash zero stands for the whole matched pattern. There are a few more special items in the substitute command. See help sub dash replace dash special. Chapter 12, part three, sort a list. In a make file, you often have a list of files. For example, obs equals, and then on each new line with backslashes, version o, pch o, get op dot o, util dot o, get opt one dot o, imp dot o, patch dot o, and backup dot o. To sort this list, filter the text through the external sort command. So we can do slash caret obs to begin our search. Then we do j, and then we can look until we have an empty line with a caret and a dollar sign. And then we pass the line previous to that with a dash one and bang sort. This goes to the first line where obj is the first thing in the line. Then it goes one line down and filters the lines to the next empty line. You could also select the lines in visual mode and then use bang sort. That's easier to type, but more work when there are many lines. And the result is the same list, but sorted. Notice that a backslash at the end of each line is used to indicate the line continues. After sorting, this is wrong. The backup.o line that was at the end didn't have a backslash, and now it starts to another place. It must have a black backslash. The simplest solution is to add backslash with capital A space backslash escape. You can keep the backslash in the last line if you make sure an empty line comes after it. That way you don't have this problem again. Chapter 12, part four, reverse line number. The global command can be combined with the move command to move all the lines before the first move, resulting in a reverse file. The command is global caret, so that matches the beginning of the line, slash move zero. Or abbreviated, it can just be colon g slash caret slash m zero. The caret regular expression matches the beginning of the line, even if the line is blank. The colon move command moves the matching line to after the imaginary zeroth line. So the current matching line becomes the first line of the file. As the global command is not confused by changing line numbering, global proceeds to match all remaining lines of the file and puts each one as the first. This also works on a range of lines. First move above the first line and mark it with MT. Then move the cursor to the last line in the range and type colon single single quote T plus one comma dot to go to your current line G slash caret M caret T. So that pushes it to the very beginning of this line. <clears throat> Chapter 12, part five, count words. Sometimes you have to write a text with a maximum number of words. Vim can count the words for you. 
When the whole file is what you want to count the words in, use this command, g, control g. Do not type a space after the g. This is here just to make the command easy to read. The output of this command looks like this, column one of zero, line 141 of 157, word 748 of 774, byte 4489 of 4976. You can see which word you're on and the total of number of words in the file. When the text is only part of a file, you can move to the start of the text, type G control G, move to the end of the text and do G control G again, and then use your brain to compute the difference in the word position. That's a good exercise, but there's an easier way. With visual mode, select the text you want to count words in, then type G, control G. The result is selected 5 of 293 lines, 70 of 1884 words, and 359 of 1009 28 bytes. For other ways to count words, lines, and other items, see count items. Chapter 12, part 6, find a man page. While editing a shell script or C program, you are using a command or function that you want want to find the man page for. This is on Unix. Let's first use a simple way. Move the cursor to the word you want to find help on and press capital K. NeoVim will run the colon man on the word. If the man page is found, it's displayed. You can also use the colon man command to open a window on a man page by doing colon man csh. You can scroll down and the text is highlighted. This allows you to find the help you were looking for. Use control WW to jump to the window with the text you were working on. To find a man page in a specific section, put the section number first. For example, to look in section 3 for echo, do colon man 3 echo. To jump to another man page, which is in the text with the typical form of word left parenthesis 1 right parenthesis, press control right bracket on it. Further man commands will use the same window. To display a man page for the word under the cursor, use this, shift K. For example, you want to know the return value of stir stir while editing this line. If stir stir input comma AAP, move the cursor to somewhere on stir stir and type capital K. A window will open to display the man page for stir stir. Chapter 12, part 7, trim blanks. Some people find spaces and tabs at the end of a line useless, wasteful, and ugly. To remove white space at the end of every line, execute the following command, colon percent s slash slash s slash plus dollar sign slash slash. The line range percent is used, thus this works on the whole file. The pattern that the substitute command matches with is backslash s backslash plus dollar sign. This find white space characters, one or more of them, so this white space is from slash s, and the one or more is from the slash plus, before the end of the line, dollar sign. Later will be explained how you write patterns like this in user 27. The two part of the substitute command is empty, slash slash. Thus it replaces it with nothing, effectively deleting the matched white space. Another wasteful use of spaces is placing them before a tab. Often these can be deleted without changing the amount of spaces, but not always. Therefore, best to do it manually. Use this search command. You can't see it, but there is a space and a tab in this command. Thus it's slash space tab. Now use X to delete the space and check the amount of white space doesn't change. You might have to insert a tab if it does change. Type N to find the next match. Repeat this until there are no matches to be found. 12.8, chapter 12, part eight. Find where a word is used. If you are a Unix user, you can use a combination of vim and the grep command to edit all the files that contain a given word. This is extremely useful if you are working on a program and want to view or edit all the files that contain a specific variable. For example, suppose you want to edit all the C program files that contain the word frame or counter. To do this, you can do vim and then backtick grep-l frame counter star.c backtick. Let's look at this command in detail. The grep command searches through a set of files for a given word. Because the dash L command is specified, the command will only list the files containing the word and not print the matching lines. The word it is searching for is frame counter. Actually, this can be any regular expression. Note, what grep uses for regular expression is not the exact same as what vim uses. The entire command is enclosed in backticks. This tells the Unix shell to run this command and pretend that the results were typed on the command line. So what happens is that the grep command is run and produces a list of files, and these files are put on the vim command line. This results in vim editing the file list that is the output of grep. You can use the commands like next and first to browse through these files. The above command only works to find the files 
which the word is found. You still have to find the word within the files. Vim has a built-in command that you can use to search for a set of files for a given string. If you want to find all occurrences of error string in all C program files, for example, enter the following command, grep error string star.c. This causes Vim to search for the string error string in all the specified files star.c. The editor will now open the first file where a match is found and position the cursor on the first matching line. To go to the next matching line, no matter in what file it is, use the cnext command. To go to the previous match, use the cprev. Use clist to see all the matches and where they are. The grep command uses the external program grep on Unix or findster on Windows. You can change this setting by changing the option grep prg. <clears throat> Chapter 20, Typing Command Line Commands Quickly. You may have noticed that we went from chapter 12 to chapter 20. That's because that's how we're currently counting. There's some missing ones. It's just different sections. We'll resume here in chapter 20 now. Vim has a generic feature that makes it easier to enter commands. Colon commands can be abbreviated, edited, and repeated. Completion is available for nearly anything. Chapter 20, Part 1, Command Line Editing. When you use a colon command or search for a string with slash or question mark, Vim puts the cursor on the bottom of the screen. There you type the command or search pattern. This is called the command line, also when it's used for entering a search command. The most obvious way to edit the command you type is by pressing the backspace key. This erases the character before the cursor. To erase another character typed earlier, first move the cursor with the cursor keys. For example, you may have typed colon s slash column slash pig. Before you hit enter, you notice that col should be cow. To correct this, you type left five times. The cursor is now just after col. Press bs and type w to correct. So now it would be colon s slash cow slash pig. Now you can press enter directly. You don't have to move the cursor to the end of the line before executing the command. The most often used keys to move around the command line are left and right to move one character, shift left or shift right to <clears throat> move one word left or right, and the same can be used for control left or control right, control B or home to move to the beginning of the command line, and control E or end to the end of the command line. <clears throat> Note, shift left, cursor left with the shift key pressed, and control left, cursor left with control key pressed, will not work on all keyboards. Same for the other shift and control combinations. You can also use the mouse to move the cursor. Deleting. As mentioned, backspace deletes the character before the cursor. To delete a whole word, use control W. If you have the fine pig, and then you press control W, you will just have the fine. Control U removes all text, thus allowing you to start all over again. Overstrike. The insert key toggles between inserting characters and replacing the existing ones. Start with this text, the fine pig. Move the cursor to the start of fine with shift left twice or left eight times if shift left doesn't work. And now press enter to switch to overstrike and type great. Now it will say the great pig. Oops, we lost a space. Don't use backspace because it would delete the T. This is different from a place mode. Instead, press insert to switch from overstrike to inserting and type the space. Slash the great pig. 
canceling. You thought of executing a colon or slash command, but changed your mind. You can get rid of what you typed without executing by pressing control C or escape. Note, escape is the universal get out key. Unfortunately, in good old DI, pressing escape in the command line executed the command. Since that might be considered a bug, Vim uses escape to cancel the command. But with the CP option, it can be made to be VI compatible. And when using a mapping, which might be written for VI, escape also works VI compatible. Therefore, using control C is a method that always works. If you are on if you are at the start of the command line, pressing backspace will cancel the command. It's like deleting the colon or the slash that the line starts with. Chapter 20, part two, command line abbreviations. Some of the colon commands are really long. We already mentioned that substitute can be abbreviated to S. This is a generic mechanism. All colon commands can be abbreviated. How short can commands get? There are 26 letters and many more commands. For example, set also starts with S, but S doesn't start a set command. Instead, set can only be abbreviated to SE. When the shorter form of command could be used for two commands, it stands for only one of them. There is no logic behind which one. You have to learn them. In the help files, the shortest form that works is mentioned. For example, colon substitute, but there's a left bracket before the U in substitute and a right bracket at the end. This means the shortest form of substitute is S. The following characters are optional. Thus, colon SU and colon sub also work. In the user manual, we were either use the full name of command or a short version that's still readable. For example, colon function can be abbreviated to colon FU. But since most people don't understand what that stands for, we will use fun. Vim doesn't have a funny command. Otherwise, colon fun would be confusing too. It's recommended that in Vim scripts, you write the full command name. That makes it easier to read back when you make later changes, except for some often used commands like colon W and colon R. A particularly confusing one is end, which could stand for end if, end while, or end function. Therefore, always use the full name. Short option names. In the user manual, the long version of the option names is used. Many options also have short names. Unlike colon commands, there is only one short name that works. For example, the short name of auto indent is AI. Thus, these commands do the same thing, set auto indent or set AI. You can find the full list of long and short names here in help option list. Chapter 20, part three, command line completion. This is one of the features that Vim by itself is a reason to switch from VI to Vim. Once you have used this, you cannot do without. Suppose you have a dic directory that contains these files info.txt, intro.txt, and bodyofthepaper.txt. To edit the last one, you use the command colon edit bodyofthepaper.txt. It's very easy to type this wrong. A much quicker way is colon edit b and then tab, which will result in the same command. What happened? The tab key does completion of the word before the cursor. In this case, b. Vim looks in the directory and finds only one file that starts with a b. That must be the one you're looking for. Thus, Vim completes the file name for you. Now type colon edit I tab. Vim will beep and give you edit info.txt. The beep means that Vim has found more than one match. It then uses the first match it found alphabetically. If you press tab again, you get edit intro.txt. Thus, if the first tab doesn't give you the file you were looking for, press it again. If there are more matches, you will see them all one at a time. If you press tab on the last matching entry, you will go back to what you first typed, edit I in this case. Then it starts all over again. Thus Vim cycles through the list of matches. Use control P to go through the list in the other direction. Context. When you type set I instead of edit I and press tab, you get set icon. Hey, why didn't you get set info.txt? That's because Vim has context sensitive completion. The kind of words Vim will look for depends on the command before it. Vim knows that you cannot use a file name just after a set command, but you can use an option name. Again, if you repeat typing the tab, Vim will cycle through all the matches. There are quite a few. It's better to type a few characters first. For example, set isk tab gives set is keyword. Now type equals and press tab. And what happens here is that Vim inserts the old value of the option. Now you can edit it. 
What is completed with tab is what Vim expects in that place. Just try it out and see how it works. In some situations, you will not get what you want. That's either because Vim doesn't know what you want or because completion was not implemented for that situation. In that case, we will get a tab inserted, often is displayed as caret i. List matches. When there are many matches, you would like to see an overview. Do this by pressing Control D. For example, pressing Control D after colon set is results in a list of ink search, is f name, is indent, is keyword, and is print. Vim lists the matches and then comes back with the text you typed. You can now check the list for the item you wanted. If it isn't there, you can use backspace to correct the word. If there are many matches, type a few more characters before pressing tab to complete the rest. If you've watched carefully, you will have noticed that ink search doesn't start with IS. In this case, IS stands for the short name of ink search. Many options have a short and a long name. Vim is clever enough to know that you might have wanted to expand the short name of the option into the long name. There's more. The control L command completes the word to the longest unambiguous string. If you type colon edit I and there are files info.txt and info underscore backup.txt, you will get edit info. The wild mode option can be used to change the way completion works, and the wild menu option can be used to get a menu-like list of completions. Use the suffixes option to specify files that are less important and appear at the end of the list of files. The wild ignore option specifies files that are not listed at all. More about all of this can be found in help command line comple completion. Chapter 20, part four, command line history. In chapter 3, we briefly mention the history. The basics are that you can use the up key to recall an older command line. Down then takes you back to newer commands. There are actually five histories. The ones we will mention here are for colon commands and for slash commands and question mark search commands. The slash and question mark commands share the same history because they are both search commands. The three other histories are for expressions, debug mode commands, and input lines for the input function. See help command line history. Suppose you have done a set command, typed 10 more colon commands, and then want to repeat that set command again. You could press colon and then 10 times up, but there's a quicker way. Type colon se and then up. Vim will now go back to the previous command that started with se. You have a good chance that this is the set command you were looking for. At least you should not have to press up very often, unless set commands are all that you have done. The up key will use the text type so far and compare it with the lines in the history. Only matching lines will be used. If you do not find the line you are looking for, use down to go back to what you typed and correct that. Or use control U to start all over again. To see all the lines in the history, type history. That's the history of colon commands. The search history is displayed with this command, colon history slash. Control P will work like up, except that it doesn't matter what you already typed. Similarly for control N and down. Control P stands for previous and control N starts for next. Chapter 20, part five, command line window. Typing the text in the command line works differently from typing text in insert mode. It doesn't allow many commands to change the text. For most commands, that's okay, but sometimes you have to type a complicated command. And that's where the command line window is useful. Open the command line window with this command, Q colon. Vim now opens a small window at the bottom. It contains the command line history and an empty line at the end. You are now in normal mode. You can use HJKL keys to move around. For example, move up with 5K and you can yank one of the lines. Then type $H to go to the I in the in and type CW out. This would let you change earlier commands that you've done. Now press enter and this command will be executed. The command line window will close. The enter command will execute the line under the cursor. It doesn't matter whether Vin is in insert mode or in normal mode. Changes in the command line window are lost. They do not result in the history being changed, except that the command you execute will be added to the end of the history, like with all executed commands. The command line window is very useful when you want to have overview of history, looking up a similar command, change it a bit, and execute it. A search command can be used to find something. In the previous example, the question mark config search command could have been used to find the previous command that contains config. It's a bit strange because you are using a command line to search in the command line window. While typing that search command, you can't open another command line window. There can only be one.
Chapter 21, Go Away and Come Back. This chapter goes into mixing the use of other programs with Vim, either by executing program from inside Vim or by leaving Vim and coming back later. Furthermore, this is about the ways to remember the state of Vim and restore it later. Chapter 21, Part 1, Suspend and Resume. Like most Unix programs, Vim can be suspended by pressing Ctrl-Z. This stops Vim and takes you back to the shell it was started in. You can then do any other commands until you're bored with them. Then bring back Vim with the FG command. So, Control z any sequence of shell commands, and FG. You are right back when you left Vim. Nothing has changed. In case pressing Control z doesn't work, you can also use the command suspend. Don't forget to bring Vim back to the foreground. You would lose any changes that you made. Only Unix has support for this. On other systems, Vim will start a shell for you. This also has the functionality of being able to execute shell commands, but it's a new shell, not the one you started Vim from. When you are running the GUI, you can't go back to the shell where Vim was started. Control z will minimize the Vim window instead. Chapter 21, Part 2, Executing Shell Commands To execute a single shell command from Vim, use colon bang command. For example, to see a directory listing, use colon bang ls, or dir, on Windows. Vim will execute the program. When it ends, you will get a prompt to hit enter. This allows you to have a look at the output from the command before returning to the text you are editing. The bang is also used in other places where a program isn't run. Let's take a look at an overview. Bang program just executes a command. R space bang program executes a program and reads its input. W space bang program execute program and send text to its input. And we also have range bang program, which is filter text through program. Notice the presence of a range before bang program makes a big difference. Without it, it executes the program normally. With the range, a number of text lines is filtered through the program. Executing a whole row of programs this way is possible, but a shell is much better at it. You can start a new shell with colon terminal. This is similar to using control Z to spend Vim. The difference is that a new shell is started. Chapter 21, part three, remembering information, SHADA. After editing for a while, you have text and registers, marks and various files, and a command line history filled with carefully crafted commands. When you exit Vim, all of this is lost, but you can get it back. The SHADA, which is an abbreviation of shared data file, is designed to store status information. It contains command line and search pattern history, text and registers, marks for various files, the buffer list, and global variables. Each time you exit Vim, it will store this information in a file, the SHADA file. When Vim starts again, the SHADA file is read and the information is restored. The SHADA option is set by default to restore a limited number of items. You might want to set it to remember more information. This is done using the following command set shada equals some string. The string specifies what to save. The syntax of the string is an option character followed by an argument. The option argument pairs are separated by commas. Take a look at how you can build up your own shada string. First, the single quote option is to used to specify how many files for which you would save marks, the a to z lowercase marks. Pick a nice even number for this option, a thousand for instance. Your command now looks like this, set shada equals single quote 1000. The F option controls whether global marks A to Z and 0, 09 are stored. If this option is 0, none are stored. If it's 1, or you do not specify an F option, the marks are stored. If you want this feature, so now you have this. Set SHADA equals single quote 1000 comma F1. The left angle bracket option controls how many lines are saved for each of the register. By default, all the lines are saved. If 0, nothing is saved. To avoid adding thousands of lines to your SHADA, which might never get used and make starting Vim slower, you could use a maximum of 500 lines. So now you've added comma, left angle bracket 500, which looks like less than 500. Other options you might want to use, colon, the number of lines to save from the command line history, at, the number of lines to save from the input line history, slash, the number of lines to save from search history, r, removable media, for which no marks will be stored, bang for global variables that start with an uppercase letter and don't contain local, lowercase variables, h for disable hl search highlighting when starting, percent the buffer list 
only restored when starting Vim without arguments. C, convert the text using encoding, and N, name used for the SHADA file, which must be the last option. See the SHADA option and SHADA file for more information. When you run Vim multiple times, the last one exiting will store its information. This may cause information that previously exiting Vim stored to be lost. Each item can only be remembered once. Getting back to where you stopped Vim. You're halfway through editing a file and it's time to leave for holidays. You exit Vim and you go enjoy yourselves, forgetting all about your work. After a couple of weeks, you start Vim and type single quote zero and you're right back to where you left Vim so you can get on with your work. Vim creates a mark each time you exit Vim. The last one is single quote zero. The position that single quote zero pointed to is made single quote one and single quote one is made to single quote two and so forth. Mark nine is lost. The marks command is useful to find out where the zero through nine marks will take you. Getting back to some file. If you want to go back to a file that you edited recently, but not when exiting Vim, there's a slightly more complicated way. You can see a list of files by typing this command, old files, which will have a list of something like one colon config and vim init.vim, two text resume.txt, and three temp draft. Now you would like to edit the second file, which in the list is preceded by two colon. So you type colon e pound for alternate less than two. Instead of colon e, you can use any command that has a file name argument. The pound less than two item works in the same place as percent, which is the current file name and pound for alternate file name. You can also split the window to edit the third file, colon split pound less than three. That pound less than one, two, three thing is a bit complicated when you want to edit a file. Fortunately, there's a simpler way. You can write colon browse old files. You get the same list of files as with old files. If you want to edit resume.txt, first press Q to stop the listing. You will get a prompt. Type number and enter. Empty cancels. Type 2 and press enter to edit the second file. More info at old files and v old files and c underscore pound less than. Move info from one vim to another. You can use the w shada and r shada commands to save and restore the information while still running vim. This is useful for exchanging register contents between two instances of vim, for example. In the first vim do, colon w shada bang tilde temp shada. And in the second vim do, r shada bang tilde temp shada. Obviously the w stands for write and the r for read. The bang character is used by w shada to forcefully overwrite an existing file. When it's omitted and the file exists, the information is merged into the file. The bang character used for R shada means that all information in shada file has priority over existing information. This may overwrite it. Without bang, the only information that wasn't set is used. These commands can also be used to store info and use it again later. You could make a directory full of shada files, each containing info for a different purpose. Chapter 21, part four, sessions. Suppose you're editing along and it's the end of the day. You want to quit work and pick up where you left off the next day. You can do this by saving your editing session and restoring it the next day. A Vim session contains all the information about what you are editing. This includes things such as file list, window layout, global variables, options, and other information. Exactly what is remembered is controlled by the session options information. Described below. The following command creates a session file. Make session vimbook.vim. Later, if you want to restore the session, you can use this command, source vimbook.vim. If you want to start vim and restore a specific session, <clears throat> you can use the following command, vim-s vimbook.vim. This tells vim to read a specific file on startup. The capital S stands for session. Actually, you can source any vim script file with dash s, thus is might as well stand for source. The windows that are open are stored and the same position and size as before. Mappings and option values are like before. What exactly is restored depends on the session options option. The default value is blank, buffers, curator, folds, help, options, tab pages, win size, and terminal. So blank keeps empty windows. Buffers, all buffers, not the only ones in a window. Current dir, the current directory. Folds, folds as well as manually created ones. Help, which is the help window. Options, which is all options and mappings. Tab pages, which is all tab pages, win size, which is window sizes, and terminal, which includes terminal windows. Change this to your liking. To also restore the size of the win 
the Vim window, for example, use set session options plus equals resize. Session here, session there. The obvious way to use sessions is when working on different projects. Suppose you store your session files all in the directory of config and Vim. You are currently working on the secret project and have to switch to the boring project. So you could do write all and then make session with a bang to overwrite config and Vim secret dot Vim. And then you can source config and Vim boring dot Vim. The first w all is to write all modified files. Then the current session is saved using make session. This overwrites the previous session. The next time you load the secret session, you can continue where you were at this point. And finally, you load the new boring session. If you open help windows, split and close various windows and generally mess up the window layout, you can go back to the last saved session with source config and vim boring vim. Thus, you have complete control over whether you want to continue next time where you are now by saving the current setup in a session or keep the session file as a starting point. Another way of using sessions is to create a window layout that you like to use and save this in a session. Then you can go back to this layout whenever you want. For example, a nice layout to use might be having an explorer on the left side and some help file on the top and a file to the right. This has a help window at the top so you can read this text. The narrow vertical window on the left contains a file explorer. This is a Vim plugin that lists the contents of a directory. And you can select files to edit there. More about this in the next chapter. Create this from a just started Vim with help, control WW, colon vertical split with tilde slash. You can resize the windows a bit to your liking and then save the session with make session config and Vim mine dot Vim. Now you can start Vim with this layout, Vim dash S tilde config and Vim mine dot Vim. Hint, to open a file you see listed in the explorer window in the empty window, move the cursor to the file name and press O. Double clicking with the mouse will also do this. <clears throat> sessions and shada sessions store many things but not the position the marks contents of registers and the command line history you need to use a shada feature for these things in most situations you will want to use sessions separately from shada this can be used to switch to another session but keep the command line history and yank text into registers in one session and paste it back in another session you might prefer to keep the info with the session you'll have to do this yourself then for example, make session to the secret vim and then wshada to secret.shada. To restore this again, you can source the secret.vim session and rshada the secret.shada. Chapter 21, part 5 is views. A session stores the looks of the whole of vim. When you want to store the properties for one win only, use a view. The use of a view is for when you want to edit a file in a specific way. For example, you have line numbers enabled with a number option and defined a few folds. Just like with sessions, you can remember this view on the file and restore it later. Actually, when you store a session, it stores the view of each window. There are two basic ways to use views. The first is to let Vim pick a name for the view file. You can restore the view later when you edit the same file. To store the view for the current window, write make view with M-K-V-I-E-W. Vim will decide where to store the view. And when you later edit the same file, you can get the view back with this command, load view. That's easy, isn't it? Now you want to view the file without the number option on or with all folds open. You can set the options to make the window look that way. And you can store this view with make view one. Obviously you can get this back with load view one. Now you can switch between the two views on the file by using load view with or without the one argument. You can store up to 10 views for the same file this way, one unnumbered and nine numbered one to nine. A view with a name. The second basic way to use views is by storing the view in a file with a name you choose. This view can be loaded while editing another file. Vim will then switch to adding the file specified in the view. Thus, you can use this to quickly switch to adding another file with all its options set as you save them. For example, to save the view of the current file, we can do make view and then pass a path of config and vim main.vim, and you could restore it with source config and vim main.vim. Chapter 21, part 6, mode lines. When editing a specific file, you might set options specifically for that file. Typing these commands each time is boring. Using a session or view for editing a file doesn't work when sharing the file between several people. The solution for this situation is adding a mode line to the file. This is a line of text that tells Vim the values of options to be used in this file only. 
A typical example is a C program where you make indents to be a multiple of four spaces. This requires setting the shift width option to four. This mode line will do that, where you have vim colon set shift width equals four. Put this line as one of the first or last, fast, last five lines in the file. When editing the file, you will notice that shift width will have been set to four. When editing another file, it's set back to the default value of eight. For some files, the mode line fits well in the header, thus it can be put at the top of the file. For text files and other files where the mode line gets in the way of the normal contents, put it at the end of the file. The mode lines option specifies how many lines at the start and end of the file are inspected for containing a mode line. To inspect 10 lines, do set mode lines equals 10. The mode line option can be used to switch this off. Do this when you're working as root on Unix or administrator on MS Windows, or when you don't trust the files you're editing. Set no mode line. Use this form format for any mode line. You can have any text at the front, then vim colon set, option equals value, and then a space, and then option equals value as you want to go, followed by a colon, and then any text. The any text indicates that you can put any text before and after the part that vim will use. This allows making it look like a comment, like what was done above with slash star and star slash. The vim colon part is what makes vim recognize this line. There must be white space before vim, or vim must be at the start of the line. Thus using something like gvim will not work. The part between the colons is a set command. It works the same way as typing the set command, except that you need to insert a backslash before a colon. Otherwise it would be seen at the, as the end of the mode line. Another example could be slash slash vim colon set text width equals 72 dir equals c slash colon slash temp colon and then that would be using c temp here. There's an extra backslash before the first colon so that it's included in the set command. The text after the second colon is ignored thus a remark can be placed here. For more details see mode line. Editor's note for this chapter is that NeoVim now sorts uh, now supports editor config by default. Chapter 22, finding the file to edit. Files can be found everywhere. So how do you find them? Vim offers various ways to browse the directory tree. There are commands to jump to a file that is mentioned in another, and Vim remembers which files have been edited before. Chapter 22, part one, the file browser. Vim has a plugin that makes it possible to edit a directory. Try this, edit dot. Through the magic of auto commands and Vim script, the window will be filled with the contents of this directory. It looks something like this. The top will say net rw listing. There will be some options displayed above, and then you'll see the directory listing below. So there will be the name of the browsing tool and its version number, the name of the browsing directory, the method of sorting, how names are to be sorted, directories first, then star.h, star c, etc. how to get help, use the F1 key, and an abbreviated listing of available commands. And then a listing of files, including dot dot slash, which allows one to list the parent directory. If you have syntax highlighting enabled, the different parts are highlighted so as to make it easier to spot them. You can use normal mode vim commands to move around in the text. For example, move the cursor atop a file and press enter. You will then be editing that file. To go back to the browser, use edit dot again or explore with a capital E. Control O works as well. Try using enter while the cursor is atop a directory name. The result is that the file browser moves into that directory and displays the items found there. Pressing entry, enter on the first directory moves you one level higher. Pressing dash does the same thing without the need to move to the dot dot slash item first. 
You can press F1 to get help on things you can do in the NetRW file browser. This is what you get. F1 for help, enter for browsing, delete for deleting files, dash for going up, A for hiding files or directories, MB for bookmarking a directory, GB changing to a bookmark directory, CD for make browsing directory the current dir, D to make a new directory, capital D to delete files or directories, control H to edit a file or directory or hiding listing, I for change listing style, control L for refreshing the listing, O for browsing with a horizontal split, P for a preview window, capital P edit in previous previous window, Q for listing bookmarks and history, and R for reversing sorting order. And there's more in that help section. The F1 key thus brings you to a NetRW directory browsing content help page. It's a regular help page. Use the usual control right bracket to jump to tagged help items and control O to jump back. To select files for display and editing with the cursor when the cursor is atop a file name, enter opens the current file in the current window, O horizontally split window and display file, V for vertically split window and, disp and display file, P for use the preview window, capital P for edit in the pre previous window, and T for open file in the new tab. The following normal mode commands may be used to control the browser display. I controls a listing style, thin, long, wide, and tree. The long listing includes size and date information. S, repeatedly pressing S will change the way the files are sorted. One may sort on name, modification time, or size. And R reverses the sorting order. As a sample of extra normal mode commands, we can do CD, which change Vim's notion of the current directory to be the same as the browser directory. C, G, NetRW, Keepter to control this too. Capital R renames the file or directory under the cursor. A prompt will be issued for the new name. Capital D deletes the file or directory under the cursor. A confirmation request will be issued. And MB or GB makes a bookmark or goes to bookmark. One may also use command mode again, just a sampling. You can do colon explore and then a directory to explore specified or current directory. And NetRW settings, which is a comprehensive list of your current NetRW settings with help linkage. The NetRW browser is not limited to just your local machine. One may use URLs such as explore ftp colon slash slash some host slash path to dir slash or e scp colon slash slash some host path to dir. See NetRW browse for more. Chapter 22, part two, the current directory. Just like the shell, Vim has the concept of a current directory. Suppose you're in your home directory and you want to edit several files in a directory, very long file name. You could do edit very long file name file1.txt, edit very long file name file2.txt, edit very long file name file3.txt. But to avoid so much typing, you can do this cd very long file name, edit file1.txt, edit file2.txt, and edit file3.txt. The cd command changes the current directory. You can see what the current directory is with the pwd command, which will print the current directory. Vim remembers the last directory that you used. Use cd dash to go back. So example, if the present working directory is home, bram, very long file name, we cd to etsy and then we do pwd, it will print etsy. We can cd back and then pwd and we'll see that we're now in home, bram, very long file name. cd dash and then go back and where pwd is in etsy. Window local directory. When you split a window, both windows use the same current directory. When you want to edit a number of files somewhere else in the new window, you can make it use a different directory without changing the current directory in the other window. This is called a local directory. So if we run pwd and we're in very long file name and we split and then use the command lcd for slash etsy, if we pwd we'll see etsy. And if we do control WW to move back to our original window and run PWD, we'll see home, bram, very long file name. So long as no LCD command has been used, all windows share the same current directory. Doing a CD command in one window will also change the current directory of the other window. For a window where LCD has been used, a different current working directory is remembered. Using CD or LCD in other windows will not change it. 
When using a CD command in a window that uses a different current directory, it will go back to using the shared directory. Tab local directory. When you open a new tab page, it uses the directory of the window in the previous tab page from which the new tab page was opened. You can change the directory of the current tab page using the colon tcd command. All the windows in a tab page share this directory except for windows with a window local directory. Any new windows open in this tab page will use this directory as the current working directory. Using a cd command in a tab page will not change the working directory of tab pages which have a tab local directory. When the global working directory is changed using the cd command in a tab page, it will also change the current tab page working directory. Chapter 22, Part 3. Finding a file. You're editing a C program that contains this line. Include init.h. You want to see what's in the init.h file. Move the cursor on the name of the file and type gf. Chat wouldn't understand. Vim will find the file and edit it. What if the file is not in the current directory? Vim will use the path option to find the file. This option is a list of directory names where to look for your file. Suppose you have your include files located in C prog include. This command will add it to the path option, set path plus equals C colon slash prog slash include. This directory is an absolute path. No matter where you are, it will be in the same place. What if you have located files in a subdirectory below where the file is? Then you can specify a relative path name. This starts with a dot, set path plus equals dot slash proto. This tells Vim to look in this directory, proto, below the directory where the file is in when you use gf. Then, thus using gf on init.h will make Vim look for protos slash init.h starting in the directory of the file. Without the dot slash, thus proto, Vim would look in the proto directory below the current directory. And the current directory might not be where the file is that you are, that you are editing is located. The path option also allows specifying the directories where to search for files in many more ways. See the help on the path option. The isFName option is used to decide which characters are included in the file name and which ones are not. For example, the double quote character in the example above. When you know the file name but it's not to be found in the file, you can type it with colon find init.h. Vim will then use the path option to try and locate the file. This is the same as edit command, except for the use of path. To open the find file in a new window, use control wf instead of gf, or use sfind instead of find. A very nice way to directly start vim to edit a file somewhere in path in, in your path is vim with a double quote plus find standard.io.h double quote. This finds the file standard.io.h in your value of path. The quotes are necessary to have one argument. You can see dash plus C, the help for more information about what plus does in the command list. Chapter 22, part four, the buffer list. The Vim editor uses the term buffer to describe a file being edited. Actually, a buffer is a copy of the file that you edit. When you finish changing the buffer, you write the contents of the buffer to the file. Buffers not only contain file contents, but also all of the marks, settings, and other stuff that goes with it. Hidden buffers. Suppose you're editing the file 1.txt and need to edit the file 2.txt. You could simply use edit 2.txt, but since you made changes to 1.txt, that won't work. You also don't want to write 1.txt yet. Vim has a solution for this. You can write hide edit 2.txt. The buffer 1.txt disappears from the screen, but Vim still knows that you're editing this buffer, so it keeps the modified text. This is called a hidden buffer. The buffer contains text, but you can't see it. The argument of hide is another command. Hide makes that command behave as if the hidden option was set. You could also set this option yourself. The effect is that when any buffer is abandoned, it becomes hidden. Be careful. When you have hidden buffers with changes, don't exit Vim without making sure you've saved all buffers. Inactive buffers. When a buffer has been used once, Vim remembers some information about it. When it's not displayed in a window and it's not hidden, it's still in the buffer list. This is called an inactive buffer. So an overview, inactive, which appears in a window, text loaded. We have hidden, which is not in a window, but text is loaded. Or we have inactive, not in a window, no text loaded. 
The inactive buffers are remembered because Vim keeps information about them, like marks. And remembering the file name is useful too, so that you can see which files you've edited, and edit them again. Listing buffers. View the buffer list with this command, buffers. A command which does the same is not so obvious to list buffers, but is much shorter to type, colon ls. The output should look something like this. You have different buffers listed on different lines. Line 1 may look like 1 pound h help.txt line 62, line 2 with percent %a plus for user 21.txt line 1, and line 3 user toc.txt line 1. The first column contains the buffer number. You can use this to edit the buffer without having to type the name. See below. After the buffer name comes the flags, then the name of the file and the line number where the cursor was the last time. The flags that can appear are these from left to right. U, buffer is unlisted, percent for current buffer, pound for alternate buffer, A for buffer is loaded and displayed, H for buffer is loaded but hidden, equals for buffer is read only, dash for buffer is not modifiable, the modify option is off, or plus the buffer has been modified. <clears throat> Editing a buffer. You can edit a buffer by its number. That avoids having to type the file name, buffer2. But the only way to know the number is looking in the buffer list. You can use the name or part of it instead. So buffer help. Vim will find the best match for the name you type. If there's only one buffer that matches the name, it'll be used. In this case, help.txt. To open a buffer in a new window, do sbuffer3. This works with a name as well. Using the buffer list. You can move around in the buffer list with these commands. B next, go to the next buffer, B previous, go to the previous buffer, B first, go to the first buffer, and B last, go to the last buffer. To remove a buffer from the list, do B delete 3. Again, this also works with a name. If you delete a buffer that was active, so visible in a window, that window will be closed. If you delete the current buffer, the current window will be closed. If it's the last window, Vim will find another buffer to edit. You can't be editing nothing. Note. Even after removing the buffer with bdelete, Vim still remembers it. It's actually made unlisted. It no longer appears in the list from buffers. The buffers bang command will list unlist unlisted buffers. Yes, Vim can do the impossible. To really make Vim forget a buffer, use bwipe. Also see the buff listed options. Chapter 23 editing other files. This is chapter is about editing files that are not ordinary files. With Vim, you can edit files that are compressed. Some files need to be accessed over the internet. With some restrictions, binary files can be edited as well. Chapter 23, part one, DOS, Mac, and Unix files. Back in the early days, the old teletype machines used two characters to start a new line. One to move the carriage back to the first position, a carriage return, and another to move the paper up, which was a line feed. When computers came out, storage was expensive. Some people decided that they did not need two characters for end of line. The Unix people decided they would use new line, or NL, only for end of line. The Apple people standardized on carriage return, and the Microsoft Windows folks decided to keep the old carriage return new line. Um, you, we use new line for line feed in the help text. This means that if you try to move a file from one system to another, you can have line break problems. The Vim editor automatically recognizes the different file formats and handles things properly behind your back. The option file formats contains the various formats that will be tried when a new file is edited. The following command, for example, tells Vim to try Unix format first and MS-DOS format second. So set file formats equals Unix comma DOS. You will notice the format in the message you get when editing a file. You don't see anything if you edit a native file format. Thus, editing a Unix file in Unix won't result in a remark. But when you edit a DOS file, Vim will notify you of this. So it may say temp test and then in brackets DOS. For a Mac file, you would see Mac. The detected file format is stored in the file format option. To see which format you have, execute the following command. Set file format question mark. The three names that Vim uses are Unix for new line, DOS for carriage return new line, and Mac for carriage return. Using the Mac format, on Unix, new line is used to break a line. It's not unusual to have a carriage return character halfway in a line. Incidentally, this happens quite often in VI and Vim scripts. 
On the Macintosh, where carriage return is the line break character, it's possible to have a new line character halfway in a line. The result is that it's not possible to be 100% sure whether a file containing both carriage return and new line characters is a Mac or a Unix file. Therefore, Vim assumes that on Unix, you probably won't edit a Mac file and doesn't check for this type of file. To check for this format anyways, add Mac to file formats with set file formats plus equals Mac. Then Vim will take a guess at the file format. Watch out for situations where Vim guesses wrong. Overruling the format. If you use the good old VI and try to edit an MS-DOS format file, you'll find that each line ends with a caret M character, where caret M is caret return. The automatic detection avoids this. Suppose you want to edit the file that way? Then you need to overrule the format with edit plus plus ff equals unix file.txt. The plus plus string is an item that tells Vim that an option name follows, which overrules the default for this command. Plus plus ff is used for file format. You could also use plus plus ff equals Mac or plus plus ff equals DOS. This doesn't work for any option. Only plus plus ff and plus plus ank are currently supported. The full names, file format, and plus plus encoding also work. Conversion. You can use the file format option to convert from one file format to another. Suppose, for example, that you have an MS-DOS file named readme.txt and you want to convert to Unix format. Start by editing the MS-DOS format file, vim readme.txt. Unix will recognize this as a DOS format file. Now change the file format to Unix. Set file format equals Unix. Right. The file is written in Unix format. Files on the internet. Someone sends you an email message, which refers to a file by its URL. For example, you can find the information here, ftp colon slash slash ftp.vim.org slash pub slash vim slash readme. You could start a program to download the file, save it on your local disk, and then start vim to edit it. There's a much simpler way. Move the cursor to any character of the URL, and then use this command, gf. With a bit of luck, Vim will figure out which program to use for downloading the file, download it, and edit the copy. To open the file in a new window, use Control w f If something goes wrong, you will get an error message. It's possible that the URL is wrong, you don't have permission to read it, the network connection is down, etc. Unfortunately, it's hard to tell the cause of the error. You might want to try the manual way of downloading the file. Accessing file over the internet works with the NetRW plugin. Currently, URLs with these formats are recognized, FTP, RCP, SCP, and HTTP, which uses FTP, RCP, SCP, and WGIT, respectively. Vim doesn't do the communication itself. It relies on the mentioned programs to be available on your computer. On most Unix systems, FTP and RCP will be present. SCP and WGIT might need to be installed. Vim detects these URLs for each command that starts editing a new file, and also with edit and split, for example. Write commands also work, except for HTTP. For more information, and also about passwords, see help NetRW. Chapter 23, Part 3, Binary Files. You can edit binary files with Vim. Vim wasn't really made for this, thus there are a few restrictions. But you can read a file, change a character, and write it back, with the result that only that one character was changed and that file is identical otherwise. To make sure that Vim does not use its clever tricks in the wrong way, add the dash B argument when starting Vim. So Vim dash B data file. This sets the binary option. The effect of this is that unexpected side effects are turned off. For example, text width is set to zero to avoid formatting of lines, and files are always read in a Unix file format. Binary mode can be used to change a message in a program. Be careful not to insert or delete any characters. Could stop the program from working. Use R to enter replace mode. Many characters in the file will be unprintable. To see them in hex format, do set display equals u hex. Otherwise, the GA command can be used to see the value of the character under the cursor. The output, when the cursor is on escape, looks like a left angle bracket, caret, left bracket, and a right angle bracket, which is the escape code for escape, 27, hex 1b, and octal 033. There might not be many line breaks in the file. To get some overview, switch the wrap option off. Set no wrap. Byte position. To see on which byte you are in the file, use this command, g, control g. The output is verbose. 
Kyle, 916 of 916, line 277 of 330, word 1806 of 2058, and byte 10580 of 12206. The last two numbers are the byte position in the file and the total number of bytes. This takes into account how file format changes the number of bytes that a line break uses. To move to a specific byte in the file, you can use the GO command. For example, to move to byte 2345 or 2345, you can do 2345 GO. Using XXD, a real binary editor shows the text in two ways, as it is and in hex format. You can do this in Vim by first converting the file with the XXD program. This comes with Vim. First edit the file in binary mode, Vim B data file. Now convert the file to a hex dump with XXD. So colon percent bang XXD. The text will look like this, where it has the byte positions and then the characters, and then on the far right side, it will have the representation. You can now view and edit the text as you like. Vim treats the information as ordinary text. Changing the he hex does not cause the printable characters to be changed or the other way around. Finally, convert it back with percent bang XXD R. Only changes in the hex part are used. Changes in the printable text part on the right are ignored. See the manual page of XXD for more information. Chapter 23, part four, compressed files. This is easy. You can edit a compressed file just like any other file. The gzip plugin takes care of decompressing the file when you edit it and compressing it again when you write it. These compression methods are currently supported. .z for compress, .gz for gzip, and .bz2 for bzip2. Vim uses the mentioned programs to do the actual compression and decompression. You might need to install those programs first. Chapter 24, Inserting Quickly. When entering text, Vim offers various ways to reduce the number of keystrokes and avoid typing mistakes. Use insert mode completion to repeat previously typed words, abbreviate long words to short ones, and type characters that aren't on your keyboard. Chapter 24.1 making corrections. The backspace key was already mentioned, and it deletes the character just before the cursor. The delete key does the same for the character under or after the cursor. When you typed a whole word wrong, use control W. If you really messed up a line and want to start over, use control U to delete it. This keeps the text after the cursor and the indent. Only the text from the first non-blank line to the cursor is deleted. With the cursor on the F of fallen in the sentence, the horse had fallen to the in the next line, pressing control U takes the horse had fallen and just turns it to fallen to the. When you spot a mistake a few words back, you need to move the cursor there to correct it. For example, if you type the horse had fallen to the ground, but fallen was spelled with an O, with the cursor at the end, you could type this to correct it. Get out of insert mode, press 4B to move four words back, move on top of the O with an L, and replace with A so R A, and then restart insert mode with a capital A. That will put your cursor at the end of the line. Another way to do this might be control left, control left, control left, control left, right, delete, A, end. This uses special keys to move around while remaining in insert mode. This resembles what you would do in a modeless editor. It's easier to remember, but takes more time. You have to move your hand from the letters to the cursor keys and the end key is hard to press without looking at the keyboard. These special keys are most useful when writing a mapping that doesn't leave insert mode. The extra typing doesn't matter then. An overview of some of the keys that can be used in insert mode were control home to start at the, to the start of the file, page up, a whole screen full up, home to the start of a line, shift left, one word left, control left, one word left, shift right, which is one word right, control right, which is one word right, end to the end of the line, page down, a whole screen full down, and control end to the end of the file. Chapter 24, part two, showing matches. When you type a left or a right parenthesis, it would be nice to see which left parenthesis it matches. To make Vim do that, use this command, set show match. When you now type a text like left parenthesis, example, right parenthesis, as soon as you type the right parenthesis, Vim will briefly move the cursor to the matching left parenthesis, keep it there for a half second, and move back to where you were typing. In case there is no matching left parenthesis, Vim will beep. 
then you know that you might have forgotten the left parenthesis somewhere or typed a right parenthesis too many. The match will also be shown for brackets and for curly braces. You don't have to wait with typing the next character. As soon as Vim sees it, the cursor will move back and inserting and continue as before. You can change the time Vim waits with the match time option. For example, to make Vim wait one and a half seconds, do set match time equals 15. The time is specified in tenths of a second. Chapter 24, Part 3, Completion. Vim can automatically complete words on insertion. You type the first part of a word, press Ctrl P, and Vim guesses the rest. Suppose, for example, that you are creating a C program and want to type in the following. Total equals CH array 0 plus CH array 1 plus CH array 2. You start by entering the following. Total equals CH array 0 plus CH underscore. At this point, you tell Vim to complete the word using the command Ctrl P. Vim searches for a word that starts with what's in front of the cursor. In this case, it's ch underscore, which matches the word ch array. So typing control P gives you the following, total equals ch array zero plus ch array. After a little more typing, you get this, ending in a space, total ch array zero plus ch array one. If you now type control P, Vim will search again for a word that completes the word before the cursor. Since there's nothing in front of the cursor, it finds the first word backwards, which is ch array. Typing control P again gives you the next word that matches, in this case total. A third control P searches further back. If there's nothing else, it causes the editor to run out of words, so it returns to the original text, which is nothing. A fourth control P causes the editor to start over again with ch array. To search forward, use control N. Since the search wraps around the end of the file, Control N and Control P will find the same matches, but in a different sequence. Hint: Control N is the next match, and Control P is the previous match. The Vim editor goes through a lot of effort to find words to complete. By default, it searches the following places: current file, file in other windows, other loaded files, which would be hidden buffers, files which are not loaded, inactive buffers, tag files, and all files pound included by the current file. Options. You can customize the search order with the complete option. The ignore case option is used. When it's set, case differences are ignored when searching for matches. A special option is infer case. This is useful to find matches while ignoring case. Ignore case must be set, but still using the case of the word type so far. Thus, if you type capital F for four and Vim finds a match for fortunately, it will result in fortunately. Completing specific items. If you know what you're looking for, you can use these commands to complete with a certain type of item. Control X, Control F completes file names. Control X, Control L completes whole lines. Control X, Control D macro definitions, also in included files. Control X, Control I is the current and included files. Control X, Control T K completes words from a dictionary. Control X, Control T completes words from a thesaurus. Control X, Control right bracket is tags, and Control X, Control V is Vim command line. After each of them, Control N can be used to find the next match, and Control P to find the previous match. More information for each of these commands can be found here in help ins completion. Editor's note, you should read that because it's really good. Completing file names. Let's take Control X, Control F as an example. This will find file names. It scans the current directory for files and displays each one that matches the word in front of the user. For example, let's say you have a, the following files in the current directory, main.c, subcount.c, subdone.c, and subexit.c. Now enter insert mode and start typing. The exit code is in the file sub. At this point, you enter the command control x, control f. Vim now completes the current word, sub, by looking at the files in the current directory. The first match is subcount.c. This is not the one you want, so you match the next file by typing control N. This match is subdone.c. Typing control N again takes you to subexit.c. This results in the exit code is in the file subexit.c. If the file name starts with a slash on Unix or C colon backslash for MS Windows, you can find all the files in the file system. For example, type slash U and control X, control F. This will match slash user. This is on Unix.
the files found in slash user. If you now press control N, you go back to slash U. Instead, to accept the slash user and go one directory level deeper, you press control X, control F again. So now you would have the file is found in user slash x11r6. The result depends on what is found in your file system, of course. The matches are sorted alphabetically. Completing in source code. Source code files are well structured. That makes it possible to do completion in an intelligent way. In Vim, this is called omni-completion. In some other editors, it's called IntelliSense, but that's a trademark. The key to omni-completion is control X, control O. Obviously, the O stands for omni here, so that you can remember it easier. Let's use an example for editing C source. If you have struct foo star P, and then you write P with the arrow, the cursor is after the arrow. Now type control X, control O. Vim will offer you a list of alternatives, which are the items that struct foo contains. That is quite different from using control P, which would complete any word, while only the members of struct foo are valid here. For omni completion to work, you may need to have some setup. At least make sure file type plugins are enabled. Your vimrc should contain a line like this, file type plugin on or file type plugin indent on. For C code, you need to create a tags file and set the tags option. That's explained in FTC Omni. For other file types, you may need to do something similar. Look below help compil Omni file types. It only works for specific file types. Check the value of the Omni func option to find out if it would work. Chapter 24, part four, repeating an insert. If you press control A, the editor inserts the text you typed last time you were in insert mode. Assume, for example, that you have a file that begins with the following, file.h, and it has a comment for main program begins. You edit this file by inserting include at the beginning of the first line. So you say include file.h. You go down a line on the next line using J, and you start <coughs> to insert a new line. So you type I control A. The result is as follows, pound include, and then nothing. The include was inserted because it Control A inserts the text of the previous insert. Now you type quote main.h enter to finish the line. So now you have two lines at the start include file.h and include main.h. The control at command does a control A and then exit inserts mode. That's a quick way of doing exactly the same insertion again. Chapter 24, part 5 copying from another line. The control Y command inserts a character above the cursor. This is useful when you are duplicating a previous line. For example, you have this line above of C code. B array uh, sub I pointer to S next is A array I points to S next. Now you need to type the same line, but with S prev instead of S next. Start the new line and press control Y 14 times until you're at the end of next. Now you type prev and continue pressing control Y until the following next. Now type prev to finish it off. The control E commands acts like control Y, except it inserts the character below the cursor. Chapter 24, part six, inserting a register. The command control R register inserts the context of the register. This is useful to avoid having to type a very long word. For example, you need to type this R equals very long function called with A plus very long function B plus very long function C. The function name is defined in a very in a different file. Edit that file and move the cursor on top of the function name there and yank it to register V. So double quote V for register V, yank inner word, yank inner word. Now edit the file where the new line is to be inserted and type the first letters R equals and then do control R V to insert the very long function name. You continue to type the characters in between the function name and use control RV two times more. You could have done the same with completion. Using a register is useful when there are many words that start with the same characters. If the register contains characters such as backspace or other special characters, they are interpreted as if they had been typed from the keyboard. If you do not want this to happen, as in you really want the backspace to be inserted into the text, use the command control R, control R, register. Chapter 24, part seven, abbreviations. An abbreviation is a short word that takes the place of a long one. For example, ad stands for advertisement. 
Vim enables you to type an abbreviation and then will automatically expand it for you. To tell Vim to expand ad into advertisement every time you insert it, use the following command. I abbrev ad advertisement. Now when you type ad, the whole word advertisement will be inserted into the text. This is triggered by typing a character that can't be part of a word, for example, a space. So what is entered and then what you see. So if you say, I saw the A, what you'll see is I saw the A. If you say, I saw the ad with no space, it will still say I saw the ad. But once you do I saw the ad and type a space, it will replace it with I saw the advertisement. The expansion doesn't happen when typing just ad. That allows you to type a word like add ADD, which will not get expanded. Only whole words are checked for abbreviations. It's possible to define an abbreviation that results in multiple words. For example, to define JB as Jack Benny, use the following command. I abbrev JB Jack Benny. As a programmer, I use two rather unusual abbreviations. I abbrev pound B is slash followed by many stars and I abbrev pound E is a space and many stars followed by a slash. These are used for creating boxed comments. The comment starts with pound B, which draws the top line. I then type the comment text and use pound E to draw the bottom line. Notice the first pound E abbreviation begins with a space. In other words, the first two characters are space star. Usually Vim ignores spaces between the abbreviations and the expansion. To avoid this problem, I spell space as seven characters, angle, S-P-A-C, angle bracket. Note, I abbrev is a long word to type. I-A-B works just as well. That's abbreviating the abbreviate command. Fixing typing mistakes. It's very common to make the same typing mistake every time. For example, typing T-E-H instead of T-H-E. You can fix this with an abbreviation. Abbreviate T-E-H, T-H-E. You can add a whole list of these. Add one each time you discover a common mistake. <clears throat> Listing abbreviations. The colon abbreviate command lists the abbreviations. The I in the first column indicates insert mode. These abbreviations are only active in insert mode. Although other possible characters are C for command line mode or bang for both insert and command line mode. Since abbreviations are not often useful in command line mode, you still mostly use the I abbrev command. That avoids, for example, that add gets expanded when typing a command like edit ad. Deleting abbreviations. To get rid of an abbreviation, use the unabbreviate command. Suppose you have the following abbreviation, abbreviate at f fresh. You can now remove it using this command, unabbreviate at f. While you type this, you will notice that f at f is expanded to fresh. Don't worry about this. Vim understands it anyways, except when you have an abbreviation for fresh, but that's very unlikely. To remove all the abbreviations, type ab clear. Unabbreviate and ab clear also come in variants for insert mode and command line mode, respectively. Remapping abbreviations. There is one thing to watch out for when defining an abbreviation. The resulting string should not be mapped. For example, abbreviate at a adder and imap dd disk dash door. When you now type at a, you will get a disk dorer. That's not what you want. To avoid this, use the no abbrev command. It does the same as abbreviate, but avoids that the resulting string is used for mapping. So no reabbrev at a adder. Fortunately, it's unlikely that the result of an abbreviation is mapped. Chapter 24, part eight. Entering special characters. The control V command is used to insert the next character literally. In other words, any special meaning the character has, it will be ignored. For example, control V escape inserts an escape character. Thus, you don't leave insert mode. Don't type the space after control V. It's only there to make it easier to read. Note, on MS Windows, control V is used to paste text. Use control Q instead of control V. On Unix, on the other hand, control Q does not work on some terminals because it has a special meaning. You can also use the command control V digits to insert a character with the decimal number digits. 
For example, the character number one to seven is the delete character, but not necessarily the delete key. To insert del type control V 127. You can enter characters up to 255 this way. When you type fewer than two digits, a non-digit will terminate the command. To avoid the need of typing a non-digit, prepend one or more zeros to make three digits. All the next commands insert a tab, then a dot. Control V9 dot, Control V09 dot, or Control V009 dot. To enter a character in hex, use the X after Control V. Control V X 7 F. <clears throat> this also goes up to character 255. You can use an O to type a character as an octal number, and two more methods allow you to type up to a 16 bit and a 32 bit number. For example, a Unicode character. Control V 0123. Control V U 1234 or Control V capital U 1234567 Chapter 24.9 Digraphs <clears throat> Some characters are not on the keyboard. For example, the copyright character. To type these characters in Vim, you use digraphs, where two characters represent one. To enter a copyright, for example, you press these keys. Control K, capital C O. To find out what digraphs are available, use the following command. Colon digraphs. Vim will display the digraph table. Here are three lines of it. It might have AC with a tilde underscore 159NS and a bar 160, etc. This shows, for example, that the digraph you get by typing control K capital PD is the character, whatever that is. This is the character number 163, decimal. PD is short for pound. Most digraphs are selected to give you a hint about the character they will produce. If you look through the list, you will understand the logic. You can exchange the first and second character if there is no digraph for the combination. Thus, control K, lowercase d, capital P also works. Since there is no digraph for DP, Vim will also search for a PD. The digraphs depend on the character set that Vim assumes you are using. Always use digraphs to find out which digraphs are currently available. <clears throat> you can also define your own digraphs. For example, digraph A double quote could be an A umlaut. This defines the control K A double quotes inserts an A umlaut character. You can also specify the character with a decimal number. This defines the same digraph. Digraph A double quote 228. More information about digraphs, see help digraphs. Another way to insert special characters with the key map. More about that in chapter 45, part 5. Chapter 24, part 10, normal mode commands. Insert mode offers a limited number of commands. In normal mode, you have many more. When you want to use one, you usually leave insert mode with escape, execute the normal mode command, and re-enter the insert mode with I or A. There's a quicker way. With control O command, you can execute any normal mode command from insert mode. For example, to delete from the cursor to the end of the line, you can do control O capital D. You can execute only one normal mode command this way, but you can specify a register or account. A more complicated example would be Control O, double quotes G, 3DW, which deletes up to the third word into register G. Chapter 25 Editing Formatted Text. Text hardly ever comes in one sentence per line. This chapter is about breaking sentences to make them fit on a page and other formatting. Vim also has useful features for editing single line paragraphs and tables. Chapter 25, Part 1 Breaking Lines Vim has a number of functions that make dealing with text easier. By default, the editor does not perform automatic line breaks. In other words, you have to press enter by yourself. This is useful when you are writing programs where you want to decide where the line ends. It's not so good when you're creating documentation and want the text to be at most 70 characters wide. If you set the text with option, Vim automatically inserts line breaks. Suppose, for example, that you want a very narrow column of only 30 characters. You need to execute the following command. Set text width equals 30. Now you start typing. I taught programming for a w and at the WHI is where you hit character 30. If you type L next, this makes the long line long. If you type L next, this makes the line longer than the 30 character limit. When Vim sees this, it inserts a line break and you get the following. I taught programming for A, and then a new line, 
W-H-I-L. Continuing on, you can type the rest of the paragraph. I taught programming for a new line while one time I was stopped new line by the Fort Worth police comma new line because my homework was too new line hard. True story. You do not have to type the new lines. Vim puts them in automatically. Note, the wrap option makes Vim display lines with a line break, but this doesn't insert a line break in the file. Reformatting. The Vim editor is not a word processor. In a word processor, if you delete something at the beginning of the paragraph, the line breaks are reworked. In Vim, they are not. So if you delete the word programming from the first line, all you get is a short line, I taught for A. This does not look good. To get the paragraph into shape, you use the GQ operator. Let's first use this with a visual selection. Starting from the first line, type V4J to get your selection and GQ to do the operation. The result is that we now have I taught for a while, period, one, and then a new line instead of a short line to start. Note, there is a way to do auto automatic formatting for specific types of text layouts. See, help auto format. Since GQ is an operator, you can use one of three ways to select the text it works on, with visual mode, with a movement, and with a text object. The example above could have been done with GQ4J. That's less typing, but you have to know the line count. A more useful motion command is right curly brace. This moves to the end of a paragraph. Thus GQ, right curly brace, formats from the cursor to the end of the current paragraph. A very useful text object to use with GQ is the paragraph. Try this, GQAP. AP stands for A Paragraph. This formats the text of one paragraph, which is separated by empty lines, also the part before the cursor. If you have your paragraph separated by empty lines, you can format the whole file by typing GG to go to the top, first line, GQ capital G to format until the last line. Warning, if your paragraphs are not properly separated, they will be joined together. A common mistake is to have a line with a space or tab. That's a blank line, but not an empty line. Vim is able to format more than just plain text. See help FO table for how to change this. See the join spaces option to change the number of spaces used after a full stop. It is possible to use an external program for formatting. This is useful if your text can't be properly formatted with Vim's built-in command. See the format PRG option. Chapter 25, part two, aligning text. To center a range of lines, use the following command. Colon with an optional range, center, and some width. Range is the usual command line range. Width is an optional line width to use for centering. If width is not specified, it defaults to the value of text width. And if text width is zero, the default is 80. So for example, one comma five center 40 results in centering all the lines individually one through five to 40 characters wide similarly the right command right justifies the text so one comma five right 37 will push all of the text to the right and align it to the right and there's also the left alignment command find which is left and margin unlike center and right however the argument to left is not the length of the line Instead, it's the left margin. If it's omitted, then the text will be put against the left side of the screen. Using a zero margin would do the same. If it's five, the text will be indented five spaces. For example, use these commands, one left five and two comma five left. This results in the following, where the first line of the paragraph has five spaces of indent and the rest have none. Justifying text. Vim has no built-in way of justifying text. However, there is a neat macro package that does the job. To use this package, execute the following command, pack add justify, or put this line in your vimrc, pack add bang justify. This vim script file defines a new visual command underscore j. To justify a block of text, highlight the text in visual mode and then execute underscore j. Look in the file for more explanations. To go there, do gf on this name, vim runtime pack dist opt justify plugin justify.vim. An alternative is to filter the text through an external program. So for example, percent bang format. Chapter 25, part three. Indents can be used to make text stand out from the rest. The example text in this manual, for example, are indented by eight spaces or a tab. You would normally enter this by typing a tab at the start of each line. Take this text, 
the first line, the second line. This is entered by typing a tab, some text, enter, tab, and more text. The auto indent option inserts indents automatically. Set auto indent. When a new line is started, it gets the same indent as the previous line. In the above example, the tab after the enter is not needed anymore. Increasing indent. To increase the amount of indent in a line, use the right angle bracket operator. Often this is used as right angle bracket, right angle bracket, which adds indent to the current line. The amount of indent added is specified with the shift width option. The default value is 8. To make right angle bracket, right angle bracket insert 4 spaces worth of indent, for example, type set shift width equals 4. When used on the second line of the example text, this is what you get. The first line, and then it's now indented, and the second line. 4, right angle bracket, right angle bracket, will increase the indent of 4 lines. Tab stop. If you want to make indents a multiple of 4, you set shift width to 4. But, when pressing a tab, you still get 8 spaces worth of indent. To change this, set the soft tab stop option. So set soft tab stop equals 4. This will make the tab key insert 4 spaces worth of indent. If there are already 4 spaces, a tab character is used, saving 7 characters in the file. If you always want spaces and no tab characters, set the expand tab option. Note. You could set the tab stop option to 4. However, if you edit the file another time with tab stop set to the default value of 8, it will look wrong. In other programs and when printing the indent will also be wrong. Therefore, it's recommended to keep tab stop at 8 all the time. That's the standard value everywhere. Changing tabs. You edit a file which has been written with a tab stop of 3. In Vim, it looks ugly because it uses the normal tab stop value of 8. You can fix this by setting tab stop to 3, but you have to do this every time you edit this file. Vim can change the use of tab stops in your file. First, set tab stop to make the indents look good, and then use the retab command. So set tab stop equals 3, and then use the command retab 8. The retab command will change tab stop to 8 while changing the text such that it looks the same. If changes spans of white space into tabs and spaces for this, you can now write the file. Next time you edit, the indents will be right without setting an option. Warning. When using retab on a program, it may change white space inside a string constant. Therefore, it's a good habit to use slash t instead of a real tab. Chapter 25, part 4. Dealing with long lines. Sometimes you will be editing a file that's wider than the number of columns in the window. When that occurs, Vim wraps the line so that everything fits on the screen. If you switch the wrap, wrap option off, each line in the file shows up as one line on the screen. Then the ends of the long lines disappear off the screen to the right. When you move the cursor to a character that can't be seen, Vim will scroll the text to show it. This is like moving a viewport over the text in a horizontal direction. By default, Vim does not display a horizontal scroll bar in the GUI. If you want to enable one, set the following command. Set GUI options plus equals B. One horizontal scroll bar will appear at the bottom of the Vim window. If you don't have a scroll bar or don't want to use it, use these commands to scroll the text. The cursor will stay in the same place, but it's moved back into the visible text if necessary. ZH scrolls to the right. You can use 4ZH to scroll four characters to the right. Z capital H to scroll half a window width right. Z E scroll right to put the cursor at the end. Z L for scroll left. 4 Z L to scroll four characters left. Z capital L to scroll half a window left. Or Z S scroll left to put the cursor at the start. Let's attempt to show this with one line of text. The cursor is at the end of the W of which, and the current window is rendered basically in the middle of this sentence. So what we have is some long text, part of which is visible in the window, where we're normally looking at the beginning. If we do ZE, we'll be able to see more of the sentence to the left, something like some long text. If we do Z capital H, we'll shift some distance to the left as well. For ZH, we'll only move our, move our window four spots. ZH will only move one. ZL will move us in the opposite direction. For ZL, we'll move it so we can see further to the right and Z capital L will move us even further to the right. Moving with wrap off. 
When wrap is off and the text is scrolled horizontally, you can use the following commands to move the cursor to a character you can see. Thus text left and right of the window is ignored. These never cause the text to scroll. G0, the first visible character in this line. G caret, the first non-blank visible character in this line. GM to the middle of the screen. G capital N to the middle of the text on the screen. And G dollar sign to the last visible character on this line. Breaking at words. When preparing text for use by another program, you might have to make paragraphs without a line break. A disadvantage of using no wrap is that you can't see the whole sentence you're working on. And when wrap is on, words are broken halfway, which makes them hard to read. A good solution for adding this kind of paragraph is setting the line break option. Vim then breaks lines at an appropriate place when displaying the line. The text in the file remains unchanged. Without line break, the text might look like this, where words like bank have B on one line and ank on the other. But after we do set line break, it looks like this, where bank now moves completely to the next line. Some related options would be break at, which specifies the characters where a break can be inserted, and show break, which specifies a string to show at the start of a broken line. Set text width to zero to avoid a paragraph to be split. Moving by visible lines. The J and K commands move to the next and previous lines. When used on a long line, this means moving a lot of screen lines at once. To move only one screen line, use the GJ and GK commands. When a line doesn't wrap, they do the same as J and K. When the line does wrap, they move to a character displayed one line below or above. You might like to use these mappings, which bind these movement commands to the cursor keys. Map up, GK, or map down, G, G, J. You can also map J and K to do those as well, if you like. Turning a paragraph into one line. If you want to import text into a program like Microsoft Word, each paragraph should be a single line. If your paragraphs are currently separated with empty lines, this is how you can turn each paragraph into a single line. G for global. What we're going to look for is some character, so we'll do dot. What we're going to replace dots with is comma, and then we're going to find all the ones that are empty with caret and dollar sign. We'll get there in a second, and then we'll run join. So this looks complicated, but let's break it into pieces. G slash dot slash is a global command that finds all lines that contain at least one character. Now we're going to do a range, which is a range starting from the current line, that's the comma, to the next time there is an empty line. And then the join command joins the range of lines together into one line. Starting with this text containing eight lines broken at column 30, where we have something like a letter generation program for a bank, and then we have an empty line and to their richest 1,000 customers, we'll end up with only two lines with no empty spaces between them. Note that this doesn't work when the separating line is blank but not empty, when it contains spaces and or tabs. The command does work this command does work with Blake lines, where the only thing that's been changed is instead of dot, we can use slash s to look for white space. This still requires a blank or empty line at the start of the file for the last paragraph to be joined. Chapter 25, part 5, Editing Tables. Suppose you're editing a table with four columns. You have a nice table, test 1, test 2, test 3. And you have line 1 is input A and 0.534, and input B is 0.913. You need to enter numbers in the third column. You could move to the second line, use capital A, and enter a lot of spaces and type the text. For this kind of editing, there is a special option. Set virtual edit equals all. Now you can move the cursor to positions where there isn't any text. This is called virtual space. Editing a, editing a table is a lot easier this way. Move the cursor by searching for the header of the last column, test 3. Now press J, and you are right where you can enter the value for input A. Typing 0 0.693 results in that showing up in the test 3 column, not in the text immediately after 0 0.534. Vim has automatically filled the gap in front of the new text for you. Now, to enter the next field in this column, use capital B J, and B, capital B, moves back to the start of a white space separated word. Then J moves to the place where the next field can be entered. You can move the cursor anywhere in the display, also beyond the end of a line, but Vim will not insert spaces there until you insert a character in that position. Copying a column. 
you want to add a column, which should be a copy of the third column and placed before the test one column. Do this in seven steps. Move the cursor to the left upper corner of this column, for example, slash test three. Press control V to start blockwise visual mode. Move the cursor down two lines with 2J. You are now in virtual space, the input B line of the test three column. Move the cursor right to include the whole column in the selection, plus the space that you want between the columns. 9L should do it. Yank the selected rectangle with Y. Move the cursor to test one where the new column must be placed and then press capital P. The new result is that you'll have a test three with those lines inserted before the column for test one. Notice that the whole test one column has shifted right and also the line where test three column didn't have text. To go back to non-virtual cursor movements, you do set virtual edit equals with nothing on the other side. <clears throat> Virtual replace mode. The disadvantage of using virtual edit is that it feels different. You can't recognize tabs or spaces beyond the end of the line when moving the cursor around. Another method can be used. Virtual replace mode. Suppose you have a line in a table that contains both tabs and other characters. Use Rx on the first tab. The layout's messed up. To avoid that, use the GR command. What happens is the GR command makes sure the new characters take the right amount of screen space. Extra spaces or tabs are inserted to fill the gap. Thus what actually happens is that a tab is replaced by X and then the blanks are added to make the text appear after it keeps it placed. In this case, a tab is inserted. When you need to replace more than one character, you can use the R command to go to replace mode. This messes up the layout and replaces the wrong characters when you have a tab. The GR command uses virtual replace mode. This preserves the layout. Chapter 26. <clears throat> Sorry. It is kind of green, yeah. Chapter 26. Repeating. An editing task is hardly ever unstructured. A change often needs to be made several times. In this chapter, a number of useful ways to repeat a change will be explained. Chapter 26, part one, repeating with visual mode. Visual mode is very handy for making a change in any sequence of lines. You can see the highlighted text, thus you can check if the correct lines are changed. But making the selection takes some typing. The GV command selects the same area again. This allows you to do another operation on the same text. Suppose you have some lines where you want to change 2001 to 2002 and 2000 to 2001. The financial results from 2001 are better than 2000. The income increased by 50% even though 2001 had more rain than 2000. And then it has a table with income and 2000, 2001. First, change 2000 to 2002. Select the lines in visual mode and use S slash 2001 slash 2002 G. Now use the GV to reselect the same text. It doesn't matter where the cursor is. Then use colon S slash 2000 slash 2001 slash G to make the second change. Obviously, you can repeat this change several times. Chapter 26, part two, add and subtract. When repeating the change of one number into another, you often have a fixed offset. In the example above, one was added to each year. Instead of typing a substitute command for each year that appears, the control A command can be used. Using the same text above, search for a year, 19, and then it has a range for 0 to 9, and a 0 to 9, or, which is a backslash bar, 2000, and then 0 to 9, 0 to 9. Now press Control A. The year will be increased by 1. Use N to find the next year and press dot to repeat the Control A. A is a, or dot is a bit quicker to type. Repeat N and dot for all the years that appear. Adding more than one can be done by prepending the number to control A. Suppose we have this list, one, item four, two, item five, three, item six. Move the cursor to one and type three, control A. The one will change to four. Again, you can use dot to repeat this on the other numbers. Control X command does subtraction in a similar way. The behavior in control A and control X depends on the value of NR formats. For example, if you use set NR formats equals octal, 
Pressing control A over 007 will increment to 010 because 007 will be identified as an octal number. Chapter 26, part three, making a change in many files. Suppose you have a variable called x underscore cnt and you want to change it to x counter. This variable is used in several of your C files. You need to change it in all files. This is how you do it. Put all the relevant files in the argument list. args star.c. This finds all C files and edits the first one. Now you can perform a substitution command on all those files. arg do percent s slash, and then we use word boundary x underscore cnt word boundary slash x underscore counter slash ge, and then bar update. The arg do command takes an argument that is another command. That command will be executed on all files in the argument list. The percent %s substitute command that follows works on all lines. It finds the words x underscore cnt with our word boundaried x cnt. The flags for the substitute command include g to replace all occurrences of x underscore cnt in the same line. The e flag is used to avoid an error message when x cnt does not appear in the file. Otherwise, argdo would abort on the first file where x cnt was not found. The bar separates two commands. The following update commands writes the file only if it was changed. If no xcnt was changed to x counter, nothing happens. There is also the colon windu command, which executes its arguments in all windows, and buffdo executes its argument on all buffers. Be careful with this because you might have more files in the buffer list than you think. Check this with buffers or ls. Chapter 26, part 4, using vim from a shell script. Suppose you have a lot of files in which you need to change the string dash person dash to Jones and then print it. How do you do that? One way is to do a lot of typing. The other way is to write a shell script to do that work. The Vim editor does a superb job as a screen oriented editor when using normal mode commands. For batch processing, however, normal mode commands do not result in clear commented command files. So here you will use X mode instead. This mode gives you a nice command line interface that makes it easy to put into a batch file. X command is just another name for command line command. The X code commands you are need. The X mode commands you need are as follows: percent s slash dash person dash slash Jones slash g, write temp file and quit. You put these commands in the file change.vim. Now to run the editor in batch mode, use this shell script for file in star.txt semicolon do, and then we're going to run a command vim dash e dash s dollar sign file, and we're going to pipe that into change.vim. And then we're going to lpr dash r temp file done. The for done loop is a shell construct to repeat the two lines in between, while the file variable is set to a different file name each time. The second line runs the vim editor in x mode, which is the dash e argument on the file, file and reads commands from the file change vim. The dash s argument tells vim to operate in silent mode. In other words, do not keep outputting the prompt or any other prompt for that matter. The lpr r temp file command prints the resulting temp file and deletes it. That's what the dash r argument does. Reading from standard in. Vim can read text on standard input. Since the normal way is to read commands there, you must tell vim to read text instead. This is done by passing the dash argument in place of the file. For example, ls bar vim dash. This allows you to edit the output of the ls command without saving the text in a file. If you, if you use the standard input to read text from, you can use the dash s argument to provide a script. Producer bar vim dash s change dot vim dash. Normal mode scripts. If you really want to use normal mode commands in a script, you can use it like this. vim dash s script file dot txt. Note, this is a lowercase s. Dash s has a different meaning when it's used without dash e. Here it means to source the script as normal mode commands. When used with dash e, it means to be silent and doesn't use the next argument as a file name. The commands in script are executed like you typed them. Don't forget that a line break is interpreted as pressing enter. In normal mode, that moves the cursor to the next line. To create the script, you can edit the script file and type the commands. You need to imagine what the result would be, which can be a bit difficult. Another way is to record the commands while you perform them manually. This is how you do that vim-w script file.txt. 
all typed keys will be written to script. If you make a small mistake, you can just continue and remember to edit the script later. The dash w argument appends to an existing script. That's good when you want to record the script bit by bit. If you want to start from scratch and start all over, use the dash capital W argument. It overwrites any existing files. Chapter 27, Search Commands and Patterns. In Chapter 3, a few simple search patterns were mentioned in Chapter 3, Part 9. Vim can do much more complex searches. This chapter explains the most often used one. A detailed specification can be found in Help Pattern. Chapter 27, Part 1, Ignoring Case. By default, Vim searches are case sensitive. Therefore, all lowercase include, all caps include, and include with a capital I are three different words and a search will match only one of them. Now, switch on the ignore case option. Set ignore case. Search for include again and now it will match all the different forms of include. Set the HL search option to quickly see where a pattern matches. You can switch this off again with set no ignore case. But let's keep it set and search for caps include. It will match exactly the same text as include did. Now set the smart case option with set ignore case smart case. If you have a pattern with at least one uppercase letter, the search becomes case sensitive. The idea is that you didn't have to type that uppercase character, so you must have done it because you wanted the case to match. Now that's smart. With these two words, you can find the following word matches. With all lowercase, you'll match all the different combinations. With capital W, you'll only match the first letter ones where have. With a capital W at the beginning of word, you'll match only things that also have the capital W word. Case in one pattern. If you want to ignore case for one specific pattern, you can do this by prepending the backslash C string. Using backslash capital C will make the pattern to match case. This overrules ignore case and smart case options. When backslash C or backslash capital C is used, their value does not matter. So if you use the pattern backslash capital C word, it will only match lowercase word and similar for all other ways that you can imagine here. A big advantage of using backslash C and backslash capital C is that it sticks with the pattern. Thus, if you repeat a pattern from the search history, the same thing will happen, no matter if ignore case or smart case has changed. Note, the use of backslash items in search patterns depends on the magic option. In this chapter, we will assume magic is on, because that's the standard and recommended setting. If you would change magic, many search patterns would suddenly become invalid. Note, if your search takes much longer than you expected, you can interrupt it with Control C on Unix and Control Break on MS Windows. Chapter 27, Part 2 Wrapping Around the File End. By default, a forward search starts searching for the given string at the current cursor location. It then proceeds to the end of the file. If it has not found the string by that time, it starts from the beginning of the file and searches from the start of the file to the cursor location. Keep in mind that when repeating the end command to search for the next match, you will eventually get back to the first match. If you don't notice this, you keep searching forever. To give you a hint, Vim displays this message. Search hit bottom, continuing at top. If you use the question mark command to search in the other direction, you get this message. Search hit top, continuing at bottom. Still, you don't know where you... Still, you don't know when you are back at the first match. One way to see this is by switching on the ruler option with set ruler. Vim will display the cursor position in the lower right hand corner of the window in the status line if there is one, and it looks like this. 101, 29, and 84%. The first number is the line number of the cursor. Remember the line number where you started so that you can check if you pass this position again. Not wrapping. To turn off search wrapping, use the following command, set no wrap scan. Now when the search hits the end of the file, an error message displays, E385, search hit bottom without match for forever. Thus, you can find all matches by going to the start of the file with GG and keep searching until you see this message. If you search in the other direction using question mark, you get E384, search hit top without match for forever. Chapter 27, part three, offsets. By default, the search command leaves the cursor position on the beginning of the pattern. You can tell Vim to leave it some other place by specifying an offset. For the forward search command, slash, the offset is specified by appending a slash and the offset, slash, default, slash, two. This command searches for the pattern, default, and then moves to the beginning of the second line past the pattern. Using this command on the paragraph above, Vim finds the word default on the first line, 
Then the cursor is moved two lines and lands on an offset. If the offset is a simple number, the cursor will be placed at the beginning of the line that many, that many lines from the match. The offset number can be positive or negative. If it's positive, the cursor moves down that many lines. If negative, it moves up. Character offsets. The E offset indicates an offset from the end of the match and moves the cursor onto the last character of the match. The command slash const slash E puts the cursor on the T of const. From that position, adding a number moves forward that many characters. This command moves the character to just one after the match. Slash const slash E plus one. A positive number moves the cursor to the right and a negative number moves it to the left. For example, const slash E minus one moves the cursor to the S of const. If the offset begins with B, the cursor moves to the beginning of the pattern. That's not very useful since leaving out the B does the same thing. It does get useful when a number is added or subtracted. The cursor then goes forward or backwards that many characters. For example, slash const slash B plus two moves the cursor to the beginning of the match and then two characters to the right. Thus, it lands on the N. Repeating. To repeat searching for the previously used search pattern, but with a different offset, leave out the pattern, slash that, and then slash slash E. That's equal to slash that slash E. To repeat with the same offset, just slash. And N does the same thing. To repeat while removing a previously used offset, use slash slash. Searching backwards. The question mark command uses offsets in the same way, but you must use question to separate the offset from the pattern instead of slash. Question mark const question E minus two. The B and E keep their meaning. They don't change direction with the use of question mark. Start position. When starting a search, it normally starts at the cursor position. When you specify a line offset, this can cause trouble. For example, slash const slash minus two. This finds the next word const and then moves two lines up. If you use n to search again, then would start at the current position and find the same const match, thus using the same offset again. And you would be right where you started. You would be stuck. It could be worse. Can suppose there is another match with const in the next two lines. Then repeating the forward search would find this match and move two lines up. Thus, you would actually move the cursor back. When you specify a character offset, Vim will compensate for this. Thus, the search starts a few characters forward or backward so that the same match isn't found again. Chapter 27, Part 4. Matching Multiple Items. The star item specifies that the item before it can match any number of items. Thus, slash a star matches a, 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 etc., but also the empty string, because zero times is included. The star only applies to the item directly before it. Thus, a, b star matches a, a, b, a, b, b, and a, b, b, b. To match a whole string multiple times, it must be grouped into one item. This is done by putting backslash, parenth, before it and a backslash right paren after. Thus this command backslash paren ab backslash right paren star matches ab, ababab, ababab, etc. and also an empty string. To avoid matching the empty string, use backslash plus. This makes the previous item match one or more items. So ab backslash plus matches ab, abb, abbb, etc. It does not match a when no b follows. To match an optional item, use backslash equals. For example, for folders backslash equals matches folder and folders. Specific counts. <clears throat> to match a specific number of items, use the form backslash and then a curly n comma m curly. N and m are numbers. The item before it will be matched n to m times inclusive. For example, ab backslash three to five matches abbb and a, B, 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 and A, B, 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 B. When N is omitted, it defaults to zero. When M is, ex when M is omitted, it defaults to infinity. When comma N is omitted, it matches exactly N times. So for example, in the pattern backslash curly, comma four curly, that matches zero to four times. If we have the same range with three comma, then we have three, four, five to infinity. If we have zero to one, that's zero to one items. Zero comma is zero or more, which is the same as star. One comma is one or more, which is plus. Or if we have three, then it can match only three. Matching as little as possible. 
The item so far match as many characters as they can find. To match as few as possible, use slash curly negative n to m. It works the same as n to m, except that the minimal amount possible is used. So for example, ab slash negative one to three will match ab in abbb. Actually, it'll never match more than one ab because there's no reason to match more. It requires something else to force it to match more than the lower limit. The same rules apply to removing n and m. It's even possible to remove both of the numbers, resulting in just a curly dash curly. This matches the item before it zero or more times, as few as possible. The item by itself always matches zero times, and it's useful when combined with something else. For example, backslash a, or slash a dot and then backslash curly dash curly b, this matches axb in axbxb. If this pattern had been used a dot star b, it would try to match as many characters as possible with dot star, and thus it would match axbxb as a whole. Chapter 27, part five, alternatives. The or operator in a pattern is backslash bar. For example, slash foo backslash bar bar bar. This matches foo or bar. More, alter more alternatives can be concatenated. One backslash bar, two backslash bar, three. Matches one, two, and three. To match multiple times, the whole thing must be placed inside of a grouping of left parent, right parent. This matches foo, foo bar, bar foo, foo bar, etc. Another example is slash end group of if bar while backslash bar for end of group. This matches end if, end while, and end for. A related item is backslash ampersand. This requires that both alternatives match in the same place. The forever resulting match uses the last alternative. For example, forever backslash ampersand this matches for in forever. It will not match for tween, for example. Chapter 27.6, character ranges. To match A, B, or C, you could use A or B or C. When you want to match all letters A to Z, this gets very long. There's a shorter method. Left bracket A dash Z right bracket. The left bracket, right bracket construct matches a single character. Inside, you specify which characters to match. You can include a list of characters like this. Left bracket, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F, right bracket. This will match any of the characters included. For consecutive characters, you can specify the range. So 0 to 3 stands for 0, 1, 2, 3, and W dash Z stands for W, X, Y, Z. Thus, the same command above can be shortened to 0 dash 9, A dash F. To match the dash character itself, make it the first or last one in the range. These special characters are accepted to make it easier to use them inside of a range, and they can usually be used anywhere in the search pattern. Backslash E for escape, backslash T for tab, backslash R for carriage return, backslash B for backspace. There are a few more special cases in the bracket ranges. C slash bracket for the whole story. Complemented range. To avoid matching a specific character, use the caret at the start of a range. The brackets item that matches everything but the characters included. So for example, a double quote with a bracket caret double quote end of bracket star is going to match a double quote at the beginning and then it will look for bracket caret quote bracket which just means any character that is not a double quote star means as many as possible and then a double quote again so this will match a double quote anything inside and then a double quote again predefined ranges a number of ranges are used very often Vim provides a shortcut for these. For example, backslash A finds alphabetic characters. This is equal to using slash bracket A to Z lowercase capital A to Z right bracket. Here are a few more of these. We have slash D, which is digit, slash capital D for non-digit, slash X for hex digit, slash capital X for non-hex digit, slash S for white space, slash capital S for non-white space characters, slash L for lowercase alpha, slash capital L for non-lowercase alpha, slash U for uppercase alpha, and slash capital U for non-uppercase alpha.
No, these predefined ranges work a lot faster than the character range it stands for. These items cannot be used inside bracket. Thus, slash D slash L does not work to match a digit or a lowercase alpha. Use a group of slash D or slash L instead. C help slash backslash S for the whole list of these ranges. Chapter 27, part seven, character classes. The character range matches a fixed set of characters. A character class is similar, but with an essential difference. The set of characters can be redefined without changing the search pattern. For example, search for this pattern, slash, backslash F, slash, plus. The backslash F stands for file name characters. Thus, this matches a sequence of characters that can be a file name. Which characters can be part of a file name depends on the system you are using. On MS Windows, the backslash is included, but on Unix it is not. This is specified with the isFname option. The default value for Unix is isFname equals at 48 to 47 slash dot dash underscore plus comma pound dollar sign percent tilde and equals. For other systems, the default value is different. Thus, you can make a search pattern with slash f to match a file name, and it will automatically adjust to the system you're using it on. Note, actually Unix allows just about any character in a file name, including whitespace. Including these characters in isfname would be theoretically correct, but it would make it impossible to find the end of a file name in text. Thus, the default value of isfname is a compromise. The character classes are slash i for identifier characters, slash i, like slash i, excluding digits, slash k, keyword characters, slash capital K, like slash k, excluding digits, slash p, printable characters, slash capital P, like slash p, excluding digits, slash f, file name characters, and slash capital F, like f, excluding digits. Chapter 27, part 8, <clears throat> matching a line break. Vim can find a pattern that includes a line break. You need to specify where the line break happens because all items mentioned so far do not match a line break. To check for a line break in a specific place, use the slash n item. So 1 slash n 2. This will match at a line that ends in 1 and the next line starts with 2. To match 1 2 as well, you would need to match a space or a line character. This item the item to use for is backslash underscore s, so you would have slash 1 backslash underscore s2. To allow any amount of white space, you would do 1 backslash underscore s backslash plus 2, right? So that's one or more of the white spaces for 2. This also matches the 1 with multiple spaces at the end of the line and space space 2 at the start of the next one. Slash s matches white space, slash underscore s matches white space or line break. Similarly, A matches an uh, alphabetic character and slash underscore A matches an alphabetic character or a line break. The other character classes and ranges can be modified in the same way by inserting an underscore. Many other items can be made to match a line break by prepending underscore. For example, backslash underscore dot matches any character or a line break. Note. Backslash underscore dot scar matches everything until the end of the file. Be careful with this. It can make a search command very slow. Another example is backslash underscore brackets, a character range that includes a line break. This finds text in double quotes that may be split over multiple lines, which is the same search we had before, except now the left bracket is prepended with backslash underscore. <clears throat> Chapter 27, part 9, examples. Here are a few search patterns you might find useful. This shows how the items above can be combined. Finding a California license plate. A sample license plate is 1MGU103. It is one digit, three uppercase letters, and three digits. Directly putting this into the search pattern with slash D slash U slash U slash U slash D slash D slash D, but another way to specify that there's three digits and letters with a count would be slash do slash D slash U and then slash tilde or a curly brace with a three slash d slash tilde three again using ranges instead of using d's and u's we could do the range of zero to nine the range of a to z and then we use the backslash curly three range of zero to nine backslash curly three again which of these should you use whichever one you can remember the simple way you can remember is much faster than the fancy way that you can't if you can remember them all then avoid the last one because it's both more typing and slower to execute. Finding an identifier. 
In C programs, and many other computer languages, an identifier starts with a letter and further consists of letters and digits. Underscores can be used too, and this can be found with slash, and then we're going to do backslash left bracket to start, or left angle bracket to start our word match, backslash H, backslash W star, backslash right angle bracket. Remember that the angle brackets are used to find only whole words. Backslash H is for A to Z, capital or lowercase, or an underscore. And slash W is for 0 to 9, capital A to Z, lowercase A to Z, and underscore. Note, the angle brackets depend on the is keyword. And if it includes dash, for example, then ident dash is not matched. In this situation, we may want to use something a bit more complex. Chapter 28, Folding. Structured text can be separated in sections, in sections and subsections. Folding allows you to display a section as one line, providing an overview. This chapter explains the different ways this can be done. Chapter 28, Part 1. What is folding? Folding is used to show a range of lines in the buffer as a single line on the screen, like a piece of paper which is folded to make it sh shorter. The text is still in the buffer unchanged. Only the way lines are displayed is affected by folding. The advantage of folding is that you can get a better overview of the structure of the text and by folding lines of a section and replacing it with a line that indicates that there is a section. Chapter 28, Part 2, Manual Folding. Try it out. Position the cursor in a paragraph and write ZFAP. You will see that the entire paragraph is replaced by a highlighted line. You have created a fold. ZF is an operator and AP a text object selection. You can use the ZF operator with any movement command to create a fold for the text it moved over. ZF also works in visual mode. To view the text again, open the fold by typing ZO, and you can close the fold again with ZC. All the folding commands start with Z. With some fantasy, this looks like a folded piece of paper, seen from the side. The letter after Z has a mnemonic meaning to make it easier to remember the commands. ZF is fold creation, ZO is open a fold, ZC is close a fold. Folds can be nested. A region of text that contains folds can be folded again. For example, you can fold each paragraph in this section and then fold all the sections in this chapter. Try it out. You will notice that opening the fold for the whole chapter will restore the nested folds as they were. Some may be open and some may be closed. Suppose you have created several folds and now want to view all the text. You could go to each fold and type ZO. To do this faster, use the command ZR. This will reduce folding. The opposite is ZM and this folds more. You can repeat ZR and ZM to open and close nested folds of several levels. If you have several if you have nested several levels deep, you can open all of them with Z capital R, which reduces folds until there are none left. And you can close all folds with Z capital M. This folds more and more. You can quickly disable the folding with the ZN command. The Z capital N brings back the folding as it was. ZI toggles between the two. This is a useful way of working. Create folds to get an overview of the file. Move around to where you want to do your work. Do ZI to look at the text and edit it. Do ZI again to go back to moving around. More about manual folding in the reference manual. Help fold manual. Chapter 28, part 3. Working with folds. When some folds are closed, movement commands like J and K move over a fold like it was a single empty line. This allows you to quickly move around the text. You can yank, delete, and put folds as if it were a single line. This is very useful if you want to reorder functions in a program. First, make sure that each fold contains a whole function, or a bit less, by selecting the right fold method. Then delete the function with dd, move the cursor, and put it with p. If some lines of the function are above or below the fold, you can use visual selection. Put the cursor on the first line to be moved, hit v to start visual mode, put the cursor on the last line to be moved, hit d to delete the selected lines, move the cursor to the new position, and p for put the lines there. It's sometimes difficult to see or remember where a fold is located. Thus a ZO command would actually work. To see these defined folds, do set fold column equals 4. This will show a small column on the left of the window to indicate folds. A plus is shown for a closed field, and a minus is shown at the start of each open fold, and a bar at following lines of the fold. You can use the mouse to open a fold by clicking on the plus in the fold column. Clicking the minus or a bar below it will close an open fold. 
To open all the folds at the cursor line, use Z capital O. To close all folds at the cursor line, use Z capital C. To delete a fold at the cursor line, use ZD. And to delete all folds at the cursor line, use Z capital D. When in insert mode, the fold at the cursor line is never closed. That allows you to see what you type. Folds are opened automatically when jumping around or moving the cursor left or right. For example, the zero command opens the fold under the cursor if fold open contains HOR, which is the default. The fold open option can be changed to open folds for specific commands. If you want the line under the cursor always to be open, do this, colon set fold open equals all. You won't be able to move onto a closed fold then. You might want to use this only temporarily and then set it back to the default of set fold open ampersand. You can make folds close automatically when you move out of it, which is set fold close equals all. This will reapply fold level to all folds that don't contain the cursor. You have to try it out if you like how this feels. Use ZM to fold more and ZR to fold less, or reduce folds. The folding is local to the window. This allows you to open two windows on the same buffer, one with folds and one without folds, or one with all folds closed and one with all folds open. Chapter 28, part four, saving and restoring folds. When you abandon a file or starting to edit a new one, the state of the folds is lost. If you come back to the same file later, all manually open and closed folds are back to their default. When folds have been created manually, all folds are gone. To save the folds, use the make view command. This will store the settings and other things that influence the view on the file. You can change what's stored with the view options option. When you come back to the same file later, you can load the view again with load view. You can store up to 10 views on one file. For example, to save the current setup as the third view and load the second view, you can do make view three and load view two. Note that when you insert or delete lines, the views might become invalid. Also check out the view dir option, which specifies where the views are stored. You might want to delete old views now and then. Chapter 28, part five, folding by indent. Defining folds with ZF is a lot of work. If your text is structured by giving lower level items a larger indent, you can use the indent folding method. This will create folds for every sequence of lines with the same indent. Lines with larger indent will become nested folds. This works well with many programming languages. Try this by setting the fold method option to set fold method equals indent. Then you can use the ZM and ZR commands to fold more and reduce folding. It's easy to see on this example text. This line would not be indented, this line is intended once, and this line is intended twice as they each have one more indent. Note that the relation between the amount of indent and the fold depth depends on the shift width option. Each shift width worth of indent adds one to the depth of the fold. This is called a fold level. When you use the ZR and ZM commands, you actually increase or decrease the fold level option. You could also set it directly with set fold level equals three. This means that all folds with three items, a shift with indent or more, will be closed. The lower the fold level, the more folds will be closed. When fold level is zero, all folds are closed. Z capital M does set fold level to zero, and the opposite command ZR sets fold level to the deepest fold level that's present in the file. Thus, there are two ways to open and close the folds. By setting the fold level, this gives a very quick way of zooming out to view the structure of the text, move the cursor, and zoom in on the text again, or by using ZO and ZC commands to open or close specific folds. This allows opening only those folds that you want to be open while other folds remain closed. This can be combined. You can first close most folds by pressing ZM a few times and then open a specific fold with Z0 or open all folds with ZR and then close specific folds with ZC. But you cannot manually define folds when fold method is indent, as that would conflict with the relation between the indent and the fold level. More about folding by indent in the reference manual, help fold indent. Chapter 28, part six, folding with markers. Markers in the text are used to specify the start and end of a fold region. This gives precise control over which lines are included in a fold. The disadvantage is that the text needs to be modified. Try it. Set fold method equals marker. Example text as it could appear in a C program. You might have foobar with and a comment with three left 
curly braces, and then your function foo bar, and then you may have further nested triple curly braces inside the function followed by one closing at the end. Notice that the fold line will display the text before the marker. This is very useful to tell what the fold contains. It's quite annoying when the markers don't pair up correctly after moving some text around. This can be avoided by using numbered markers. For example, you can use triple curly brace one to say that this must always be a level one, and you can do the same with one and two. At every numbered marker, a fold at the specified level begins. This will make any fold at a higher level stop here. You can just use numbered start markers to define all folds. Only when you want to explicitly stop a fold before another starts, you need to add an end marker. More about folding with markers is in the reference manual, Help Fold Marker. Chapter 28, Part 7, Folding by Syntax. For each language, Vim uses a different syntax file. This defines the colors for various items in the file. If you are reading this in Vim in a terminal that supports colors, the colors you see are made with the help syntax file. In the syntax file, it's possible to add syntax items that have the fold argument. This defines a fold region. This requires writing a syntax file and adding these items in it. That's not so easy to do, but once it's done, all folding items happens automatically. Here we'll assume you're using an existing syntax file. Then there is nothing more to explain. You can open and close folds as explained above, and the folds will be created and deleted automatically when you edit the file. More about folding by syntax in the reference manual, help fold syntax. Chapter 28, part 8, folding by expression. This is similar to folding by indent, but instead of using the indent of a line, a user is called to compute the folding level of a line. You can use this for text where something in the text indicates which lines belong together. An example is an email message where the quoted text is indicated by a right angle bracket before the line. To fold these quotes, use something like this, set fold method equals expert, and we do set fold expert equals the string length of substituting, of substituting the current line where we substitute white space with nothing, and we substitute all the white space with nothing, and then we count how many right angle brackets there are. The code's a bit complex, so that's what it actually does. So you can try it out, though, on text like this, where quoted text you wrote, quoted text you wrote, and then double quoted text that I wrote with two angle brackets before. And in the first two lines, the thing will return one. And then when we have two angle brackets, we would reserve two. <clears throat> Note that a backslash must be inserted before every space, double quote, and backslash for the set command. If this confuses you, do colon set fold expert to check the actual resulting value. To correct a complicated expression, use the command line completion set fold expert equals tab, where you type tab, and Vim will fill in the previous value, which you can then edit. When the expression gets more complicated, you should put it in a function and set fold expert to call that function. More about folding by expression in the reference manual in help fold expert. Chapter 28, part 9 folding unchanged lines. This is useful when you set the diff option in the same window. The dash D option does this for you. For example, set local diff, fold method equals diff, scroll bind, no wrap, fold level equal one. Do this in every window that shows a different version of the same file. You will clearly see the difference between the lines while the text that didn't change is folded. For more details, see help fold dash diff. Chapter 28, part 10, which fold method to use. All these possibilities make you wonder which method you should choose. Unfortunately, there's no golden rule, but here are some hints. If there is a syntax file, syntax file with folding for the language you're editing, that's probably the best choice. If there isn't one, you might try to write it. This requires a good knowledge of search patterns. It's not easy, but when it's working, you will not have to define folds manually. Typing commands to manually fold regions can be used for unstructured text, and then use make view command to save and restore your folds. The marker method requires you to change the file. If you're sharing the files with other people or you have to meet company standards, you might not be allowed to add them. The main advantage of markers is that you put them exactly where you want them. That avoids that a few lines are missed when you cut and paste folds and you can add a comment about what's contained in the fold. Folding by indent is something that works in many files, but not always very well. Use it when you can't use one of the other methods. However, it is very useful for outlining. Then you specifically use one shift width for each nesting level. Folding with expressions can make folds in almost any structured text. It's quite simple to specify, especially if the start and end of a fold can easily be recognized. 
If you use the expert method to define folds, but they're not exactly how you want them, you could switch to the manual method. This will not remove the defined folds, then you can delete or add folds manually. Chapter 29, Moving Through Programs. The creator of Vim is a computer programmer. It's no surprise that Vim contains many features to aid in writing programs. Jump around to find where identifiers are defined and used, and preview declarations in a separate window. There's more in the next chapter. Chapter 29, Part 1, Using Tags. What is a tag? It's a location where an identifier is defined. An example is a function in a C or C++ program. A list of tags is kept in a tags file. This can be used by Vim directly to jump from any place to the tag, the place where an identifier is defined. To generate the tags file for all C files in the current directory, use the following command, ctags star.c. ctags is a separate program. Most Unix systems have it installed, but if you do not have it yet, you can find universal ctags at ctags.io. Universal ctags is preferred. Exuberant ctags is no longer being developed. Now, when you're in Vim and you want to go to a function definition, you can jump to it by using the following command, colon tag start list. This command will find the function start list, even if it's in another file. The control right bracket command jumps to the tag of the word that's under the cursor. This makes it easy to explore a tangle of C code. Suppose, for example, that you're in the function write block. You can see that it calls write line. But what does write line do? By placing the cursor on the call to write line and pressing control right bracket, you jump to the definition of this function. The write line function calls write char. You need to figure out what it does. So you jump the, so you position the cursor of the call to write char and press control right bracket. Now you are at the definition of write char. The tags command shows the list of tags that you've traversed with number two being right char and number one being right line and currently an angle bracket point, pointing to where you currently are. Now to go back, the control T command goes to the preceding tag. In the example above, you get back to the right line function in the call to right char. This command takes a count argument that indicates how many tags to jump back. You've gone forward and now back. Let's go forward again. The following command goes to the tag on the top of the list, which is colon tag. You can prefix it with a count and jump forward that many tags, for example, colon three tag. Control T can also be preceded with a count. These commands thus allow you to go down a call tree with control right bracket and back up again with control T. Use colon tags to find out where you are. Split windows. The tag command replaces the file in the current window with the one containing the new function. But suppose you want to see not only the old function, but also the new one. You can split the window using split command followed by the tag command. Vim has a shorthand command that does both with colon s tag tag name. To split the current window and jump to the tag under the cursor, use this command, control w right bracket. If a count is specified, the new window will be that many lines high. More tag files. When you have files in many directories, you can create a tags file in each of them. Vim will only be able to jump to tags within that directory. To find more tag files, set the tags option to include all the relevant tag files. For example, you could do set tags equals dot slash tags, comma, dot slash dot dot slash tags, and dot slash star tags. This finds a tag file in the same directory as the current file, one directly higher, and in all subdirectories. This is quite a number of tags files, but it may still not be enough. For example, when editing a file in proj source, you will not find the tags file in proj source subtags. For this situation, Vim offers to search a whole directory tree for tags files. For example, set tags is proj slash star star slash tags. One tags file. When Vim has to search many places for tags file, you can hear the disk rattling. <laughs> it may get a bit slow. In that case, it's better to spend this time generating one big tags file. You might do this overnight. This requires the universal or exuberant C tags program mentioned above. It offers an argument to search a whole directory tree. So you could cd to proj and ctags dash capital R dot. The nice thing about this is that universal slash exuberant C tags recognizes various file types. This doesn't work just for C and C++ programs, but also for Eiffel and even Vim scripts. See the C tags documentation to tune this. Now you only need to tell Vim where your big tags file is. So you could do set tags equals proj slash tags. Multiple matches. 
When a function is defined multiple times, or a method in several classes, the tag command will jump to the first one. If there is a match in the current file, then that one's used first. You can now jump to other matches for the same tag with tnext. Repeat this to find further matches. If there are many, you can select which one to jump to, with tselect tag name. Vim will present you with a list of choices, one, two, three, four, each with some information including the priority, kind, tag, and file. You can now enter the number in the first column of the match that you would like to jump to. The information in the other column gives you a good idea of where the match is defined. To move between the matching tags, these commands can be used. T first, go to the first match. T previous, go to the previous match. T next, go to next match. And T last, go to last match. If count is omitted, then one is used. Guessing tag names. Command line completion is a good way to avoid typing a long tag name. Just type the first bit and press tab. So for example, tag right underscore tab. You will get the first match. If it's not the one you want, press tab until you find the right one. Sometimes you only know part of the name of a function, or you may have many tags that start with the same string but end differently. Then you can tell Vim to use a pattern to find the tag. Suppose you want to jump to a tag that contains block. First type this, colon tag, and then slash block. Now use command line completion, press tab. Vim will find all tags that contain block and use the first match. The slash before a tag name tells Vim that what follows is not a literal tag, but a pattern. You can use all the items for search patterns here. For example, suppose you want to select a tag that starts with right. You can do tselect, slash, and then caret right. The caret specifies that the tag starts with right. Otherwise, it would also be found halfway in a tag name. Similarly, dollar sign at the end makes sure the pattern matches until the end of a tag. A tag's browser. Since control right bracket takes you to the definition of the identifier under the cursor, you can use a list of identifier names as a table of contents. Here's an example. First create a list of identifiers. This requires universal or exuberant C tags. C tags dash dash C dash types equals F dash F functions star dot C. Now start Vim without a file and edit this file in Vim in a vertically split window. Vim colon V split functions. The window contains a list of all the functions. There's some more stuff, but you can ignore that. Do set local TS99 to clean it up a little bit. In this, in this window, define a mapping. No remap, buffer, enter, 0, ye, control WW, colon tag, control R, double quote, enter. This is unexplained in the docs, but effectively move the cursor to the line that contains the function you want to go to, then press enter, then we'll go to the other window and jump to the selected function. Related items. To make case in tag names be ignored, you can set ignore case while leaving tag case as follow IC or set tag case to ignore. The tag B search option tells if the tags file is sorted or not. The default is to assume a sorted tags file, which makes a tag search a lot faster, but doesn't work if the tags file isn't sorted. The tag length option can be used to tell them the number of significant characters in a tag. Chapter 29, Part 2. The Preview Window. When you edit code that contains a function call, you need to use the correct arguments. To know what values to pass, you can look at how the function is defined. The tags mechanism works very well for this. Preferably, the definition is displayed in another window. For this, the preview windows can be used. To open a preview window to display the function write char, use p tag write char. Then we'll open a window and jumps to the tag write char. Then it takes you back to the original position. Thus, you can continue typing without the need to use a control W command. If the name of the function appears in the text, you can get its definition in the preview window with control W write curly. There is a script that automatically displays the text where the word on the cursor was defined. See cursor hold example. To close the preview window, use the command colon p close. And to edit a specific file in the preview window, use pedit. This can be useful to edit a header file, for example, pedit defs.h. Finally, psearch can be used to find a word in the current file and any included files and display the match in the preview window. This is especially useful when using library functions, for which you do not have a tags file. Example, psearch popen. This will show the standard I.O. file in the preview window with the function prototype for popen, which would be something like file popen underscore underscore p with const char star and const char star.
You can specify the height of the preview window when it's opened with the preview height option. Chapter 29, part three, moving through a program. Since a program is structured, BIM can recognize items in it. Specific commands can be used to move around. C programs often contain constructs like this, if def use popen, fd equals popen lsr, and then an else for fd equals fopen temp w end if. But when much longer and possibly nested, position the cursor on the if def and press percent. Vim will jump to the pound else. Pressing percent again takes you to the pound end if. Another percent takes you to the if def again. When the construct is nested, Vim will find the matching items. This is a good way to check to, that you didn't forget an end if. When you are somewhere inside an if end if, you can jump to the start of it with left bracket pound. If you are not after an if or if def, then Vim will beep. To jump forward to the next else or end if, you can do right bracket pound. These two commands skip any pound if to end if blocks that they encounter. Example, if has defined ink h with a equals a plus ink, if des use theme a plus equals three, and if set with a. With the cursor on the last line, left bracket pound moves to the first line as in it moves all the way back up to that first pound if. The pound if def and pound end if block in the middle is skipped. Moving in code blocks. In C, code blocks are enclosed with left and right curlies. These can get pretty long. To move to the start of the outer block, use left bracket, left bracket command. Use right bracket, left bracket to find the end. This assumes that the left bracket or left curly and right curly are in the first column. The left bracket curly command moves to the start of the current block. It skips over pairs of curlies at the same level. The right bracket curly jumps to the end. When writing C++ or Java, the outer curly box is for the classes, and the next level of curlies is for a method. When somewhere inside a class uses bracket left bracket M to find the previous start of a method, right bracket M finds the next start of the method. Additionally, left bracket right bracket moves backward to the end of the function, and right bracket right bracket moves forward to the start of the next function. The end of a function is defined by a right squirrely in the first column. Don't forget that you can also use percent to move between matching parentheses, curlies, and brackets. This also works when they are many lines apart. Moving in braces. The left bracket parentheses and right bracket right parentheses commands work similar to left bracket curly and right bracket right curly, except that they work on parentheses instead of curly pairs. Moving in comments. To move back to the start of a comment, use left bracket slash move forward to the end of the comment with right bracket slash this only works for a slash star style comments chapter 29 part 4 finding global identifiers you are editing a c program and wonder if a variable is declared as int or unsigned a quick way to find this is to use the bracket capital i command suppose the cursor is on the word column type bracket capital i Vim will list the matching lines it can find, not only in the current file, but also in all included files and files included in them, etc. The result looks something like this, structs.h with 1, 29, unsigned column, and a column number. The advantage over using tags or preview window is that included files are searched. In most cases, this results in the right declaration to be found, also when the tag file is out of date. Also when you don't have tags for the included files. However, a few things must be right for left bracket capital I to do its work. First of all, the include option must specify how a file is included, and the default value works for C and C++. For other languages, you will have to change it. Locating included files. <clears throat> Vim will include included files in the places specified with the path option. If a directory is missing, some include files will not be found. You can discover this with this command, check path. It will list the include files that could not be found. Also files included by files that could be found. An example of the output might be something like included files not found in path, io.h, and then vim.h with an arrow to functions.h and clib execprotos.h. 
The io.h file is included by the current file, but couldn't be found. vim.h could be found, thus check path goes into this file and checks what it includes, but the functions.h and clib exec protos files included by vim.h are not found. Vim is not a compiler. It does not recognize if def statements. That means every include statement is used, also when it comes after if never. To fix the files that could not be found, add a directory to the path option. A good place to find out about this is the make file. Look out for lines that contain dash capital I items like dash I slash user slash local slash X11. To add this directory, use set path plus equal user slash local slash X11. When there are many subdirectories, you can use the star wildcard. For example, set path plus equals user slash star slash include. This would find files in user slash local include, as well as user slash x11 slash include. When working on a project with a whole nested tree of included files, the star star item can be useful. This will include, this will search down in all subdirectories. For example, set path plus equals projects slash invent slash star star slash include. This will find files in the directories such as projects invent include, projects invent main slash include, projects invent main OS include, etc. There are even more possibilities. Check out the path option for more info. If you want to see which included files are actually found, use this command, check path bang. You will get a very long list of included files and the files they include and so on. To shorten this list a bit, Vim shows already listed for files that were found before and doesn't list the included files in there again. Jumping to a match. Left bracket capital I produces a list with only one line of text. When you want to have a closer look at the first item, you can jump to that line with the command left bracket tab. You can also use left bracket control I since control I is the same as pressing tab for many terminals. The list that left bracket capital I produces has a number at the start of each line. When you want to jump to another item other than the first one, type the number first, three, left bracket tab. This will jump to the third item in the list. Remember that you can control O to jump back from where you started. Related commands are control bracket left I only list the first match, control right bracket capital I only lists item below the cursor, and control right bracket I only lists the first item below the cursor. Finding defined identifiers. The left bracket capital I command finds any identifier. To find only macros defined with pound define, use left bracket D. Again, this searches in included files. The define option specifies what a line looks like that defines the items for left bracket capital D. You could change it to make it work with other languages than C or C++. The commands related to D are lowercase d and uppercase d for only listing first match, and you can do left bracket and right bracket for below or after the cursor, respectively. Chapter 29, part 5, finding local identifiers. The left bracket capital I command searches included files. To search in the current file only and jump to the first place where the word under the cursor is used, use G capital D. Hint, go to definition. This command is very useful to find a variable or function that was declared locally or static in C terms. Example, with a cursor on counter, you might be able to jump outside of a function to a static definition above for static in counter in C. To restrict the search even further and look only in the current function, use this command, gd. This will go back to the start of the current function and find the first occurrence of the word under the cursor. Actually, it searches backwards to an empty line above the curly brace to the first column. From there, it searches forward for the identifier. Example, cursor on idx, where if you had idx inside of some sort of for loop and you're looping with the for loop, but the, it's first defined lines above this, it would go back up to there. So it looks for the first place where this happens. Chapter 30, Editing Programs. Vim has various commands that aid in writing computer programs. Compile a program and directly jump to reported errors, automatically set the indent for many languages and format comments. Chapter 30, Part 1, Compiling. Vim has a set of so-called quick fix commands. They enable you to compile a program from within Vim and then go through the errors generated and fix them, hopefully. You can then recompile and fix any new errors that are found until finally your program compiles without any error. The following command runs the make, supplying it with any argument you give, and captures the output. 
So you could do make and then arguments. If errors were generated, they are captured and the editor positions you where the first error occurred. Take a look at an example make session. Typical make sessions generate far more errors and fewer stupid ones. After typing make, the screen looks like this, where you might have make and then print these out, gcc-g-wall-o prog main.c sub.c. You may have some error like main.c in function main, main.c colon six, too many arguments to function do sub, main.c at top level, main.c 10, parse error before write curly brace, two returned, main.c, three of six, too many arguments, and so on. Press enter or type command to continue. From this, you can see that you have errors in your file main.c. When you press enter, Vim displays the file main.c with the cursor position on line six, the first line with an error. You did not need to specify the file or the line number. Vim knew where to go by looking at the error message. The following command goes to the next where the next error occurs, which is colon c next. Vim jumps to line 10, the last line in the file, where there's an extra right curly. When there is not enough room, Vim will shorten the error message. To see the whole message, use colon cc. You can get an overview of all the error messages with the colon c list command. The output looks like this, colon c list with the first line three, main.c, six colon, too many arguments to function do sub, and so on. Only the lines where Vim recognized a file name and a line number are listed here. It assumes those are the interesting lines and the rest is just boring messages. However, sometimes unrecognized lines do contain something you want to see. Output from the linker, for example, about an undefined function. To see all the messages, add a bang to the command, so clist bang would show you all the messages that we just read previously. Vim will highlight the current error. To go to the previous error, use colon c previous. Other commands to move around in the error list are colon c first, colon c last, and colon c c three to go to the error number three. Using another compiler, the name of the program to run when make command is executed is defined by the make prg option. Usually this is set to make, but Visual C++ users should get set this to end make by executing the following commands, colon set make prg equals end make. You can also include arguments in this option. Special characters need to be escaped with a backslash. For example, set make prg equals end make backslash space dash f backslash spake project doc make. You can include special vim keywords in the command specification. The percent character expands to the current name of the current file. So if you execute the command set make prg equals make backslash space percent s colon s, and when you are editing main.c, then make executes the following command make main.c. This is not too useful, so you will probably want to refine the command a little and use the colon r root modifier. So set make prj equals make backslash space percent colon r colon s dot o. Now the command executed is as follows make main dot o. For more about these modifiers, see fi help file name modifiers. Old error lists. Suppose you make a program. There's a warning message in one file and an error message in another. You fix the error and use make again to check if it was really fixed. Now you want to look at the warning message. It doesn't show up in the last error list since the file with the warning wasn't compiled. You can go back to the previous error list with colon c older. Then use colon c list and cc number to jump to the place with the warning. To go forward to the next error list, do colon c newer. Vim remembers 10 error lists. Switching compilers. You have to tell Vim what format the error messages are that your compiler produces. This is done with the error format option. The syntax of this option is quite complicated, but it can be made to fit almost any compiler. You can find the explanation here in help error format. You might be using various different compilers. Setting the make prg option and especially the error format option each time is not easy. Vim offers a simple method for this. For example, to switch to using the Microsoft Visual C++ compiler, run colon compiler msvc. This will find the Vim script for the msvc compiler and set the appropriate options. You can write your own compiler options. See help compiler write compiler plugin. Output redirection. The colon make command redirects the output of the executed program to an error file. 
How this works depends on various things, such as the shell. If your make command doesn't capture the output, check the make, ef, and shell pipe options. The shell quote and shell x quote options might also matter. In case you can't get make to redirect the file for you, an alternative is to compile the program in another window and redirect the output into a file. Then have vim read this file with c file file name. Jumping to errors will work like the make command. <clears throat> Chapter 30, part two indenting C style text. A program is much easier to understand when the lines have been properly indented. Vim offers various ways to make this less work. For C or C style programs like Java or C++, set the C indent option. Vim knows a lot about C programs and will try very hard to automatically set the indent for you. Set the shift width option to the amount of space you want for a deeper level. Four spaces will work just fine. One set command will do it. Set C indent, C indent shift width equals four. With this option enabled, when you type something such as if, left parenthesis x, right parenthesis c, the next line will automatically be indented an additional level. So that's for if in a single line statement. So if you just call some function on the next line, it'll automatically be indented. Following a semicolon, it will be dedented again. When you type something in curly braces, the text will be indented at the start and unindented at the end. The unindenting will happen after typing the right curly brace since Vim can't guess what you are going to type. One side effect of automatic indentation is that it helps you catch errors in your code early. When you type a right curly to finish a function, only to find that the automatic indentation gives it more indent than you expected, there's probably a right curly missing. Using the percent command to find out which curly brace matches the right curly you typed. A missing parenthesis and semicolon also cause extra indent. Thus, if you get more white space than you would expect, check the preceding lines. When you have code that's badly formatted or you inserted multiple and deleted lines, you need to re-indent the lines. The equals operator does this. The simple form is equals equals. This indents the current line. Like with all operators, there are three ways to use it. The visual mode equals indents the selected lines. A useful text object is a curly brace. This selects the current curly brace block. Thus to re-indent the code block the cursor is in, you can do equals a curly. If you have really badly indented code, you can re-indent the whole file with gg equals capital G. However, don't do this in files that have carefully indented manually. The automatic indenting does a good job, but in some situations you might want to overrule it. <clears throat> Setting indent style. Different people have different styles of indentation. By default, Vim does a pretty good job of indenting in a way that 90% of programmers do. There are different styles, however. So if you want to, you can customize the indentation style with C I N options option. By default, the C I N options is empty and Vim uses the default style. You can add various items where you want something different. For example, to make the curly braces be placed very ugly, slightly indented on the next line, you can use the option set C N options plus equals left curly two. There are many of these. Set C and options dash values. <clears throat> Chapter 30, part three, automatic indenting. You don't want to switch on the C indent option manually every time you edit a C file. This is how you make it work automatically with file type indent on, which is on by default in NeoVim. Actually, this does a lot more than switching on C indent for C files. First of all, it enables detecting the type of a file. That's the same as what's used for syntax highlighting. When the file type is known, Vim will search for an indent file for this type of file. The Vim distribution includes a number of these for various programming languages. This indent file will then prepare for automatic indenting specifically for this file. If you don't like the automatic indenting, you can switch it off again with file type indent off. If you don't like the indenting for one specific type of file, this is how you avoid it. Create a file with just this one line. Let b colon did indent equals one. Now you need to write this in a file with a specific name, directory slash indent slash file type. The file type is the name of the file type, such as CPP or Java. You can see the exact name that Vim detected with this command, set file type. In this file, the output would be file type equals help. Then you can use help for file type. For the directory part, you need to use your runtime directory. Look at the output of this command, set runtime path. Now use the first item, the name after the first comma. Thus, if the output looks like runtime path equals 
home slash dot config slash envim, then you could use config envim for directory. And the resulting file name would be dot config slash envim slash indent slash help dot vim. Instead of switching the indenting off, you could write your own indent file. How to do that is explained in help indent expression. Chapter 30, part four, other indenting. The simplest form of automatic indenting is with the auto indent option. It uses the indent from the previous line. A bit smarter is the smart indent option. This is useful for languages where no indent file is available. Smart indent is not as smart as C indent, but smarter than auto indent. With smart indent set, an extra level of indentation is added for each left curly and removed for each right curly. An extra level of indentation will also be added for any of the keywords in C I N words option. Lines that begin with pound are treated specially. All indentation is removed. This is done so that the preprocessor directives will all start in column one. The indentation is restored for the next line. Correcting indents. When you are using auto indent or smart indent to get the indent of the previous line, there will be many times when you need to add or remove one shift width worth of indent. A quick way of doing this is using control D or control T commands in insert mode. For example, you're typing a shell script that's supposed to look like this if test dash n a semicolon then and then two indented lines of echo a and echo quotes of an empty line with phi. Start off by setting these options. Set auto indent, set shift width equals three. You start by typing the first line, enter, and the start of the second line. And you notice that you need an extra indent. Type control T. The result is that your new line will now be one line more indented. The control T command in insert mode adds one shift width to the indent, no matter where in the line you are. You can continue typing the second line, enter and the third line. This time the indent's okay. Then you enter and hit the last line and now you have the FI, the end of the if statement for bash on a line, but it's indented. To remove the superfluous indent in the last line, press control D while in insert mode. This deletes one shift width worth of indent, no matter where you are in the line. When you're in normal mode, you can use the angle bracket, angle bracket to the right or left commands to shift lines. The left and right angle bracket are operators, unless you have the usual three ways to specify the lines you want to indent. A useful combination is right angle bracket I curly brace. This adds one indent to the current block of lines inside of the curly braces. The curly braces themselves lines are left unmodified. Curl right angle bracket A curly brace includes them. In this example, the cursor is on print F and you have something where everything is not indented. So you have if statement, curly brace, print F, and a curly brace. If you do right angle bracket I curly brace, only the print F will be indented. If you do right angle bracket A curly brace, the curly braces themselves will be indented as well. Chapter 30, part five, tabs and spaces. Tab stop is set to eight by default. Although you can change it, you quickly run into trouble later. Other programs won't know what tab stop value you used. They probably use the default value of eight and your text suddenly looks very different. Also, most printers use a fixed tab stop value of eight. Thus, it's best to keep tab stop alone. If you edit a file which was written with a different tab stop setting, see chapter 25, part three for how to fix that. For indenting lines in a program, using a multiple of eight spaces make you quickly run into the right border of the window. Using a single space doesn't provide enough visual difference. Many people prefer to use four spaces, a good compromise. Since a tab is eight character and you might want to use an indent of four spaces, you can't use a tab character to make your indent. There are two ways to handle this. Use a mix of tab and space characters. Since a tab takes the place of eight spaces, you have few characters in your pile. Inserting a tab is quicker than eight spaces and backspacing works faster as well. Or you can use spaces only. This avoids the trouble with programs that use a different tab stop value. Fortunately, Vim supports methods as well. Spaces and tabs. If you're using a combination of tabs and spaces, you just edit normally. The Vim defaults do a fine job of handling things. You can make life a little easier by setting the soft tab stop option. This tells Vim to make the tab key look and feel as if the tabs were set at the value of soft tab stop, but actually use a combination of tabs and spaces. After you execute the following command, every time you press the tab key, the cursor moves to the next four column boundary, which is set tab stop, soft tab stop equals four. 
When you start in the first column and press tab, you get four spaces inserted in your text. The second time, Vim takes out the four spaces and puts in a tab, thus taking you to column eight. Thus Vim uses as many tabs as possible and then fills up with spaces. When backspacing, it works the other way around. A backspace will always delete the amount specified by soft tab stop. Then tabs are used as many as possible and spaces to fill the gap. The following shows what happens when pressing tab a few times and then using backspace. A dot stands for space and tab is for tab. So when you press tab, initially it'll insert four spaces, press tab again, and you'll get eight spaces, but it's actually one tab. Then you would do it again and you get a tab and four spaces. If you press backspace, it will delete the four spaces. Press backspace again, it will remove the tab and add four spaces. An alternative is to use the smart tab option. When it's set, Vim uses shift width for a tab type in When it's set, Vim uses shift width for a tab typed in the indent of a line and a real tab when typed after the first non-blake character. However, backspace doesn't work like with soft tab stop. Just spaces. If you want absolutely no tabs in your file, you can set the expand tab option. Set expand tab. When this option is set, the tab key inserts a series of spaces. Thus, you get the same amount of white space as if a tab character was inserted, but there isn't a real tab character in your file. The backspace, backspace key will delete each space by itself. Thus, after typing one tab, you have to press the backspace key up to eight times to undo it. If you are in an indent, pressing control D will be a lot quicker. Changing tabs in spaces and back. Setting expand tab does not affect any existing tabs. In other words, any tabs in the document remain tabs. If you want to convert tabs to spaces, use the retab command. So set expand tab and then percent retab. Now Vim will have changed all indents to use spaces instead of tabs. However, all tabs that come after a long blank character are kept. If you want to keep these to be converted as well, add a bang. So you could do percent retab bang. This is a little bit dangerous because it also changed tabs inside a string. To check if these exist, you could use slash quote caret quote caret t star backslash t left bracket caret quote right bracket star double quote. It's recommended not to use hard tabs inside a string. Replace them with slash t to avoid trouble. The other way around works just as well. Set no expand tab and percent retab exclamation. <clears throat> Chapter 30, part six, formatting comments. One of the great things about Vim is that it understands comments. You can ask Vim to format a comment and it will do the right thing. Suppose for example, you have the following comment with a multi-line comment string of this is a text and then a new line of the text formatting. You can then ask Vim to format it by positioning one cursor at the start of the comment and type GQ right bracket slash. GQ is the operator to format text. Right bracket slash is the motion that takes you to the end of the comment. The result is that the text is now on one line inside of the comment. Notice that Vim properly handled the beginning of each line. An alternative is to select the text that is to be formatted in visual mode and type GQ. To add a new line to the comment, position the cursor on the middle line and press O. The result looks like this, with a new line that starts with a star. Vim has automatically inserted a star and a space for you. Now you can type the comment text. When it gets longer than text width, Vim will break the line. Again, the star is inserted automatically. For this to work, some flags must be present in format options. R, inside the star when typing enter in insert mode. O, so insert the star when using O or capital O in normal mode. And C, break comment text according to text width. See help fo table for more flags. Defining a comment. The comments option defines what a comment looks like. Vim distinguishes between a single line comment and a comment that has different start, end, and middle part. Many single line comments start with a specific character. In C++, slash slash is used in make files pound and in Vim scripts, a single double quote. For example, to make Vim understand C++ comments, do set comments equals colon slash slash. The colon separates the flags of an item from the text by which the comment is recognized. The general form of an item in comments is flags colon text. The flags part can be empty, as in this case. Several of these items can be concatenated, separated by commas. This allows recognizing different types of comments at the same time. For example, let's edit an email message. When replying, the text that others wrote is preceded with a single right angle bracket and bang characters. This command could look like set comments equals n colon 
right angle bracket, comma, and colon bang. There are two items, one for comments starting with a uh, angle bracket and one for comments that start with a bang. Both use the flag N. This means that these comments nest. Thus a line starting with one angle bracket may have another comment after the angle bracket. This allows formatting messages like bang after a right angle bracket, did you see the site? Try setting text width to different values, for example 80, and format the text by visually selecting it and typing GQ. The result is that the lines are folded with their prefixes uh, removed. You'll notice Vim did not move text from one type of comment to another. The I in the second comment would have fit at the end of the first line, but since that line starts with a bang, the second line with a caret, Vim knows that this is a different kind of comment. <clears throat> a three-part comment. A C comment starts with slash star, has stars in the middle, and a star slash at the end. The entry in comments for this looks like this. Set comments equals S1 colon slash star, comma, MB colon star, comma, EX colon star slash. So the start is defined with S1 colon slash star. The S indicates the start of a three-piece comment. The colon generates the flags from the text by which the comment is recognized, which is slash star. There is one flag, colon one. This tells Vim that the middle part has an offset of one space. The middle part, MB star, starts with M, which indicates it's a middle part. The B indicates that a blank must follow the text. Otherwise, Vim would consider text like star pointer also to be the middle of an element. The end part, EX colon star slash, has E for identification. The X flag has a special meaning. It means that after Vim automatically inserted a star, typing slash will remove the extra space. For more details, see format comments. Chapter 31, Exploiting the GUI. Vim works well in a terminal, but the GUI has a few extra items. A file browser can be used for commands that use a file, a dialog to make a choice between alternatives. Use keyboard shortcuts to access menu items quickly. Chapter 31, Part 1, The File Browser. When using the File Open menu, you get a file browser. This makes it easier to find the file you want to edit, but what if you want to split a window to use another file? There's no menu entry for this. You could first use window slash split and then file open, but that's more work. Since you're typing most commands in Vim, opening the file browser with a typed command is possible as well. To make the split command use the file browser, preprend browse. So you would type browse split. Select a file and then split command will be executed with it. If you cancel the file dialog, nothing happens. The window isn't split. You can also specify a file name argument. This is used to tell the file browser where to start. For example, colon browse split slash etsy. The file browser will pop up starting in the directory slash etsy. The browse command can be prepended to just about any command that opens a file. If no directory is specified, Vim will decide where to start the file browser. By default, it uses the same directory as the last time. Thus, when you use browse split and select a file in slash user slash local slash share, the next time you use a browse command, it will start in the same location. This can be changed with the browser option. It can one of three values, last, which uses the last directory browsed, buffer, use the same directory as the current buffer, or current, use the current directory. For example, when you're in the directory slash user, editing the file slash user slash local slash share slash readme, then the command set browser equal buffer and browse edit will start the browser in use local share. Alternatively, set browser equals current browse edit will start the browser in slash user. To avoid using the mouse, most file browsers offer using key presses to navigate. Since this is different for every system, it's not explained here. Vim uses a standard browser when possible, and your system documentation should contain an explanation on the keyboard shortcut somewhere. When you're not using the GUI version, you could use the File Explorer window to select files, like in a file browser. However, this doesn't work for the browse command. See help netrw browse. Chapter 31, Part 2, Confirmation. Vim protects you from accidentally overwriting a file and other ways to lose changes. If you do something that might be a bad thing to do, Vim produces an error message and suggests a pending bang if you really want to do it. To avoid retyping the command with bang, you can make Vim give you a dialog. You can then press OK or cancel to tell Vim what you want. For example, you're editing a file and make changes to it. Start editing another file with confirm edit foo.txt. 
then we'll pop up with a dialog that looks something like this. Save changes to bar.txt. Yes, no, cancel. Now make your choice. If you do not want to save the if you do want to save the changes, select yes. If you do not want to lose the changes forever, no. If you forgot what you were doing and want to check what really changed, use cancel. You will be back in the same file with the changes still there. Just like browse, the confirm command can be prepended to most commands that edit another file. They can also be combined. Confirm browse edit. This will produce a dialog box when the current buffer was changed. Then it will pop up a file browser to select the file to edit. Note, in the dialog, you can use the keyboard to select the choice. Typically the tab key and the cursor keys change the choice and pressing enter selects the choice. This depends on the system though. When you're not using the GUI, the confirm command works as well. Instead of popping up a dialog, Vim will print the message at the bottom of the Vim window and ask you to confirm a key to make a choice. Confirm edit main.c and then you'll have save changes. You can now press the single key for the choice, and you don't have to press enter, unlike typing on the command line. Chapter 31, Part 3, Menu Shortcuts <clears throat> The keyboard is used for all Vim commands. The menus provide a simple way to select commands without knowing what they're called, but you have to move your hand from the keyboard and grab the mouse. Menus can often be selected with keys as well. This depends on your system, but most often it works this way. Use the Alt key in combination with the underlined letter of a menu. For example, Alt-W. Alt and W, pops up the window. In the window menu, the window item has the P underlined. To select it, let go of Alt and press P. After the first selection of a menu with the Alt key, you can use the cursor keys to move through the menus. Right selects a sum menu and left closes it. Escape also closes a menu. Enter selects an item. There's a conflict between using the Alt key to select menu items and using Alt key combinations for map. The Win Alt keys option tells Vim what it should do with the Alt key. The default value menu is the smart choice. If the key combination is a menu shortcut, it can't be mapped. All other keys are available for mapping. The value no doesn't use any alt keys for the menus. Thus, you must use the mouse for menus, and all alt keys can be mapped. The value yes means that Vim will use any alt keys for the menus. Some alt key combinations may do other things than selecting a menu. Chapter 31, Part 4, Vim Window, Position, and Size. To see the current Vim Window position on the screen, use colon win pos. This will only work in the GUI. The output may look something like this, window position x272, y 103. The position is given in screen pixels. Now you can use the numbers to move them somewhere else. For example, to move it to the left 100 pixels, win pos 172, 103. Note, there may be a small offset between the reported position and where the window moves. This is because of the border around the window. This is added by the window manager. You can use this command in your startup script to position the window at a specific position. The size of the Vim window is computed in characters. Thus, this depends on the size of the font being used. You can see the current size with set lines and columns. <clears throat> to change the size, set the lines and or columns option to a new value. For example, set lines equals 50, set columns equals 80. Obtaining the size works in a terminal just like in the GUI. Setting the size is not possible in most terminals. You can start the X Windows version of GVim with an argument to specify the size and position of the window. GVim dash geometry with x height plus x offset plus y offset. Width and height are in characters, x offset and y offset are in pixels. For example, GVim dash geometry, 80x25 plus 100 plus 300. Various for chapter 31, part 5. You can use GVim to edit an email message. In your email program, you must select GVim to be the editor for messages. When you try that, you will see that it doesn't work. The mail program thinks that the editing is finished while GVim is still running. What happens is that GVim disconnects from the shell it was started in. That's fine when you start GVim in a terminal, so that you can do other work in that terminal. But what you really want to wait for is GVim to finish. You must prevent it from disconnecting. The dash F argument does this. GVim dash F file dot txt. The dash F command stands for foreground. Now Vim will block the shell it was started on until you finish e editing and exit. <clears throat> Delayed start of the GUI. On Unix, it's possible to first start Vim in a terminal, that's useful if you do various tasks in the same shell. If you're editing a file and decide you want to use the GUI after all, you can start it with colon GUI. Vim will open the GUI window and no longer use the terminal. You can continue using the terminal for something else. The dash F argument is used here to run the GUI in the background. You can also use GUI dash F.
Chapter 32, The Undo Tree. Vim provides multi-level undo. If you undo a few changes and then make a new change, you create a branch in the undo tree. This text is about moving through the branches. Chapter 32, Part 1. Sometimes you make several changes and then discover you want to go back to when you have last written the file. You can do that with this command. Earlier, 1F. The F stands for file here. You can repeat this command to go further back in the past or use a count different from 1 to go back faster. If you go back too far, go forward again with later 1F. Note that these commands really work in time sequence. This matters if you made changes after undoing some changes. It's explained in the next section. Also note that we are talking about text writes here. For writing the undo information in the file, see Help Undo Persistence. Chapter 32, Part 2, Numbering Changes. In section Chapter 2, Part 5, we only discussed one line of undo redo, but it's also possible to branch off. This happens when you undo a few changes and then make a new change. The new change becomes a branch in the undo tree. Let's start with the text 1. The first change is to append 2, and then to move to the O and change it to a W. We then have two changes, numbered 1 and 2, and three states of text. We have 1, and then 1, T-O-O, and then 1, T-O-W, T-W-O, sorry. If we now undo one change back to 1, T-O-O, and then change 1 to me, we create a branch in the undo tree. So we start with 1, and then we have change 1. And now we have one T-O-O. -O. Now there's two branches in our tree. Change two takes us to one T-W-O, and the other branch is change three to me too. You can use the U command to undo. If you do this quite twice, you get to the one. Use control R to redo, and you will go to one, two. One more control R, and we'll take you to me too. So that's the second branch that we were talking about. Thus, undo and redo go up and down in the tree using the branch that was last used. What matters here is the order in which the changes are made. Undo and redo are not considered changes in this context. After each change, you have a new state of the text. Note that only changes, note that only the changes are numbered. The text shown in the tree above has no identifier. They are mostly referred to by the number of changes above it but sometimes by the number of one of the changes below it, especially when moving up in the tree so that you know which change was just undone. <clears throat> Chapter 23, Part 3, Jumping Around the Tree. So, how do you get to 1 TWO now? You can use this command, colon undo, Two. The text is now 1 TWO. You are below change 2. You can use the undo command to jump to below any changes in the tree. So we can now change 1 to not. So we've moved from 1 TWO to not TWO. Now you change your mind and want to go back to me too. Use the key G minus command. This moves back in time. Thus, it doesn't walk the tree upwards or downwards, but goes to a change made before. You can repeat G minus, and you will see the text change from me too to one TWO to one TOO to one. And use G plus to move forward in time to one, one TOO, one TWO, me too, and not too. Using undo is useful if you know exactly what change you want to jump to. G minus and G plus are useful if you don't know exactly what the change number is. You can type a count before G minus and G plus to repeat them. Chapter 32, part four, time traveling. When you've been working on text for a while, the tree grows to become big. Then you may want to go to the text of some minutes ago. To see what branches there are in the undo tree, use this command, colon, undo list. <clears throat> and you'll have number, changes, and time. Here you can see the number of the leaves in the branch and when the change was made. Assuming we're below change 4 at not TWO, you can go back 10 seconds with this command, colon earlier 10S. Depending on how much time you took for the changes, you end up at a certain position in the tree. The earlier command can also use M for minutes, H for hours, and D for days. To go all the way back, use a big number, earlier 100D for 100 days. 
To travel forward in time again, use the later command, later 1m. The arguments are s, m, and h, just like earlier. If you want even more details or want to manipulate the information, you can use the undo tree function. To see what it returns, run echo undo tree. <clears throat> Chapter 40. Make new commands. Vim is an extensible editor. You can take a sequence of commands you use often and turn it into a new command, or redefine an existing command. Auto commands make it possible to execute commands automatically. Chapter 40, Part 1. Key mapping. A simple mapping was explained in section Chapter 5, Part 3. The principle is that one sequence of keystrokes is translated into another sequence of keystrokes. This is a simple yet powerful mechanism. The simple form is that one key is mapped to a sequence of keys. Since the function keys except F1 have no predefined meaning in Vim, these are good choices to map. For example, map F2 to go date colon space escape space read bang date enter K and capital J. This shows how three modes are used. After doing the last line with G and O, that opens a new line that starts insert mode. The text date, D-A-T-E colon space, is inserted, and escape takes us out of insert mode. Notice the use of special keys inside of this, left angle bracket and right angle bracket. This is what's called angle bracket notation. You type these as separate characters, not by pressing the key itself. This makes the mapping better, readable, and you can copy and paste the text without problems. The colon character takes vim to the command line, and the colon read bang date command reads the output from the date command and appends it below the current line. The enter is required to execute the read command. At this point of execution, the text should look like date and then some actual date below. Then the kj moves the cursor up and joins the line together. Decide which keys or keys you use for mapping. C, help map which keys. Mapping and modes. The map command redefines remapping for keys in normal mode. You can also define mappings for other modes. For example, colon I map applies to insert mode. You can use it to insert a date below the cursor. For example, I map F2 is enter date colon space escape colon read space bang date enter KJ. It looks a lot like the mapping for F2 in normal mode, only the start is different. The F2 mapping for normal mode is still there. Thus, you can map the same key differently for each mode. Notice that, although this mapping starts in insert mode, it ends in normal mode. If you want it to continue in insert mode, append an A to the mapping. Here is an overview of map commands and in which mode they work. Map is for normal, visual, and operator pending. VMAP is visual, and map is normal. OMAP is operator pending. Map bang is insert and command line. IMAP is insert, and CMAP is command line. Operator pending mode is when you've typed an operator character, such as D or Y, and you are expected to type the motion command or a text object. Thus, when you type DW, the W is entered in operator pending mode. Suppose that you want to define F7 so that the command DF7 deletes a capital C program block, as in a C program block, text enclosed in curly braces. Similarly, YF7 would yank the program block into the unnamed register. Therefore, what you need to do is define F7 to select the current program block. You can do this with the following command, OMAP F7 A curly brace. <clears throat> This causes F7 to perform a select block, A, curly brace, in an operator pending mode, just like you typed it. This mapping is useful if typing a curly brace on your keyboard is difficult. Listing mappings. To see the currently defined map, use map without arguments. 
or one of the variants that would include the mode in which they work. The output might look like a key and then what it's mapped to. The first column in the list shows in which mode the mapping is effective. This is N for normal mode, I for insert mode, etc. A blank is used for a mapping defined with map, thus effective in normal and visual modes. One useful purpose of listing the mapping is to check if special keys in angle brackets form have been recognized. This only works when color is supported. For example, when escape is displayed, displayed in color, it stands for the escape characters. When it has the same color as other text, it is the literal five characters. <clears throat> Remapping. The result of a mapping is inspected for other mappings in it. For example, the mappings of F2 above could be shortened to map F2, capital G, F3, or I map F2, escape F3, and map F3, O date, colon, escape, read, bang date, enter, KJ. For normal mode, F2 is mapped to go to the last line and then behave like F3 was pressed. In insert mode, F2 stops insert mode with escape and then also uses F3. And then F3 is mapped to do the actual work. Suppose you hardly ever use X mode and you want to use the capital Q command to format text. This was so in old versions of Vim. This mapping will do it. Map capital Q to GQ. But in rare cases, you want to use X mode anyways. Let's map G capital Q to Q so that you can still go to X mode with map G capital Q, Q. What happens now is that when you type GQ, it's mapped to Q. So far, so good. But then Q is remapped to GQ. Thus typing GQ results capital, thus typing G capital Q results in GQ and you don't get to X mode at all. To avoid keys being remapped again, use the no remap command. So no remap G capital Q, Q. Now Vim knows that Q is not to be inspected for mappings that apply to it. There are similar commands for every mode. No remap, V no remap, N no remap, O no remap, no remap, bang, I no remap, and C no remap. Recursive mappings. When a mapping tri triggers itself, it will run forever. This can be used to repeat an action in unlimited amount of times. For example, if you have a list of files that contain a version number in the first line, you edit those files with vim star.txt. You're now editing the first file. You could define this mapping. Colon map, comma, comma, with the command colon s slash 5.1 slash 5.2, enter, colon w next, enter, comma, comma. So now you type comma, comma. This triggers the mapping. It replaces 5.1 with 5.2 on the first line. And then it does a W next to write the file and edit the next one. The mapping ends in comma comma. This triggers the same mapping again, thus doing the substitution, etc. This continues until there is an error. Error. In this case, it, it could be a file where the substitute command doesn't find a match for 5.1. You can then make a change to insert 5.1 and continue by typing comma comma again. Or the W next fails because you're in the last file in the list. When a mapping runs into an error halfway, the rest of the mapping is discarded. Control C interrupts the mapping and control break on MS Windows. <clears throat> Delete a mapping. To remove a mapping, use the unmap command. Again, the unmapping applies to the modes depending on the, which command is used. So unmap, V unmap, N unmap, O unmap, unmap bang, I unmap, and C unmap. There is a trick to define a mapping that works in normal and operator pending mode, but not in visual mode. First define it for all three modes, then delete it for visual mode. For example, map control A, you could then do V unmap control A to just delete it for visual mode. Notice that the five characters control A stand for the single key control A. To remove all mappings, use the map clear. You can guess the variations for different modes by now. Be careful for this command. It cannot be undone. Special characters. The map command can be followed by another command. A bar character separates the two commands. This also means that a bar character can't be used inside a map command. To include one, use left, bra left angle bracket bar right angle bracket, the five characters. For example, map F8 to right bar bang check in percent colon S enter. The same problem applies to unmap command. 
with the addition that you have to watch out for trailing white spaces. These two commands are different where you unmap space bar on map B versus unmap A bar on map B. The first command tries to unmap A space with a trailing space. When using a space inside a mapping, use left angle bracket space right angle bracket, the seven characters. This makes the space bar move a blank separated word. It's not possible to put a comment directly after a mapping because the double quote character is considered to be part of the mapping. You can use bar double quote. This starts a new empty command with a comment. For example, map space capital W bar, and then you could put a comment double quote, use spacebar to move forward a word. Mappings and abbreviations. Abbreviations are a lot like insert mode mappings. The arguments are handled in the same way. The main difference is the way they are triggered. An abbreviation is triggered by typing a non-word character after the word. A mapping is triggered when typing the last character. Another difference is that the characters you type for an abbreviation are inserted in the text while you type them. When the abbreviation is triggered, these characters are deleted and replaced by what the abbreviation produces. When typing the characters for a mapping, nothing is inserted until you type the last character that triggers it. If the show command is set, the typed characters are displayed in the last line of the Vim window. An exception is when a mapping is ambiguous. Suppose you have done two mappings, I map AA to foo and I map AAA to bar. Now when you type AA, Vim doesn't know if it should apply the first or the second mapping. It waits for another character be, to be typed. If it's an A, the second mapping is applied and the results in bar. If it's a space, for example, the first mapping is applied, resulting in foo, and then a space is inserted. <clears throat> Additionally, the script keyword can be used to make a mapping local to a script. See help map dash script. The buffer keyword can be used to make a mapping local to a specific buffer. See help map buffer. The unique keyword can be used to make defining a new mapping fail when it already exists. Otherwise, a new mapping simply overwrites the old one. See help map unique. And to make a key do nothing, you can map it to left angle bracket and OP, right angle bracket for no op. This will make the F7 key do nothing at all. For example, map F7 no op. There must be no space after no op. <clears throat> Chapter 40, part two. Defining command line commands. The Vim editor enables you to define your own commands. You execute these commands just like any other command line mode command. To define a command, use the command command as follows, colon command, delete first, one delete. Now when you execute the man, command, colon delete first, Vim executes colon one delete, which deletes the first line. Note, user defined commands must start with a capital letter. You cannot use colon next. The underscore cannot be used. You can use digits, but this is encouraged. Discouraged. To list the user defined commands, execute the following command colon command. Just like with the built in commands, the user defined commands can be abbreviated. You need to type just enough to be able to distinguish the command from another. Command line completion can be used to get the full name. Number of arguments. User-defined commands can take a series of arguments. The number of arguments must be specified by the dash nargs or nargs option. For instance, the example delete first command takes no arguments. So you could have defined it as command dash nargs equals zero, delete first, one delete. However, because zero arguments is the default, you do not need to add dash nargs equals zero. The other values of dash nargs are as follows. Dash nargs equals zero is no, dash argument nargs equals one is one argument, dash nargs equals star is any number of arguments, dash nargs equals question mark is zero or one arguments, and dash nargs equals plus is one or more arguments. <clears throat> Using the arguments. Inside the command definition, the arguments are represented by the args keyword. For example, command dash nargs equals plus, say, colon echo, space, quote, and then left angle bracket args, right angle bracket args, double quote. So when you type, say, hello world, Vim echoes hello world. However, if you add a double quote, it won't work. For example, say, he said hello. To use special characters turned into a string, you need to properly escape them to use as an expression. So for that, you would use use q-args. 
So commands dash args equals plus say colon echo with q dash args instead of a quoted args. Now the say command will result in the following to be executed. Echo quote he said escaped quote hello escaped quote quote. The f args keyword contains the same information as the args keyword, except in a format suitable for use as a function call argument. For example, command dash args equals star do it is call a function with f args as the argument. So if we passed do it a b c, it would actually call a function with quoted a comma quoted b comma quoted c. Line range. Some commands take a range as their argument. To tell them that you are defining such a command, you need to specify a dash range option. The values for this option are as follows. Dash range. Range is allowed. Default is the current line. Dash range equals percent. Range is allowed. Default is the whole file. Dash range equals count. Range is allowed. The last number in it is used as a single number whose default is count. When a range is specified, the keywords line 1 and line 2 get the values of the first and last line in the range. For example, the following command defines the save it command, which writes out the specified range to the file save file. So command dash range equals percent, save it with colon line 1 comma line 2, write, bang, save file. Other options. Some of the other options and keywords are as follows. Count equals number. The command can take a count whose default is number. The resulting count can be used through the count keyword. Dash bang. You can use a bang. If present, using bang will result in a bang. Register. You can specify a register. The default is the unnamed register. The register specification is available as reg, aka register. Complete equals type. Type of command line completion used. See command completion for the list of possible values. Dash bar. The command can be followed by a bar and another command or double quotes and a comment. Dash buffer. The command is only available for the current buffer. Finally, you have the angle bracket LT right angle bracket keyword. It stands for the character left angle bracket. Use this to escape the special meaning of the angle bracket items mentioned. Redefining and deleting. To redefine the same command, use the bang argument. So command will allow you to create a command, but you need to use command bang to redefine it. To delete a user command, use del command. It takes a single argument, which is the name of the command. For example, del command save it. To delete all the user commands, do colon command clear. Careful, this can't be undone. More details about all this in the reference manual, Help User Commands. Chapter 40, Part 3, Auto Commands. An auto command is a command that can be executed automatically in response to some event, such as a file being read or written or a buffer change. Though the, through the use of auto commands, you can train Vim to edit compressed files, for example. That's used in the gzip plugin. Auto commands are very powerful. Use them with care and they will help you avoid typing many commands. Use them carelessly and they will cause a lot of trouble. Suppose you want to replace a date, date stamp at the end of a file every time it's written. First, you define a function. Function date insert, where you dollar sign delete and then read bang date end function. You want this function to be called each time just before a buffer is written to a file. This will make that happen. Auto command buff write pre star call date insert. Buff write pre is the event for which this auto command is triggered just before or pre writing a buffer to a file. The star is a pattern to match with the file name. In this case it matches all files. With this command enabled, when you do a colon write, Vim checks for any matching buff write pre auto commands and executes them, and then it performs the write. The general form of the colon auto command command is as follows. You have auto command, an optional group, a list of events, a file pattern, optionally plus plus nested, and command. The group name is optional. It's used in managing and calling commands, more on this later. The events parameter is a list of events, comma separated, that trigger the command. 
The file pattern is a file name, usually with wildcards. For example, using star.txt makes the auto command to be used for all files whose name ends in star.txt. The optional plus plus nested flag allows for nesting of auto commands, see below. And finally, the command is the actual command to be executed. When adding an auto command that already when adding an auto command, the already existing ones remain. To avoid adding the auto command several times, you should use this form. I'll group update date with auto command bang and auto command buff right star call date insert I'll group end. This will delete any previously defined auto command with the auto command bang before defining the new one. Groups are explained later. Events. One of the most useful events is buff read post. It's triggered after a new file is being edited. It's commonly used to set option values. For example, you know that star.gsm files are GNU assembly language. To get the syntax file right, define this auto command. Auto command, buff read post, star.gsm, set file type equals ASM. If Vim is able to detect the type of file, it will set the file type option for you. This triggers the file type event using this to do something when a certain type of file is edited. For example, to load a list of abbreviations for text files, auto command, file type text, source, dot config nvim abbreviates dot vim. <clears throat> when starting to edit a new file, you can make vim insert a skeleton. Auto command buff new file star dot c or h zero read tilde skeletons slash scale dot c. See auto command dot events for a complete list of events. Patterns. The file pattern argument can actually be a comma separated list of file patterns. For example, star dot C comma star dot H matches file endings in dot C and dot H. The usual file wildcards can be used. Here's a summary of the most often used ones. Star match any character any number of times. Question mark match any character once left bracket abc right bracket match any character a b or c dot matches a dot and a with a tilde b comma c tilde matches a b and a c when the pattern includes a slash vim will compare directory names without the slash only the last part of the file name is used for example star.txt matches slash home slash biop slash readme.txt the pattern slash home slash biop slash star would also match it, but home slash foo slash star dot txt would not. When including a slash, vim matches the pattern against both the full path of the file, home slash biop slash readme dot txt, and the relative path, biop slash readme dot txt. Note, when working on a system that uses backslash as file separator, such as MS Windows, you still use forward slash and auto commands. This makes it easier to write the pattern since a backslash has a special meaning. It also makes the auto commands portable. To delete an auto command, use the same command as what it was defined with, but leave out the command at the end for, and use a bang. So for example, auto command bang file write pre star, that will delete all auto commands for the file write pre event that use the pattern. Listing. To list all the currently defined auto commands, use colon auto command. The list can be very long, especially when file type detection is used. To list only part of the command, specify the group, event, and or pattern. For example, to list all buff new file commands, do auto command buff new file. To list all commands for the pattern star.c, do auto command star star.c. Using star for the event will list all the events. To list all auto commands for the C programs group, do colon auto command C programs. The group item, used when defining an auto command, groups related auto commands together. This can be used to delete all the auto commands in a certain group. For example, when defining several auto commands for a certain group, use the colon I'll group command. For example, let's define auto commands for C programs. I'll groups C programs. Auto command buff read post star dot C comma star dot C set shift width is four soft tab stop equals four auto command buff read post star dot cpp set sw equals three sts equals three i'll group end this will do the same as auto command c programs buff read post etc to delete all auto commands in the c programs group do auto command bang c programs <clears throat> nesting 
Generally, commands executed as the result of an auto command will not trigger any new events. If you read a file in response to a file change shell event, it will not trigger the auto commands that would set the syntax, for example. To make the events triggered, add the plus plus nested flag. So, auto command, file change shell, star, plus plus nested, edit. Executing auto commands. Is it, it is possible to trigger an auto command by pretending an event has occurred. This is useful to have one auto command trigger another one. For example, auto command buff read post star dot new, the command will be execute quote do auto command buff read post dot expand a file colon r. This defines an auto command that is triggered when a new file has been edited. The file name must end in dot new. The execute command uses expression evaluation to form a new command and execute it. When editing the file tryout.c.new, the executed command will be do auto command buff read post tryout.c. The expand function takes the a file argument, which stands for the file that the auto command was executed for, and takes the root of the file name with colon r. Do auto command expands or executes on the current buffer. The do auto all command works like do auto command, except it executes on all buffers. Using normal commands. The commands executed by an auto command are command line commands. If you want to use a normal mode command, the colon normal command must be used. For example, auto command buff read post star dot log normal capital G. This will make the cursor jump to the last line of any log files when you start to edit it. Using the normal command is a bit tricky. First of all, make sure its argument is a complete command, including all the arguments. When you use I to go to insert mode, there must also be an escape to leave insert mode again. If you use slash to start a search pattern, there must be an enter to execute it. The normal command uses all the text after it as commands. Thus, there can be no bar and another command following. To work around this, put normal command inside an execute command. This also makes it possible to pass unprintable characters in a convenient way. For example, auto command buff read post star.chg and execute a normal o new entry colon with an escape and then one read bang date. This also shows the use of a backslash to break a long line command into multiple lines. This can be used in Vim scripts, but not at the command line. When you want the auto command to do something complicated, which involves jumping around in the file and then returning to the original destination, you may want to restore the view on the file. See help restore position for an example. Ignoring events. At times you will not want to trigger an auto command. The event ignore option contains a list of events that will be totally ignored. For example, the following causes events for leaving and entering a window to be ignored. Sent event ignore equals win enter comma win leave. To ignore all events, use the following command, set event ignore equals all. To set it back to the normal behavior, make event ignore empty. So set event ignore equals. Chapter 41, write a Vim script. The Vim script language is used for the startup VimRC file, syntax files, and many other things. This chapter explains the items that can be used in a Vim script. There are a lot of them. Thus, this is a long chapter. Chapter 41, Part 1, Introduction. Your first experience with Vim scripts is the VimRC file. Vim reads it when it starts up and executes the command. You can set options to values you prefer, and you can use any colon command in it, commands that start with colon. These are sometimes referred to as X commands or command line commands. Syntax files are also Vim scripts, as are files that set options for a specific file type. A complicated macro can be defined by a separate Vim script file. You can think of other uses for yourself. If you're familiar with Python, you can find a comparison between Python and Vim at the following link in the documentation, or JavaScript as well with the other docu documentation. We'll start with a simple example. Let i equals 1, while i less than 5, echo count is i, let i plus equals 1, and while. Note, the colon characters are not really needed here. You only need to use them when you type a command. In a Vim script file, they can be left out. We'll use them here anyway to make clear these are colon commands and make them stand out from normal mode commands. You can try out the examples by yanking the lines from the text here and executing with them with colon at. The output of the example code is count is 1, count is 2, count is 3, count is 4. 
In the first line, the let command assigns a value to a variable. The generic form is let variable equals expression. In this case, the variable name is i and the expression is a simple value, the number 1. And the while command starts a loop. The generic form is while, condition, new line, statements, new line, end while. The statements until the matching end while are executed for as long as the condition is true. The condition used here is i less than 5. This is true when the variable i is smaller than 5. Note, if you happen to write a while loop that keeps on running, you can interrupt it by pressing Ctrl+C. c The echo command prints its arguments. In this case, the string count is and the value of the variable is i. Since i is 1, this will print count is 1. Then there is let i plus equals 1 command. This does the same thing as let i equals i plus 1, and this adds 1 to the variable i and assigns the new, valuable, va new value to the same variable. The example was given to explain the commands, but what you'd really want to do is make a for loop. So it can be written much more compactly. For i in range 1 to 4, echo count is i and 4. We won't explain how for and range work until later. Follow the links if you're impatient. There are four kind of numbers. Numbers can be decimal, hex, octal, or binary. A hex number starts with 0x or 0 capital X. For example, 0x1f is decimal 31. An octal number starts with 0o or 0 capital O or a 0 in another digit. 0o17 is the decimal number 15. A binary number starts with 0b or 0 capital B. For example, 0b101 is decimal 5. A decimal number is just digits. Careful, don't put a zero before a decimal number. It will be interpreted as an octal number. The echo command always prints decimal numbers. For example, echo 0x7f will print 127. The number is made negative with a minus sign. This also works for hex, octal, and binary numbers. A minus sign is also used for subtraction. Compare this with the previous example, where now you have two numbers with a minus inside and they get subtracted. White space in expression is ignored. However, it's recommended to use it for separating items to make the expression easier to read. For example, to avoid the confusion between a negative number above, put a space between the minus sign and the following numbers. So you'd have echo 0x7f minus 0036. Chapter 41, part two, variables. A variable name consists of ASCII letters, digits, and the underscore. It cannot start with a digit. So for example, counter, underscore, AAP, very long name, func length, and length. Invalid names are foo.bar and six var. Le these variables are global. To see a list of currently defined variables, use this command, colon let. You can use global variables everywhere. This also means that when the variable count is used in one script file, it might also be used in another file. This leads to confusion at least, and real problems at worst. To avoid this, you can make a variable local to a script file by prepending s colon. For example, one script contains this code, let s colon count equals 1, while s colon count less than 5, source other dot vim, let s count plus equals 1, and while. Since s colon count is local to this script, we can be sure that no, we can sure that sourcing other dot vim script will not change this variable. If other vim also uses an s count variable, it will be a different copy local to that script. More about script local variables here in help script variable. There are more kinds of variables. See internal variables. The most often ones are B, W, G, and V for buffer, window, global, and vim, respectively. Deleting variables. Variables take up memory and show up in the output of the let command. To delete a variable, use the unlet command. For example, unlet s count. This deletes the script local variable s count to free up the memory it uses. If you are not sure if the variable exists and don't want an error, append bang, so unlet bang s count. When a script has been processed to the end, the local variables declared there will not be deleted. Functions defined in the script can use them. For example, if bang exists, s call count, let s call count equal zero, and if, and then we can use s call count later. The exists function checks if a variable has already been defined. Its argument is the name of the variable you want to check not the variable itself. If you were to do if exists s colon call count without quotes, the value of s call count will be used as the name of the variable that exists checks. That is not what you want. The exclamation mark bang negates a value. When the value is true, it becomes false, and when it was false, it becomes true. You can read it as not. Thus, if not exists can be read if if not exists. What Vim calls true is anything that's not zero. Zero is false. Vim automatically converts a string to a number when it's looking for a number. And using a string that doesn't start with a digit, the resulting number is zero. Thus, look out for this. If true, the true will be interpreted as zero, thus as false.
<clears throat> string variables and constants. So far only numbers were used for the variable value. Strings can be used as well. Numbers and strings are the basic types of variables that Vim supports. Their type is dynamic. It is set each time when assigning a value to the variable with let. To assign a string value to a variable, you need to use a string constant. There are two types of these. First, the string in double quotes. If you want to include a double quote inside the string, put a backslash in front of it. And to avoid the need for a backslash, you can use a string in single quotes. So single quote and then double quote Peter, double quote, single quote Peter will have double quotes as part of the string. Inside a single quote string, all the characters are as they are. Only the single quote itself is special. You need to use two to get one. A backslash is taken literally, thus you can't use it to change the meaning of the character after it. In double quote strings, it is possible to use special characters. Here are a few useful ones. Backslash T, backslash N, backslash R, backslash E, backslash B, backslash quote, backslash backslash, backslash escape, and backslash control W, as you'd expect for each. The last two are just examples. The backslash, angle brackets name, angle bracket can be used to include the special key name. See help extra quote for the full list of items in a string. <clears throat> Chapter 41, part three, expressions. Vim has a rich yet simple way to handle expressions. You can read the definition here with help expression syntax. Here we will show the most common items. The numbers, strings, and variables mentioned above are expressions by themselves. Thus, everywhere an expression is expected, you can use a number, string, or variable. Other basic items and expressions are dollar sign names for environment variables, ampersand names for options, and at are for register names. Examples are you can use the value of tab stop is ampersand ts, or dollar sign home, or at a to get the result of a register. Ampersand name Ford can be used to save an option value, set it to a new value, and do something to restore the old value. For example, let save underscore IC equals ampersand IC. Set no IC, slash the start, slash comma delete, and then let ampersand IC equals save IC. This makes sure that the start pattern is used with ignore case option off. Still, it keeps the value that the user had set. Another way to do this would be to add the slash capital C to the pattern. Mathematics, or maths, if you will. It becomes more interesting if we combine these basic items. Let's start with mathematics on numbers. A plus B, A minus B, A star B, A slash B, and A percent B are all add, subtract, multiply, divide, and modulo as expected. The usual precedence is used. For example, echo 10 plus 5 times 2 is 20. Grouping is done with parentheses, no surprise here. And strings can be concatenated with dot dot. C, help, X for 6. When the echo command gets multiple arguments, it separates them with a space. In the example, uh, the argument is a single expression, thus no space is ins inserted. Borrowed from the C language is also the conditional expression A question mark B colon C. If A evaluates to true, B is used, otherwise C is used. For example, let I equals four and echo I greater than five question mark I is big colon I is small, we get I is small. The three parts of the constructs are always evaluated first, thus you could see it work as a group of A, question mark, a group of B, colon, a group of C. Chapter 41, part 4, conditionals. The if command executes the following statements until the matching end if only when a condition is met. The generic form is if condition, new line statements, new line end if. Only when the expression condition evaluates to true or non-zero will the statements be executed. These must still be valid commands. If they contain garbage, Vim won't be able to find the end if. You can also use else. The generic form for this is if condition statements else statements end if. And the second statement is only executed if the first one isn't. Finally, there's also else if. This just likes working else and if, but without the need for an extra end if. A useful example for your VimRC file is checking the term option and doing something depending on its value. So if ampersand term is x term, you could do something for x term, etc. Logic operations. We already used some of them in examples. These are the most often used. A equals equals B, or bang equals, or greater than, or greater than or equal to, or less than, or less than or equal to. The result is one if the condition is met and zero otherwise. The logic operators work both for numbers and strings. When comparing two strings, the mathematical difference is used. This compares byte values, which may not be right for some languages. 
When comparing a string with a number, the string is first converted to a number. This is a bit tricky because when a string doesn't look like a number, the number zero is used. If zero equals equals quote one quote echo yes. This will echo yes because one doesn't look like a number. Thus it's converted to the number zero. For strings, there are two more items. There's equals tilde for matches with and bang tilde for does not match it with. The left item A is used as a string, and the right item B is used as a pattern, like what's used for searching. Notice the use of a single quoted string for the pattern. This is useful because backslashes would otherwise need to be doubled in double quoted string, and patterns tend to contain many backslashes. The ignore case option is used when comparing strings. When you don't want that, append pound to match case and question to ignore case. Thus, equals equals question mark compares to string to equal, well, <clears throat> Thus equals equals question mark compares two strings to be equal while ignoring case and the bang tilde pound checks if a pattern doesn't match also checking the case of letters. For the full table see help expert dash equals equals. More looping. The while command was already mentioned. Two mo more statements can be used in between the while and the end while. Colon continue. Jump back to the start of the while loop. The loop continues or colon break. Jump forward to the end while. The loop is discontinued. Even more looping can be done with the for command. See below in help 48, 41.8. Chapter, chapter 41, part 5. Executing an expression. So far, the commands in the script were executed by Vim directly. The execute commands allows executing the result of an expression. This is a very powerful way to build commands and execute them. An example is to jump to a tag name which is contained in a variable. For example, execute quote tag space quote dot dot tag name. The dot dot is used to concatenate the string tag with the value of variable tag name. Suppose tag name has the value get command. Then the command that will be executed is tag get command. The execute command can only execute colon commands. The normal command executes normal mode commands. However, its argument is not an expression but the literal command characters. For example, normal gg equals capital G. This jumps to the first line and formats all lines with the equal operator. To make normal work with an expression, we must combine execute with it. So execute normal dot dot normal commands. The variable normal commands must contain the normal mode commands. Make sure that the argument for normal is a complete command. Otherwise, Vim will run into the end of the argument and abort the command. For example, if you stay in insert mode, you must leave insert mode as well. This works execute normal capital I new text and then escape and this insert new line in the current line. Notice the use of the special key backslash escape. This avoids having to enter a real escape character in your script. If you don't want to execute a string but evaluate to get its expression value, you can use the eval function. Let opname equals path the string and let optval equals e eval with an ampersand dotted to opname. The ampersand character is prepended to path, thus the argument to eval is ampersand path. The result will then be the value of the path option. <clears throat> the same thing can be done with let opval equals ampersand, concatenate with opname, and then execute that line. Chapter 41, part 6. <clears throat> Vim defines many functions and provides a large amount of functionality that way. A few examples will be given in this section, but you can find the whole list below in help function list. A function is called with the call command. The parameters are passed in between parentheses separated by command by commas. For example, call search quote date quote comma quote w quote parentheses. This calls the search function with the arguments the string of date and the string w. The search function uses its first argument as a search pattern, and the second one is flags. The w flag means the search doesn't wrap around the end of the file. A function can be called in an expression. For example, let line equals get line of dot or let REPL is substitute line and we're able to do that as well as call set line. The get line function obtains a line from the current buffer. Its argument is a specification of the line number. In this case, dot is used, which means the line where the cursor is. The substitute function does similar to what the substitute command does. The first argument is the string on which to perform the substitution. The second argument is the pattern. The third, the replacement string. And finally, the last arguments are the flags. The setLine function sets the line, specified by the first argument, to a new string, the second argument. In this example, the line under the cursor is replaced with the result of the substitute. Thus, the effect of the three statements is equal to substitute backslash a slash star g. 
Using the functions becomes interesting when you do more work before and after the substitute call. Functions. The function list. There are many functions. We'll mention them here grouped by what they are used for. You can find an alphabetical list here for built-in function details. Use control right bracket on the function name to jump to the detailed help for it. A fun note. Editor's note. vim.fn dot is the prefix for using any of these functions, which we will still read. String manipulation. NR to char, get a character by its number value. List to stir, get a character string from a list of numbers. Char to NR, get number value of a character. Stir to list, get list of numbers from a string. Stir to number, convert a, num convert a string to a number. Stir to float, convert a string to a float. Print F, format a string according to percent items. Escape, escape characters in a string with a backslash. Shell escape, escape a string for use with a shell command. F name escape. Escape a file name for use with a vim command. TR. Translate characters from one set to another. Stir trans. Translate a string to make it printable. Key trans. Translate internal key codes to a form that can be used by map. To lower. Turn a string to lowercase. To upper. Turn a string to upper. Char class. Class of a character. Match. Position where a pattern matches in a string. Match buff line. All the matches of a pattern in a buffer. Match end. Position where a pattern match ends in a string. Match fuzzy. Fuzzy matches a string in a list of strings. F match fuzzy pos. Fuzzy matches a string in a list of strings. Match stir. Match of a pattern in a string. Match stir list. All the matches of a pattern in a list of strings. Match stir pos. Match in positions of a position in a string. Match list. Like match stir and also return submatches. Stir idx. First index of a short string in a long string. Stir r idx. Last index of a short string in a long string. Stir len. Length of a string in bytes. Stir char len, length of a string in characters. Stir chars, number of characters in a string. Stir UTF-16 len, number of UTF-16 code points in a string. Stir width, size of a string when displayed. Stir display width, size of a string when displayed. Deals with tabs. Set cell widths, set character cells with overrides. Get cell widths, get character cell width overrides. <coughs> Reverse, reverse the order of characters in a string. Substitute, substitute a pattern match with a string. Submatch, get a specific match in colon s and substitute stir part get part of a string using byte index stir char part get part of a string using char index slice take a slice of a string using char index in vim 9 script stir get char get character from a string using char index expand expand special keywords expand command expand a command like done for edit icon convert text from one encoding to another byte idx byte index of a character in a string byte idx comp like byte idx but count composing characters char idx character index of a byte in a string utf16 idx utfc16 index of a byte in a string repeat repeat a string multiple times eval evaluate a string expression execute execute an x command and get the output win execute like execute but in a specified window trim trim characters from a string get text look up message translation <clears throat> list manipulation Get. Get an item without error for wrong index. Len. Number of items in a list. Empty. Check if a list is empty. Insert. Insert an item somewhere in a list. Add. Append an item to a list. Extend. Append a list to a list. Extend new. Make a new list and append items. Remove. Remove one or more items from a list. Copy. Make a shallow copy of the list. Deep copy. Make a full copy of the list. Filter. Remove selected items from a list. Map. Change each list item. Map new. Make a new list with changed items. For each, apply function to list items. Reduce, reduce a list to a value. Slice, take a slice of a list. Sort, sort a list. Reverse, reverse the order of items in a list. Unique, remove copies of re repeated adjacent items. Split, split a string into a list. <clears throat> join, join list items into a string. Range, return a list with a sequence of numbers. String, string representation of a list. Call, call a function with the list as these arguments. Index, index of a value in a list or blob. Index of. Index in a list or blob where an expression evaluates to true. Max. Maximum value in a list. Min. Minimum value in a list. Count. Count number of times a value appears in a list. Repeat. Repeat a list multiple times. Flatten. Flatten a list. Flatten new. Return a copy of a list. Dictionary manipulation. Get. Get an entry without an error for a wrong key. 
Len, number of entries in a dictionary. Empty, check if a dictionary is empty. Remove, remove an entry from a dictionary. Extend, add entries from one dictionary to another. Extend new, make a new dictionary and append items. <clears throat> Filter, remove selected entries from a dictionary. Map, change each dictionary entry. Map new, make a new dictionary with changed items. For each, apply function to dictionary items. Keys, get list of dictionary keys. Values, get list of dictionary values. Items, get list of dictionary key value pairs. Copy, make a shallow copy of a dictionary. Deep copy, make a full copy of a dictionary. <clears throat> string, string representation of a dictionary. Max, maximum value in a dictionary. Min, minimum value in a dictionary. Count, count number of times a value appears. Floating point functions. Float to NR, convert float to number. Abs, absolute value, round, round off, seal, round up, floor, round down, trunk, remove value after decimal point, F mod, remainder of division, exp, exponential, log, natural log, log 10, log base 10, pow, value of x to the exponent y, square root, square root, sine is sine, cos is cosine, tan is tangent, a sine, arc sine, a cos, arc cosine, a tan, arc tangent, a tan 2, arc tangent, Sine h, hyperbolic sine. Cos h, hyperbolic cosine. Tan h, hyperbolic tangent. Is inf, check for infinity. Is nan, check for not a number. Blob manipulation. Blob to list, get a list of numbers from a blob. List to blob, get a blob from a list of numbers. And reverse, reverse the order of numbers in a blob. Other computation. <clears throat> and, does a bitwise and. Invert, does a bitwise invert. Or, bitwise or xor bitwise xor sha256 sha256 hash rand get a pseudo random number srand initialize seed used by rand variables type get type of a variable is locked check if a variable is locked funk ref get a funk ref for a function reference function get a funk ref for a function name get buff bar gets a variable buffer set buff bar set a variable in a specific buffer get win var get a variable from a specific window, get tab bar, get tab win bar, set win bar, set tab bar, set tab win bar, and garbage collect are all as expected. Cursor and mark position. Call, call number of the cursor or a mark, vert call, screen column, or the cursor or a mark. Line is a line number of the cursor or mark. Win call is the window column number of the cursor. Win line is the window line. Cursor is the position of the cursor. Screen call is the screen column. Screen row is the screen row. Screen pause is the screen row and call. Vert call to call is the byte index of a text character on screen. Get cur pause gets the position. Get pause gets the position of cursor mark, etc. Set pause is set positions of cursor mark, etc. Get mark list is list of global and local marks. Byte to line, get line number at a specific byte count. Line to byte, get byte count at a specific line. Diff filler, get the number of filler lines above a line. Screen adder, get attribute at a screen line row. Screen char, get character code. Screen chars, get character codes. Screen string, get string of characters. Char call, character number at the cursor or mark. Get char pos and set char pos, get and set character position of cursor mark, etc. And get cursor char pos and set cursor char pos, get the character position of the cursor or set. Working with text in the current buffer. Get line and set line, get or set the line in the buffer. Append, appends a line or list of lines in the buffer. Indent, indent of a specific line. C indent, accor indent according to C indenting. Lisp indent, uh, lisp indenting, indent. Next non-blank, finds the next non-blank line. Prev non-blank, does the same. Search, find a match for a pattern. Search pos, find a match for a pattern. Search count, get number of matches. Search pair, find the other end. Search pair pos, find the other end. Search decal, search for the declaration of a name. Get char search, return character search information, and set char search, set character search information. <clears throat> Working with text in another buffer. Get buff line, get buff one line, set buff line, append buff line, and delete buff line. Do each as expected for the specified buffer. System functions. System functions and manipulation of files. Glob and glob path expand wildcards. Glob to reg path convert a glob pattern into a search pattern. Find file find a file in the list of directories. Find dir find a directory. Resolve find out where a shortcut points to. Fname modify is modify a file name. Editor's note very cool path very cool one. Path shorten shorten directory names in a path. 
simplify, simplify a name without changing its meaning, executable, check if it's an executable, xpath, follow path of executable program, file readable, file writable, get fperm, set fperm, get ftype, all check or get the permissions or kind of files as expected, is directory, get f size, checks the files of a size of a file get cwd gets the current working directory has local dir check if the current window has used lcd or tcd temp name get the name of a temporary file make dir change dir delete and rename all do exactly what you expect system get the result of a shell command as a string system list get the result of a shell command as a list environ gets all environment variables get env get one environment variable set env set environment variable host name name of system read file read blob and read dir as long as well as write file write a list of lines or blob into a file date and time get f time get the last modification time of a file local time get current turn time in seconds stir f time convert time to a string stir p time convert a date time string to time rel time Get the current or elapsed time accurately. Rel time stir, convert rel time result to a string. Rel time float, convert rel time result to a float. <clears throat> Buffer, windows, and the argument list. Argc, number of entries in the argument list. Arg id x, arg list id, and arg v, each do expected. Buff add, buff exists, buff listed, buff load, buff loaded, buff name, and buff number, each return information about the buffer. Tab page, buff list, tab page, number, and tab page, win number, return information about a tab page. Win number gets the current window, window number for the current window. Buff win ID, buff win number, and win buff number all get the window ID or buffer ID for its specified items. Win find buff, win get ID, win get type, win go to ID, win ID to tab win, win ID to win, win move separator, win move status line, and win split move all do exactly what you'd expect for the specified window. Get buff info, get tab info, get win info, get change list, get jump list, all get a list of information about buffs, tabs, wins, change list, jump list, as respected. And swap file list, swap info, and swap name, get the list of existing swap files or information about a swap file and the last swap file path of a buffer. For the command line, get command compile type, gets the current type of command line completion command line, get command pos, and get command screen pos are information about where this command line is. Set command line allows you to set the current command line. Set command pos, set position of cursor in the command line. Get command type, get command win type, get completion and full command. Each all get information about the current command line. Quick fix, quick fix and location lists. Get QF list and set QF list. Both get and set quick fix list. Get loc list and set loc list. Do the same, but for the location list. Insert moat completion. Complete, complete add, complete check, and complete info. All do either get, set the found matches, add matches, check matches, or get info about a match. Pum visible checks if the pop up menu is displayed. And pum get pos gets the position and size of the pop up menu if visible. Folding functions fold closed, fold closed end, fold level, fold text, and fold text result get the information about a particular fold. Syntax and highlighting. Clear matches. Clear all matches defined by match add. Get matches gets all of the matches defined by match add. HL exists. Check if a highlight exists. HLID gets an ID. Sin ID gets a syntax ID. Sin ID adder gets a specific attribute. Sin ID trans gets the translated syntax ID. Sin stack gets a list of the syntax IDs at a specific position. Sin concealed gets info about concealing. Diff HLID gets a highlight ID for a diff mode at a position. Then we have match add, match add pos, match arg, and match delete, all for manipulating matches, as well as set matches, which can restore a list of matches saved by get matches. <clears throat> Spelling. Spell bad word locates spell. Badly spelled word at or after cursor. Spell suggest, return suggested spelling suggestions, and sound fold, return the sound alike equivalent of a word. History, hist add, hist delete, hist get, and hist number are all for manipulating the history list. Interactive is browse, browse dir, confirm, as all mentioned in the GUI section, get char, get char mod, get mouse pos, all get those items. Feed keys puts characters in the type ahead queue. Input, get a line from the user. Input list, 
let the user pick an entry from a list, input secret, get a line from users without showing it, input dialog, get a line from the user in a dialog, input save, save and clear type ahead, and input restore, restore type ahead. GUI, you won't use that because we don't have it in NeoVim. Vim server, we don't have those either. Window size and position. Win height, win width, win screen pass, win layout, win rest command, win save view, and win rest view all manipulate the window. Mappings and menus. Digraph git, digraph git list, digraph set, and digraph set list all manipulate the digraphs. Has map to, checks if a mapping exists. Map check, check if a matching mapping exists. Map arg, map list, and map set all get or get a list of or restore a mapping. Menu info gets information about a menu item. In wild menu mode, check if the wild mode is active. Signs, we have sign define, sign get defined, sign get placed, sign jump, sign place, sign place list, sign undefined, sign unplaced, and sign unplaced list. Testing. For testing functions, we have assert equal, assert equal file, assert not equal, assert in range, assert match, assert not match, assert false, assert true, assert exception, assert beeps, assert no beep, assert fails, and assert report. For timers, we can create a timer with timer start and then timer pause, timer stop, timer stop all, timer info, and wait. Tags. Tag list, which gets a list of magging, matching tags. Tag files, get a list of the tag files. Get tag stack and set tag stack is for manipulating tag stack. We have a prompt buffer, prompt get prompt, prompt set callback, prompt set interrupt, and prompt set prompt, all for manipulating prompt buffers. Registers, get reg, get reg info, get reg type, set reg, reg executing and reg recording is all for manipulating registers. Context stack is ctx get, ctx pop, ctx push, ctx set, and ctx size. Then there's various other, various other functions. Mode, visual mode, exists, has, change number, did file type, event handler, get pid, get script info, lib call, lib call number, Undo file, undo tree, shift width, word count, Lua eval, Pi3 eval, Pi eval, Pi X eval, Ruby eval, and debug break. Chapter 41, part 7. Defining a function. Vim enables to define your own function. The basic declaration begins as follows. Function name, followed by parenthesis, var1, to etc., a body, and end function. Function names must start with a capital letter. For example, if we made function min and num1, num2, then this tells Vim that the function is named min and it takes two arguments, num1 and num2. The first thing you need to do is check which number is smaller. If a colon num is less than a colon num2, the special prefix a colon tells Vim that the variable is a function argument. Let's assign the variable smaller, the value of the smallest number. If a colon number is less than a num2, let smaller equals a num1, else let smaller equals a num2. The variable smaller is a local variable. Variables used inside a function are local unless prefixed by something like g, a, or s. To access a global variable from inside a function, you must prepend g to it. Thus g today inside a function is used for global variable today. You can now use the return statement to return the smallest number to the user, so you would write return smaller and end function. If user defined function is called in exactly the same way as a built-in function, only the name is different. The min function can be used like echo min of 5 and 8. Only now will the function be executed and the lines be interpreted by vim. If there are mistakes, like using an undefined variable function, you will now get an error message. When defining these functions, these errors are not detected. When a function reads end function or return, it's used without an argument, the function returns zero. To redefine a function that already exists, you must use bang after function. Using a range. The call command can be given a line range. This can have one or two meanings. When a function has been defined with the range keyword, it will take care of the line range itself. The function will be passed to the variables a colon first line and a last line. These will have the line numbers from the range the function was called with. It will be executed once and echo the number of words. The other way to use a line range is by defining a function without the range keyword. And the function will be called once for every line in the range with the cursor in that line. So for example, if you use line quote dot quote and you call it over the range 10 to 15, it will be called six times. Variable numbers of arguments. 
Vim enables you to define functions that have variable numbers of arguments. The following command, for instance, defines a function that must have one argument start and then up to 20 additional arguments. The variable a1 contains the first optional argument, a2 the second, and so on. The a0 contains the number of extra arguments. You can also use the a colon 000. It's the list of all the dot 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 arguments. For more info, see help a colon 000. The function command lists the names and arguments of all user-defined functions. To see what a function does, use its name as the first argument for function. Debugging. The line number is useful for when you get an error message or when debugging. See debug scripts about debugging. You can also use set the verbose option to 12 or higher to see all function calls. Set it to 15 or higher to see every executed line. Deleting a function. To delete the show function, just do del function show. Function references. Sometimes it can be useful to have a variable point to one function or another. You can do it with the function function. It returns the name of a function in a reference. Note that the name of a variable that holds a function reference must still start with a capital, otherwise it could be confused with the name of a built-in function. The way to invoke a function that a variable refers to is with the call function. Its first argument is the function reference, and the second argument is a list with arguments. Function references are most useful in combination with a dictionary, as explained in the next section. Chapter 41, Part 8, Lists and Dictionaries. So far, we've used the most basic types, string and number. Vim also supports two composite types, list and dictionary. A list is an ordered sequence of things. The list can be of any value, thus you can make a list of numbers, a list of lists, and even a list of mixed items. To create a list with three strings, we do let a list equals left bracket AAP, mys, and newt. The list items are enclosed in square brackets and separated by commas. To create an empty list, just use a left bracket and a right bracket. We can add items to a list with the add function. List concatenation is done with a plus. Or if you want to extend a list directly, you can call extend. Notice that using add will have a different effect. Adding a list to another list will just put that as the last item. The second item of add is added as a single item. For loop. One of the nice things you can do with a list is iterate over it. So let a list is some list and for n in a list we can echo each item. This will loop over each element in the list a list assigning to the variable n. The generic form of a for loop is for var name in list expression with some commands and then an end for. To loop a certain number of times, you need a list of specific length. The range function creates one for you. For a in range 3, echo a and 4. Notice that the first item of the list, that range, produces a 0. Thus the last item is 1 less than the length of the list. You can also specify the max value of the stride and even go backwards. A more useful example of looping over the lines in a buffer is for line in get line 1 to 20, and then you can do something inside. A dictionary stores key value pairs. You can quickly look up a value if you know the way. A dictionary is created with curly braces. Let UK to NL, and then we'd have a brace, or curly brace, and then quote one quote colon quote EEN, for example. You can look up words by putting the key in square brackets. So echo, dictionary, left bracket, and then the key and a right bracket. The generic form for de defining a dictionary is left curly brace, key, colon, val value, comma. An empty dictionary is one without any keys. The possibilities with dictionaries are numerous. There are various functions for them as well. For example, you can obtain a list of the keys and loop over them. For key in keys of a dictionary, echo the key. You will notice that the keys are not ordered. You can sort the list to get a specific order, but you can never get back the order in which items are defined. For that, you need to use a list. It stores items in an ordered sequence. Dictionary functions. The items in the dictionary can normally be obtained with an index in square brackets. But a method that does the same without so many punctuation characters would be just dot and then the string key name. This only works for a key that is made of ASCII letters, digits, and the underscore. You can also assign a new variable this way. Let dictionary dot four equals some value. And then, we will, then that will modify the existing dictionary. Now for something special. You can directly define a function and store a reference in the dictionary. Function dictionary dot function name with the arguments, and then you must incur include the keyword dict at the end of the line. And then it's a regular function the rest of the way.
The first special thing you notice is the dict at the end of the function line. This marks the function as being used from a dictionary. The self local variable will then refer to that dictionary. Now let's break up the complicated line, but we're going to skip some of the implementation here because it's irrelevant. Object oriented programming. Now that you can put both values and functions in a dictionary, you can actually use a dictionary like an object. Above we used a dictionary for translating Dutch to English. We might want to do the same for other languages. Let's first make an object, aka a dictionary, that has translate function, but no words to translate. Let translation dictionary equals an empty dict. And then we can do function translation dictionary dot translate line dict return and then this long expression. If you're interested to look at the code, you want to check out user 41. Now we can instantiate a, tra uh, a Dutch translation object by doing UK to NL is copy the translation dictionary. And we can say UK to NL dot words and then add a new dictionary. And then we can echo that dictionary dot translate and run that over. We can make a separate German one by copying the original dictionary and adding a new key of word translations. You can see that the copy function is used to make a copy of the translation dictionary and then the copy is changed to add the words. The original remains the same, of course. Now you can go one step further and you could even choose your preferred translator by combining multiple ideas of if dollar lang for checking the language is DE and you could do this for German, otherwise do it for the Netherlands one. Um, you, you might use a language that isn't supported, so you can overrule the translate function to do nothing by returning the original line um, by copying the original one and returning that as the default. For further reading, see help lists and help dictionaries. Chapter 41, part nine, exceptions. Let's start with an example. Try read templates pascal.temple catch slash e484 colon slash echo sorry, the pascal template file cannot be found and try. The read command will fail if the file does not exist. Instead of generating an error message, this code catches the error and gives the user a nice message. For the commands in between try and end try, errors are turned into exceptions. An exception is a string. In the case of an error, the string contains the error message, and every error message has a number. In this case, the error we catch contains e484 colon. This number is guaranteed to stay the same. The text may change, for example, it, it may be translated. When the read command causes another error, the pattern E484 will not match in it. Thus, the exception will not be caught and result in the usual error message and execution is aborted. You might be tempted to try and not put a pattern in the catch. That would mean all errors are caught, but then you will not see errors that are useful, such as E21 cannot make changes, modify is off. Another useful mechanism is the finally command, where we can try and then finally call delete. So for example, if we made a temp file, we could do a bunch of work on it and then finally call delete on temp. The fil this filters the lines from the cursor until the end of the line through the filter command, but what's important is that this makes sure you don't leave the temporary file behind. More information about exception handling can be found in the reference manual, Help Exceptional Exception Handling. Chapter 41, Part 10, Various Remarks. Here's a summary of items that apply to Vim scripts. They're also mentioned at elsewhere, but form a nice checklist. The end of line characters depend on the system. For Vim scripts, it's recommended to always use the Unix format. Lines are then separated with new line characters. This also works on any other system. This way you can copy your Vim scripts from MS Windows to Unix and they still work. See help source CRNL. To be sure it's set right, do this before writing the file. Set local, file format equals Unix. When using DOS, file format, lines are separated with carriage return and a new line, two characters, and the carriage return character causes various problems. Better avoid this. Whitespace. Blank lines are allowed in a script and ignore. Leading whitespace characters, blank and tabs are ignored except when using let here docs without trim. Trailing, character, trailing whitespace is often ignored but not always. One command that includes it is map. You have to watch out for that. It can cause hard to understand mistakes. A generic solution is to never use trailing whitespaces unless you really need it. To include a whitespace character in the value of an option, it must be escaped by a backslash, as in the following example. Set tags equals my backslash nice backslash space tab. Er, sorry. Set tags equals my backslash space nice backslash space file. The same example written as set tags equals my space nice space file will cause an issue because it's interpreted as set tags equals my set nice and set file.
Comments. The character double quote, the double quote mark, starts a comment. Everything after and including this character until the end of line is considered a comment and is ignored except for commands that don't consider comments, as shown in the examples below. A comment can start on any character position on the line. There's a little catch with comments on some commands. For example, a brief dev development with a double quote at the end or map F3 O include with a comment at the end or execute command with a double quote at the end or bang ls star dot C with a double quote at the end. The abbreviation will be expanded to include the comment at the end of the line. The mapping F3 will actually be the whole line after the O pound include, including the double quote insert include. The execute command will give an error because that's not a valid command, and the bang command will send everything after it to the shell, causing an error for an unmatched double quote character. There can be no comment after map, abbreviate, execute, or bang commands. <clears throat> There are a few more commands with this restriction. For the map, abbreviate, and execute commands, there is a trick. A brief development with a bar, and then immediately followed by a double quote and the, and the comment. Same for map and execute. With the bar character in the command, it's separated from the first one, and that next command is only a comment. For the last command, you need to do two things, execute and use bar. Notice that there is no white space before the bar in the abbreviation and mappings. For these commands, any character until the end of the line or bar is included. As a consequence of this behavior, you don't always see that trailing white space is included. Map F4 with O pound include with empty space. To spot this problem, you can set the list option when editing vimrc files. For Unix, there is one special way to comment a line that allows making a vim script executable. You can do pound bang slash user bin n vim dash s for the shebang. Echo this is a vim script and then quit. The pound command by itself it lists a line with the line number. Adding an exclamation mark changes it into doing nothing so that you can add the shell command to execute the rest of the file with colon bang pound space dash s. Pitfalls. Even bigger problems arrive in following example map comma a b o pound include unmap comma a b here the unmap command will not work because it tries to unmap comma a b with a hidden space afterwards this does not exist as a map sequence an error will be issued which is very hard to identify because the ending white space character's unmap comma a b space is not visible and this is the same as what happens when you try and use a comment after an unmap here the comment part will be ignored however vim will try to unmap comma a b space 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 which does not exist rewrite it as unmap space comma a b with a bar immediately following and then empty space and your comment restoring the view sometimes you want to make a change and go back to where the cursor was restoring the relative position would also be nice so that the same line appears at the top of the window this example yanks the current line puts it above the first line in the file and then restores the view map comma p does m a which sets the mark at a current position, double quote AY yanks the current line into register A, capital H to move to the top line, and then MB to set a mark there, GG to move to the first line, double quote AP to put the yanked line above it, B to go back to the line, or tick B to go back to the top line and display, ZT to position the text in the window as before, and tick A to go back to the saved cursor position. Packaging. To avoid your function names to interfere with functions that you get from others, use this scheme. Pre Prepend a unique starting string before each function name. I often use an abbreviation. For example, OW underscore is used for option window functions. Put the definition of your functions together in a file. Set a global variable to indicate that the functions have been loaded, and when sourcing the file again, first unload the functions. Chapter 41, Part 11. Writing a Plugin. You can write a Vim script in such a way that many people can use it. This is called a plugin. Vim users can drop your script in their plugin directory and use its features right away. See help add plugin. And there's actually two types of plugins. Global plugins for all types of files and file type plugins only for files of a specific type. In this section, the first type explained. Most items are also relevant for writing file type plugins. The specifics for file type plugins are in the next section, help write file type plugin. The name. First of all, you must choose a name for your plugin. 
The features provided by the plugin should be clear from its name, and it should be unlikely that someone else writes a plugin with the same name, but which does something different. And please limit the name to eight characters to avoid problems on old MS Windows systems. Editor's note, I don't think you need to worry about that. A script that corrects typing mistakes could be called typecore.vim. We will use it as an example. For the plugin to work for everybody, it should follow a few guidelines. This will be explained step by step. The complete example plugin is at the end. Let's start with the body of the plugin. It contains multiple abbreviations, but for example, I abbreviate T-E-H to T-H-E. The actual list would be much longer. The line number should only have been added to explain a few things. Don't put line numbers in your file. Header. You will probably add new corrections to the plugin and soon have several versions laying around. When distributing, people will want to know who wrote this wonderful plugin and where they can send remarks. Therefore, put a header at the top with something like a comment saying what it does, the last time you changed it, and who the maintainer is. About copyright and licensing, since plugins are very useful and it's hardly worth restricting their distribution, please consider making your plugin either public domain or use the Vim license. Line continuation and avoiding side effects. The line continuation mechanism is used in help line continuation. Users with compatible set will run into troubles here. They'll get an error message. And we can't just reset compatible because that has a lot of side effects. To avoid this, we can set the CP options to its Vim default value and restore it later. That will allow people use of line continuation and make the script work for most people. This section is not applicable for NeoVim because we've removed much of the old VI specific items. Not loading. It's possible that a user doesn't always want to load this file, or the system administrator has dropped it in the system-wide plugin directory, but a user has their own plugin they want to use. Then the user must have a chance to disable loading this specific plugin. This will make it possible to do if exists g loaded type core finish and if and then let g loaded type core equals 1. This also avoids when the script is loaded twice, it could cause error messages for redefining functions and cause trouble for auto commands that are added twice. The name is recommended to start with loaded underscore and then the file name of the plugin, literally. The g colon is prepended just to avoid making mistakes when using the variable in a function. Without g, it would be a local variable. Using finish stops vim from reading the rest of the file, and it's much quicker than using an if and if around the whole file. Mapping. Now let's make the plugin more interesting. We'll add a mapping that adds a correction for the word under the cursor. We could just pick a key sequence for this mapping, but the user might already use it for something else. To allow the user to define which keys a mapping in a plugin used, the leader item could be used. So we could do map unique leader A and plug type core add. The plug type core add thing will do a lot of work and we'll, do, we'll have more about that further on. The user can set map leader variable to the key sequence that they want with this mapping to start with. Thus, if the user has done let map leader equals underscore, then the mapping will declare will define with underscore a. If the user didn't do this, the default value will be used, which is a backslash. Then a map for backslash a will be defined. Note the unique is used. This will cause an error message if the mapping is already happens to exist. But if the user wants to define their own key sequence, we can allow that with this mechanism. If not has map to and then plug type core add, then we add our own unique inside of that statement. This checks if a mapping to plug type core add already exists and only defines the mapping for leader A if it doesn't. The user then has the chance of putting this in their vimrc, map, comma C, plug type core add. Then the mapped key will be used in comma C instead of underscore A or backslash A. Pieces. If a script gets longer, you often want to break up the work in pieces. You can use functions or mappings for this, but you don't want these functions and mappings to interfere with the ones from other scripts. For example, you could define a function capital A add, but another script could try to define the same function. To avoid this, we define function locals to the script by prepending with s colon. We will define a function that adds a new typing correction using function s colon add and from and to correct. We use things like input and then add and execute I abrev from a from and to. We can now call the function s colon add from within this script. If another script also defines s colon add, it will be local to that script and can only be called from the script it was defined in. There can also be a global add function without the s colon, which is another function. Left angle bracket SID, SID, right angle bracket can be used with mappings. It generates a script ID which identifies the current script. In our typing correction plugin, we could use it like this. No remap, unique, script, plug type core add, and then SID add. 
This effectively makes it so that when we map plug type core add to calling the SID function. If another script also uses SID add, it will get another script ID and thus define another mapping. Note that instead of s add, we use SID add here. That's because the mapping is typed by the user, thus outside of the script. The SID is translated to the script ID so that Vim knows in which script to look for the add function. This is a bit complicated, but it's required for the plugin to work together with other plugins. The basic rule is that you use SID add in mappings and s add in other places, like the script itself or auto commands and user commands. We can also add a menu entry for the item the same as we do the mapping, which includes doing no remenu, script, plugin.add correction, and SID add. The plugin menu is recommended for adding menu items for plugins. In this case, only one item is needed. When adding more items, creating a submenu is recommended. For example, plugin.cvs can be used for a plugin that offers CVS operations like check in and check out, etc. Note that the no remap is used to avoid that any other mappings cause trouble. Someone may have remapped call, for example. In line 24, we also use no remap, but we do want SID add to be remapped. This is why script is used. This only allows mappings which are local to the script. Map script can be uh, used for more information. The same is done on line 26 for no remenu. SID and plug. Both SID and plug are used to avoid the mappings of typed keys interfering with mappings that are only to be used from other mappings. Note the difference between SID and PLUG. PLUG is visible outside of the script. It's used for mappings which the user might want to map a key sequence to. PLUG is a special key code that a typed key will never produce. To make it very unlikely that other plugins use the same sequence of characters, use this structure. PLUG, script name, map name. In our example, the script name is typecore and the map name is add, so we add a semicolon to the as the terminator. This results in plug typecore add. Only the first character of the script name and map name is uppercase, so that it can be seen where the map name starts. SID is the script ID, a unique identifier for a script. Internally, Vim translates SID to SNR123 underscore, where 123 can be any number. Then a function SID add will really have the name SNR11 underscore add and in one script, snr22 underscore add in another. You can see this if you use the function command to get a list of functions, and the translation of SID and mappings is exactly the same. That's how you call a script local function from a mapping. Now, let's add a user command to add a correction. So if not exists colon correct command, and then we're going to add a command for the same a function that we just referenced. The user command is defined only if no command with the same name already exists. Otherwise, we would get an error here. Overriding the existor user command with colon command is not a good idea. This would probably make the user wonder why the command they define by themselves doesn't work. <clears throat> script variables. When a variable starts with s, it's a script variable. It can only be used inside a script. Outside the script, it's not visible. This avoids trouble with using the same variable name in different scenarios, and the variables will be kept as long as Vim is running. Same variables are used when sourcing the same script again. The fun is that these variables can also be used in functions, auto commands, and user commands that are defined in the scripts. In our example, we could add a few lines to the count for the number of corrections, where when we call our function, s add, we can add a count to the number of abbreviations that we've currently made by doing let s count equals s count plus one. Documentation. It's a good idea to also write some documentation for your plugin, especially when its behavior can be changed by the user. See help add local help for how they are installed. Here's an example for a help plugin help file called typecore.txt. It starts off with star typecore.txt star to create a tag plugin for correcting typing mistakes. And then after that, the plugin, the format doesn't matter. It'll be extracted from the help file to be put in the local edition section of the help.txt local editions. The first star must be in the first column of the first line. After adding your help file, do help and check that the entries line up nicely. You can add more tags inside star star in your help files, but be careful not to use existing help tags. You would probably use the name of your plugin in most of them, like type car dash settings in the example. Using references to other parts of the help in, bang, in two different bars is recommended. This makes it easy for users to find associated help. File type detection. 
If your file type is not already detected by Vim, you should create a file type detection snippet in a separate file. It's usually in the form of an auto command that sets the file type when the file name matches a pattern. For example, I'll buff new file comma buff read star dot foo set file type equals foo foo. Write this single line in ftdetect foofoo.vim in the first directory that appears in runtime path. For Unix, this would be config nvim ftdetect foofoo.vim. The convention is to use the name of the file type for the script name. As a note, we have vim.filetype for NeoVim. Summary. So summary of special things to use in a plugin. S colon name is local variables to a script. Script is a script ID. Has map to can check if the user already has mappings. Leader and value of map leader so that users can define custom mappings. Map unique, so give a warning if a mapping already exists. No remap, use only mappings local to the script, not global remaps, and exists colon command to check if a com command already exists. Chapter 41, part 12, writing a file type plugin. File type plugin is like a global plugin, except that it sets options and defines mapping for the current buffer only. See add file type plugin for how this type of file is used. First, read the section on global plugins above in chapter 41, part 11. All this is said there also applies to file type plugins. There are a few extras which are explained in here. The central thing is that a file type plugin should only have an effect on the current buffer. Disabling. If you're writing a file type plugin to be used by many people, they need a chance to disable loading it. Put this at the top with if exists b did ft plugin finish. This also needs to be used to avoid that the same plugin is executed twice for the same buffer, which happens when using an edit command without arguments. Now users can disable loading this file completely by making a file type plugin with only this one line. Let b colon d did ft plugin equals 1. This does require that the file type plugin directory comes before vim runtime in runtime path. If you do not want to use the default plugin but overrule one of its settings, you can write the different setting in a script, for example, set local text width equals 70. Now put this in the after directory so that it gets sorts after the distributed vim.vim plugin after directory. For Unix, this would be config nvim after fd plugin vim.vim. Note that the default plugin will have set b did fd plugin, so it's ignored here. Options. To make sure the file type plugin only affects the current buffer, use set local command to set options, and only set options which are local to a buffer, see help for the options to check that. When using set local for global options or options local to a window, the value would change for many buffers and that is not what a file type plugin should do. When an option has a value that is a list of flags or items, consider using plus equals and minus equals to keep the existing value. Be aware that the user may have changed an option value already, first resetting to the default value and then changing it is often a good idea. So set local, format options, ampersand, and then format options plus equals RO. To make sure mappings will only work in the current buffer, use map buffer command. This needs to be combined with the two-step mapping explained above, so we can check if not has map to, and then do the same exact idea that we had mentioned. The, the other difference that we might want to do is FT plugins should often use local leader, which allows the user to select keys that they want file type plugin mappings to start with. The default is a backslash. It's recommended to still use unique to give an error message if the mapping already exists or overlaps with an existing mapping. No remap is used to avoid that any other mappings that the user has defined interferes. You might want to use no remap script to allow remapping mappings in this script that start with SID. The user must have a chance to disable the mappings in a file type plugin without disabling everything. Here's an example of how that could be done. We could check if bang exists no plugin maps and exists no mail maps, then we might not add the additional map, then we might not add our additional mappings as options. User commands. To add a user command for a specific file type so it can be only used in one buffer, use the dash buffer command to command. For example, command dash buffer capital make make percent colon r dot s. Variables. A file type plugin will be sourced for each buffer of the type it's for. Local script variables svar will be shared between all invocations. Use local buffer variables bvar if you want a variable specifically for one buffer. 
functions. When defining a function, this only needs to be done once, but the file type plugin will be sourced every time a file with this file type will be opened. This construct makes sure the function is only defined once. If not exists, star s colon func and then define the function within that exists. When the user does set file type xyz, the effect of the previous file type should be undone. Set the b undo ft plugin variable to the commands that will undo the settings in your file type example. Using set local with the left angle bracket after the option names resets the option to its global value. That is mostly the best way to reset the option value. This does require removing the C flag from CP options to allow the command line uh, continuation as mentioned above in use CPO save. For undoing the effect of an indent script, the B undo indent variable should be set accordingly. File name. The file type, na file type must be included in the file name for FD plugin name. Use one of these forms, FD plugin slash stuff dot vim, FD plugin slash stuff underscore foo dot vim, or FD plugin slash stuff slash bar dot vim. Stuff is the file type, foo and bar are arbitrary names. Summary of some special things in file type plugins. Local leader, which is the value of map local leader, which the user defines as the keys that the file type mapping should begin with. Colon map buffer for defining a mapper lo loc to the buffer. No remap script to once again only use remaps or only to remap mappings to find in the script that start with SID. Set local for setting an option to the local buffer. Command dash buffer to define a user command local to the buffer and checking if functions exist. Chapter 41, part 13, writing a compiler. A compiler plugin sets options for use with a specific compiler. The user can load it with the compiler command. The main use is to set error format and make PRG options. Easiest is have a look at examples. So you can do next vim runtime slash compiler slash star.vim and then use next to move to the next plugin file. There are two special items about these files. First is a mechanism to allow a user to overrule or add to the default file. The default files start with if exists current compiler finish and that let comp current compiler equals mine. When you write a compiler file and put it in your personal runtime directory, you set the current compiler variable to make the default file skip the settings. Colon compiler set. The second mechanism is to use set for compiler and set local for compiler. Vim defines the compiler set user command for this. However, older version older Vim versions don't, thus your plugin should define it for them. This is an example where you check if compiler set exists, and then optionally if it doesn't, then you're going to use set local. When you write a compiler command for the Vim distribution or for a system-wide runtime directory, use the mechanism mentioned above. When current compiler was already set by a user plugin, nothing will be done. When you write a compiler plugin to overrule settings from a default plugin, don't check current compiler. This plugin is supposed to be loaded last, thus it should be in a directory at the end of runtime path. For Unix, this could be config and vim after compiler. Chapter 41, part 14, writing a plugin that loads quickly. A plugin may grow and become quite long. The startup delay may become noticeable while you hardly ever use the plugin. Then it's time for a quick load plugin. The basic idea is that the plugin is loaded twice. The first time, user commands and mappings are defined that offer the functionality. And the second time, the functions that implement the functionality are defined. It may sound surprising that quick load means loading a script twice. What we mean is that it loads quickly the first time, postponing the bulk of the script to the second time, which only happens after you actually use it. Note that since Vim 7, there is an alternative and use the auto load functionality, which we're going to skip to um, following shortly. Chapter 41, part 15, writing library scripts. Some functionality will be required in several places. When this becomes more than a few lines, you will want to put in one script and use it for many scripts. We can call that script a library script. Manually loading a library script is possible so long as you avoid loading it when it's already done. You can do this with exists functions, so checking if it doesn't exist and then runtime some library. Here you need to know that mylib function is defined in a script called library mylibraryscript.vim in one of the directories in runtime path. To make this a bit simpler, vim offers the autoload mechanism, which is just the better version of the thing we skipped moments ago. Then the example looks like this call mylib pound my function arg. That's a lot simpler, isn't it? 
Vim will recognize the function name and when it's not defined, search for the script autolog slash mylib.vim in runtime path. The script must define the mylib pound my function function. You can put many other functions in the mylib.vim script. You are free to organize your functions in library scripts, but you must use function names where the part before the pound matches the script name. Otherwise, Vim would not know what script to load. If you get really enthusiastic and write lots of library scripts, you may need to use subdirectories. Example, call netlib pound ftp pound read some file. For Unix, the, the library script used for this could be dot config and vim autoload netlib and then ft dot vim where the function is defined like this function netlib pound ftp pound read f name and then read the file name through ftp notice that the name the function is defined with is exactly the same as the name used for calling the function and the part before the last pound exactly matches the subdirectory and script names you can use the same mech same mechanism for variables, let weekdays equals dutch pound weekdays, and this will load the script auto load slash dutch dot vim, which should contain something like let dutch weekdays equals zondag, mondag, dinstag, wanstag, donderdag, vrijdag, and zeterdag. Chapter 41, part 16, distributing vim scripts. Vim users will look for scripts on the vim website, vim.org. If you made something that's useful for others, share it. Vim scripts can be used on any system. They might not, there might not be a tar or gzip command. If you want to pack files together and or compress them, the zip utility is recommended. Chapter 42. Add new menus. By now you know that Vim is very flexible. This includes the menus used in the GUI. You can define your own men menu entries to make certain commands easily accessible. This is for mouse happy users only. Side note, you can change the pop-up menu in NeoVim with the same strategy. Chapter 42, Part 1, Introduction. The menus that Vim uses are defined in the file vim runtime slash menu dot vim. If you want to write your own menus, you might first want to look through that file. To define a menu item, use the menu command. The basic form of this command is as follows, colon menu, menu item, and keys. The menu item describes where on the menu to put the item. A typical menu item is file.save, which represents the item save under the file menu. A dot is used to separate the names. For example, menu file.save colon update carriage return. The update command writes the file when it's modified. You can add another level. Edit.settings.shift width defines a submenu settings under the edit menu with an item shift width. You could use even deeper levels. Don't do this too much. You need to move the mouse quite a bit to use such an item. The menu command is very similar to the map command. The left side specifies how the item is triggered, and the right hand side defines the characters that are executed. Keys are characters. They're used just like you would have typed them. Thus in insert mode, when keys is plain text, that key is inserted. Accelerators. The ampersand character ampersand is used to indicate an accelerator. For instance, you can use Alt F to select file and S to select save. The win alt keys option may disable this though. Therefore, the menu item looks like ampersand file dot ampersand save. The accelerator characters will be underlined in the menu. You must take care that each key is used only once in each menu. Otherwise, you will not know which of the two will actually be used. Vim doesn't warn you for this. Priorities. The actual definition of the file.save menu is as files. Menu 10.340 ampersand file dot ampersand save tab colon w colon confirm w enter. The number 10.340 is called the priority number. It's used by the editor to decide where it places the menu item. The first item 10 indicates the position on the menu bar. Lowered numbered menus are positioned to the left, higher numbers to the right. These are the priorities used for the standard menu 10, 20, 40, 50, 60, 70, 9999 for file edit, tools, syntax, buffers, window, and help, respectively. Notice that the help menu is given a very high priority to make it appear on the far right. The second number, 340, determines the location of the item within the pull down menu. Lower numbers go on top and higher numbers go on the bottom. These are the priorities in the file menu, starting with 310 for open and ending with 620 for exit. Notice that there is room in between the numbers. This is where you can insert your own items if you really want to. 
it's often better to leave the standard menus alone and add a new menu for your own items. When you create a submenu, you can add another dot number to the priority. Thus, each in menu item has its own priority number. Special characters. The menu item in this example, ampersand file dot ampersand save tab colon w, this brings up an important point. Menu item must be one word. If you do not, if you want to put a dot, space, or tabs in the name, you must either use the angle bracket notation or use backslash to escape. The tab character in a menu name is used to separate the part that defines the menu from the part that gives a hint to the user. The part after the tab is displayed right aligned in the menu. In the file.save menu, the name is used ampersand file dot ampersand save tab colon w. Thus, the file name is file save and the hint is colon w. Separators. The separator lines used to group related menu items can be defined by using a name that starts and ends with dash. For example, dash sep dash. When using several separators, their names must be different. Otherwise, the names don't matter. The command from a separator will never be executed, but you have to define one anyways. A single colon will do. Menu commands. You can define menu items that exist for only certain modes. This works just like the variations of the map command. So menu, n menu, v menu, o menu, menu bang, i menu, c menu, tl menu for terminal menu, a menu for all modes, otherwise they're all the same. To avoid that the commands of a menu can be remapped, use the no re part of the command as well. The a menu command is a bit different. It assumes that the keys you given are to be executed in normal mode. When vim is in visual or insert mode when the menu is used, vim first has to go back to normal mode. A menu inserts a control C or control O for you. For example, if you use this command, A menu, 90.100, mine.find word, and then star, then the resulting commands will look like in normal mode, just a star, in visual and operator pending mode, control C star, and in insert mode and command line mode, control O star. When in command line mode, the control C will abandon the command typed so far. In visual and operator pending mode, control C will stop the mode. The control O in insert mode will execute the command and then return to insert mode. Control O only works for one command. If you need to use two or more commands, put them in a function and call that function. This menu, uh, the SID before the function must be the SID ID if you're loading this from a script. Silent menus. The menu executes the keys as if you typed them. For a colon command, this means you will see the command being echoed on the command line. If it's a long command, the hit enter prompt will appear. That can be very annoying. To avoid this, make the menu silent. This is done with the silent argument. For example, take the call to next file. When you use this menu, you will see this on the command line. Call, SID, next file. To avoid this on the command line, insert silent as the first argument. So A menu silent and then follow with the rest of your command. Don't use silent too often. It's not needed for short commands. If you make a menu for someone else, being able to see the executed command will give them a hint about what they could have typed instead of using the mouse. Listing menus. When a menu command is used without a keys part, it lists the already defined menus. And you can specify a menu item or part of it to list specific menus. For example, colon A menu. That lists all menus. It's a long list. Better specify the name of a menu to get a shorter list. A menu edit. This lists only the edit menus for all modes. To list only one specific menu item for insert mode, do I menu edit dot undo. Take care you type exactly the right name. Case matters here, but even the ampersand for accelerators can be omitted. omitted. The tab and what comes after it can be left out as well. Deleting menus. To delete a menu, the same command is used as for listing, but with menu changed to unmenu. So menu becomes unmenu, and menu becomes an unmenu, etc. To delete tools.make, do i unmenu tools.make. You can delete a whole menu with all its items by using the menu name. For example, a unmenu syntax. This deletes the syntax menu and all the items in it. Chapter 42, part 3. Various. You can change the appearance of the scripts with flags in GUI options. In the default, they're all included except M, capital M. You can remove a flag with a command like set GUI options minus equals M. Lowercase m is when removed, the menu bar is not displayed. Capital M is when added, the default menus are not loaded. 
and G, when removed, the inactive menu items are not made gray but are completely removed. For translating menu items, see Help Menu Trans. Since the mouse has to be used to select a menu item, it's a good idea to use the browse command for selecting a file and confirm to get a dialog instead of an error message, for example, when the current buffer contains changes. These two can be combined. A menu, file.open, is colon browse, confirm, edit, enter. The browse makes a file browser appear to select the files to edit. The confirm will pop up a dialog when the current buffer is changed. You can then select to save the changes, throw them away, or cancel the command. For more complicated items, the confirm and input dialog functions can be used. The default menus contain a few examples. Chapter 42, Part 4, Toolbar and Menus. There are two special menus, Toolbar and Pop-Up. Items that start with these menus do not appear in the normal menu bar. <clears throat> toolbar. The toolbar only appears when the capital T flag is included in the GUI options option. The toolbar uses icons rather than text to represent the command. For example, the toolbar item named toolbar.new causes the new icon to appear in the toolbar. Vim Editor has 28 built-in icons. You can find a table in built-in tools. Most of these are used in the default toolbar. You can redefine what they do after the default menus are set up. You can add another bitmap for a toolbar item or define a new toolbar item with a bitmap. For example, define a new toolbar item with tmenu toolbar.compile compile with the current file. Now you need to create the icon. For MS Windows, it must be in a bitmap format with the name compile.bmp. For Unix, XPM format is used and the file name is compile.xpm. You can define tooltips by reading <laughs> for the items in the, in the toolbar. A toolbar is for a short text that explains what a toolbar item will do. For example, op open file. It appears when the mouse pointer is on the item without moving for a moment. This is very useful if the meaning of the picture isn't very obvious. Example, tmenu toolbar.make run make in the current directory. Note, pay attention to the case use. Toolbar with a capital T and toolbar are very different from tool, capital T, bar, capital B. To remove a cool tooltip, use the T unmenu command. The toolbar option can be used to display the text instead of a bitmap or both text and a bitmap. Most people just use the bitmap since the text takes up quite a bit of space. Pop-up menu. The pop-up menu pops up where the cursor pointer is. On MS Windows, you activate it by clicking the right mouse button. Then you can select an item with the left mouse button. The Unix, on Unix, the pop-up menu is by pressing and holding the right mouse button or just pressing it on NeoVim. The pop-up menu only appears when the mouse model has been set to pop-up or pop-up set pos. The difference between the two is that pop-up set pos moves the cursor to the mouse pointer position. When clicking inside a selection, the selection will be used unmodified. Then there's a selection, but you click outside of it, the selection is removed. There's a separate pop-up menu for each mode, thus there are never gray items like in the normal menus. What is the meaning of life, the universe, and everything? 42. Douglas Adams, the only person who knew what this question really was about is now dead unfortunately now you might wonder what the meaning of death is that's because we're in user 42 just a little easter egg chapter 43 using file types when you're editing a file of a certain type for example a c program or a shell script you often use the same option settings and mappings you quickly get tired of manually setting these each time this chapter explains how to do it automatically Chapter 43, <laughs> Chapter 43, Part 1, Plugins for a File Type. How to start using file type plugins has already been discussed here in Add File Type Plugin. But you probably are not satisfied with the default settings because they've been kept minimal. Suppose that for C files, you want to set the soft tab stop option to 4 and to find a mapping to insert a three-line comment. You can do this with only two steps. Create your own runtime directory. On Unix, this is usually config envim. In this directory, create the ft plugin directory. So make der dash p config envim ft plugin. When you're not on Unix, check the value of the runtime path option to see where vim will look for the ft plugin directory. You would normally use the first directory name before the first comma, but you might want to prepend a directory name to the runtime path option in your init.vim if you don't like the default value. Create the config envim ft plugin c.vim file with the contents set local soft tab stop equals four, no remap buffer local leader c with o slash star 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 enter enter slash and escape, and let undo b undo plugin 
you can undo these options by unmapping and unsetting them. Now try editing a C file. You should notice that the soft tab stop option is set to four, but when you uh, edit another file, it's reset to the default zero. That's because set local command was used. This sets the soft tab stop option only locally to the buffer. As soon as you edit another buffer, it will be set to the value set for that buffer. For a new buffer, it will get the default value or the value from the last set command. Likewise, the mapping for slash C will disappear when editing another buffer. The colon map buffer command creates a mapping that's local to the current buffer. This works with any mapping type, map, bang, vmap, etc. The local leader in the mapping is replaced with the value of the map local leader variable. <clears throat> The line to set B undo FD plugins is for when the file type is set to another value. In that case, you will want to undo your preferences. The B colon undo FT plugin variable is executed as a command. Watch out for characters with a special meaning inside a string, such as a backslash. You can find examples for the file type plugins in this directory, and more details about writing a file type directory can be found in help write plugin. Editor's note, I wouldn't worry about undo FT plugin if you're writing it for yourself. Chapter 43, part two, adding a file type. If you're using a type of file that's not recognized by Vim, this is how to get it recognized. You need a runtime directory on your own. See help your runtime dir above. Create a file type Vim file, which contains an auto command for your file type. Example, I'll group file type detect, I'll buff new file, buff read star.xyz, set f xyz and I'll group end. Editors note again, is that you should use vim.file type instead of this. You can use many different patterns to match the name of the file and directory names can be used. See auto command pattern. For example, the files under user share scripts are all Ruby files, but don't have the expected file name ex expansion. Adding this to the example above, you can add ow buff, buff new file buff read slash user slash share slash script slash star set f Ruby. However, if you now edit a file user share scripts readme.txt, this is not a Ruby file. The danger of a pattern ending in star is that it quickly matches too many files. To avoid trouble with this, put the file type.vim file in another directory, one that's at the end of runtime path. For Unix, for example, you could use config nvim after file type.vim, and you can now put the detection of text files in config nvim file type.vim. <clears throat> The file is found in runtime path first, then use this config and vim after file type dot vim, which is found last. What will happen now is that vim searches for file type dot vim files in each directory in runtime path. First, config and vim file type dot vim is found, and the auto command to catch star dot txt files is defined there. Then vim finds the file type dot vim file in vim runtime, which is halfway runtime path. Finally, Config nvim after file type vim is found, and the auto command for detecting Ruby files in user share scripts is added. When you now edit user share scripts readme.txt, the auto commands are checked in the order in which they were defined, and the star.txt pattern matches, thus set f text is executed to set the file type to text. The pattern for Ruby matches too, and the set f Ruby is executed, but since file type was already set to text, nothing happens here. When you edit the file, user share scripts foobar, the same auto commands are checked, only the one for Ruby matches, and set f Ruby sets file type to Ruby. Recognizing by contents. If your file cannot be recognized by its file name, you might be able to recognize it by its contents. For example, many script files start with a line like pound bang slash bin slash xyz. To recognize this script, create a file scripts.vim in your runtime directory, and it might go something like this if did file type finish end if and then you can check the first line to see if it matches xyz with set f xyz once again the preferred method for this now as an editor's note is vim.file type instead chapter 44 your own syntax highlighted Vim comes with highlighting for a couple of hundred different file types. If the file you're editing isn't included, read this chapter to find out how to get this type of file highlighted. Also see Help Syn Define for the reference manual.
Chapter 44.1, Basic Syntax Commands. Using an existing syntax file to start with will save you a lot of time. Try finding a syntax file in Vim Runtime Syntax for a language that's similar. These files will also show you the normal layout of a syntax file. To understand it, you need to read the following. Let's start with the basic arguments. Before we start defining any new syntax, we need to clear out any old definitions with syntax clear. This isn't required in the final syntax file, but very useful when experimenting. There are more simplifications in this chapter. If you're writing a syntax file to be used by other, read all the way through to the end to find out details. Listing defined items. To check which syntax items are currently defined, use this command, syntax. You can use this to check which items have actually been defined. Quite useful when you are experimenting with a new syntax file. It also shows the colors used for each item, which helps to find out what is what. To list the items in a specific syntax group, use syntax list group name. This also can be used to list clusters. Just include the at in the name. Matching case. Some languages are not case sensitive, such as Pascal. Others such as C are case sensitive. You need to tell which you have with the following commands, syntax case match or syntax case ignore. The match argument means that Vim will match the case of syntax elements. Therefore, lowercase int differs from int with a capital I and caps int. If the ignore argument is used, the following are equivalent, procedure with a capital P, all caps procedure and procedure with lowercase. The syntax case commands can appear anywhere in a syntax file and affect the syntax definitions that follow. In most cases, you have only one syntax case in your syntax file. If you work with an unusual language that contains both case-sensitive and non-case-sensitive elements, however, you can scatter the syntax case commands throughout the file. Chapter 44, Part 2, Keywords. The most basic syntax elements are keywords. To define a keyword, use the following form syntax keyword and then group and the keywords the group is the name of the syntax group with the highlight command you can assign colors to a group the keyword argument is an actual keyword here's an example syntax keyword x type int long char syntax keyword x statement if then else and if this example uses the group names x type and x statement by convention each group is prefixed by the file type for the language being defined this example defines syntax for the X language, an X ample language, without an interesting name. In a syntax file for CSH scripts, the name CSH type could be used, thus the prefix is equal to the value of file type. These commands cause the words int, long, char to be highlighted one way, and the words if, then, else, and if to be highlighted another way. Now you need to connect the X group names to standard Vim highlights. You can do this with the following commands. Highlight link X type type and highlight link x statement statement. This tells Vim to highlight x type like type and x statement like statement. See help group name for the standard names. <clears throat> Unusual keywords. The characters used in the keyword must be in the is keyword option. If you use another character, the word will never match. Vim doesn't give a warning message for this. The x language uses the dash keyword character in keywords. This is how it's done. Set local is keyword plus equals dash Syntax keyword x statement when dash not. The set local command is used to change is keyword and the current buffer. Still, it does change the behavior of commands like w and star. If this is not wanted, don't define a keyword but use a match, explained in the next section. The x language allows for abbreviation. For example, next can be abbreviated to n, ne, or nex. You can define them by using this command. Syntax keyword x statement n with a left bracket ext right bracket. This doesn't match next one. Keywords always match whole words only. Chapter 44, Pipe 3. Matches. Consider defining something a bit more complex. You want to match ordinary identifiers. To do this, you define a syntax match item. This one matches any word consisting of only lowercase letters. So syntax match x identifier slash word boundary backslash l backslash plus word boundary slash. So keywords override any other syntax item. Thus keywords if then etc will be keywords as defined with the syntax keyword commands above, even though they also match the pattern for x identifier. 
The part at the end is a pattern, like it's used for searching. The two slashes is used to surround the pattern, like how it's done as substitute command. You can use another character, like a plus or a quote. Now to find a match for a comment. The X language uses pound to the end of the line. So syntax match X comment is slash pound dot star slash. Since you can use any search pattern, you can highlight very complex things with a match item. See pattern for help on search patterns. <clears throat> Chapter 44, part four, regions. In the example xlang, strings are enclosed in double quotation marks. To highlight strings, you define a region, and then you need a region start, double quote, and a region end, double quote. Definition is as follows. Syntax region x string with start equals slash double quote slash and n equ end equals slash double quote slash. The start and end directives define the patterns used to find the start and end of the region. But what about strings that look like this? A string with a double quote and an escaped back double quote in it double quote. This creates a problem. The double quotation marks in the middle of the string will end the region. You need to tell them to skip over any escaped double quotes in the string. Do this with the skip keyword. Syntax region x string start equals slash quote slash skip equals slash backslash backslash quote slash and end equals search of double quote. The double backslash matches a single backslash, since the backslash is generally a special character in search patterns. When to use a region instead of a match. The main difference is that a match item is a single pattern, which must match as a whole. A region starts as soon as the start pattern matches, and whether the end pattern is found or not doesn't matter. Thus, when the, end when the item depends on the end pattern to match, you cannot use a region. Otherwise, regions are often simpler to define. And it's easier to use nested items, as is explained in the next section. Chapter 44, Part 5. Nested items. Take a look at this comment. Percent get input, and then to do, colon, skip whitespace. You want to highlight to do in big yellow letters, even though it is in a comment that's in highlighted blue. To let them know about this, you define the following syntax group. Syntax keyword x to do, and then you're searching for to do, and contained. Syntax match x comment slash percent dot star slash contains equals x to do. In the first line, the contained argument tells Vim that this keyword it can exist only inside another syntax item. The next line has contains equals x to do. This indicates that the x to do syntax element is inside it. The result is that the comment line as a whole is matched with x comment and made blue, and the word to do inside it is matched by x to do and highlighted yellow. Highlighting for x to do was set up for this. Recursive nesting. The x language defines code blocks in curly braces, and a code block may contain other code blocks. This can be defined this way. Syntax region x block start is a search for left and end is a search for right curly, and contains equals x block. So suppose you have uh, the text while i less than b curly if a less if a then b equals c right curly right curly. First an x block starts at the first left curly in the line. In the second line another left curly is found. Since we are inside an x block item and it contains itself, a nested x block item will start here. Thus b equals c is inside the second level x block region. Then a right curly is found in the next line, which matches with the end pattern of the region. This ends the nested x block. Because the right curly is included in the nested region, it's hidden from the first x block region. Then at the last right curly, the first x block region ends. Keeping the end. Consider the following two syntax items. Syntax region x comment start equals percent and equals dollar and contained. Syntax region x preproc start equals pound and equals dollar contains x comment. You define a comment as anything from percent to the end of the line. A preprocessor directive is anything from the pound to the end of the line. And because you can have a comment on a preprocessor line, the preprocessor definition includes a contains equals x argument. Now look what happens with this text. 
pound define x equals y and percent comment text int equals foo. What you see is that the second line is also commented as x preproc. The preprocessor directive should end at the end of the line. That's why you use n equals the search for dollar. So what's going wrong? The problem is the contained comment. The comment starts with percent and ends at the end of the line. After the comment ends, the preprocessor syntax continues. This is after the end of the line has been, so the next line is included as well. To avoid this problem and to keep and to avoid a contained syntax item eating a needed end of line, use the keep end argument. This takes care of the double end of line matching. Containing many items. You can use the contains argument to specify that everything can be contained. For example, syntax region x list start equals a search for a left bracket and end is search for right bracket and contains equals all caps all. All syntax items will be contained in this one. It also contains itself, but not at the same position. That would cause an endless loop. You can specify that some groups are not contained, thus contain all groups but the ones that are listed. So set syntax region x list with the same search but contains equals all but comma x string. With the top item, you can include all items that don't have a contained argument. Contained is also used to only include items with a contained argument. See help sin contains for the details. Chapter 44, part 6, following groups. The X language has statements in this form, if, condition, then. And you want to highlight the three items differently, but the condition and then might also appear in other places where they get different highlighting. This is how you can do that. Syntax match x if slash if slash next group equals x if condition and skip white. Syntax match x if condition, which searches for a left parenthesis, anything inside a left parenthesis and then a right parenthesis, contained next group equals x then, skip white. And syntax match x then, which is just a search for then and contained. The next group argument specifies which item can come next. This is not required. If none of the items are specific are found, nothing happens. For example, in this text, if not condition, then the if is matched by x if. Not, not doesn't match the specified next group condition, thus only the if is highlighted. The skip white argument tells Vim that the white space, spaces in tab, may appear between the items. Similar arguments are skip new line, which allows a line break in between the items, and skip empty, which allows empty line. Notice that skip NL doesn't skip an empty line. Something must match after the line break. Chapter 44, Part 7 Other Arguments Match Group When you define a region, the entire region is highlighted according to the group name specified. To highlight the text enclosed in parentheses with the group x inside, for example, use the following command. Syntax region x inside start equals search for left parenthesis and equals search for right parenthesis. Suppose you want to highlight the parentheses differently. You can do this with a lot of convoluted region statements or you can use the match group argument. This tells Vim to highlight the start and end of a region with different highlight groups, in this case, x paren. Syntax region x inside match group equals x paren and then the same start and end. The match group argument applies to the start or end match that comes after it. In the previous example, both start and end are highlighted with x paren. To highlight the end with x paren end, syntax region x inside match group paren x paren start equals the search for left match group x paren end and then the end search. A side effect of using match group is that contained items will not match in the start or end of the region. The example for transparent uses this. In a C language file, you would like to highlight the left parent right parent text after a while differently from the left parent right parent text after a four. In both of these, there can be nested left and right parentheses, which should be highlighted in the same way. You must make sure the left parent right parent um, highlighting stops at the matching right parent. This is this is one way to do this. Syntax region C while match group equals C while start is slash while white space left parent end is slash right parent contains equals C cond nest. 
syntax region C4, match group equals C4, start 4, slash S star, left parent, and end equals slash right parent, slash, and contains equals C cond nest. Syntax region C cond nest, start is left parent, end equals right parent, contained transparent. Now you can give C while and C4 different highlighting. The C cond nest item can appear in either of them, but take over the highlighting of the item it is contained in. The transparent argument causes this. Notice that the match group argument has the same group as the item itself. Why define it then? Well, the side effect of using a match group is that contained items are not found in the match while the start item is. This avoids that the C cond nest group matches the left parent just after the while or for. If this would happen, it would span the whole text until the matching right parent, and the region would continue after it. Now C cond nest only matches after the match with the start pattern, thus after the first left parent. Offsets. Suppose you want to define a region for the text between left parent and right parent after an if. But you don't want to include the if or the left parent or right parent. You can do this by specifying offsets for the patterns. Example, syntax region xcond is start equals if white space and then slash ms equals e plus one. Notice we're doing some of the same offsets we did before and end equals slash parent slash me equals s minus one. The offset for the start position is me s ms equals e plus one. The ms stands for match start and this defines an offset for the start of the match. Normally the match starts where the pattern matches. E plus one means the match now starts at the end of the pattern match and then one character further. The offset for the end of the pattern is ME equals S minus one. The ME stands for match end. S minus one means the start of the pattern match and then one character back. The result of it in if foo equals bar inside of parentheses is only foo equals bar will be highlighted as X con. For more about offsets, see help sin pattern offset. One line. The one line argument indicates that the region does not cross a line boundary. For example, syntax region x if then start slash if n equals then one line. This defines a region that starts at an if and ends at then. But if there is no then after the if, this region does not match. When using one line, the region doesn't start if the end pattern doesn't match in the same line. Without one line, Vim does not check if there is a match for the end pattern. The region starts even when the end pattern doesn't match in the rest of the file. Continuation lines and avoiding them. Things now become a little more complex. Let's define a preprocessor line. This starts with a pound in the first column and continues until the end of the line. A line that ends with backslash makes the next line a continuation line. The way you handle this is to allow the syntax item to contain a continuation pattern. Syntax region x preproc starts equals beginning of line pound and end is end of line contains equals x line continue. Syntax match x line continue with slash slash star and contained. In this case, although x preproc normally matches a single line, the group contained in it namely x line continue, lets it go on for more than one line. For example, it would span both of these lines where pound define spam, 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 with a backslash at the end of the line and then bacon and spam. In this case, this is what you want. If it is not what you want, you can call for the region to be on a single line by adding the exclude nl to the contained pattern. For example, if you want to highlight end in x preproc, but only at the end of the line, to avoid making x preproc continue on the next line, like x line continue does, use exclude nl. Exclude nl must be placed before the pattern since x line continue doesn't have exclude nl. A match with it will extend x preproc to the next line as before. Chapter 44.8, Clusters. One of the things you will notice as you start to write a syntax file is that you wind up generating a lot of syntax groups. Vim, Vim enables you to define a collection of syntax groups called a cluster. Suppose you have a language that contains for loops, if statements, while loops, and functions. Each of them contains the same syntax elements, numbers, and identifiers. You can define them like this. Syntax match x4, which is search for x4.star, 
contains equals x number x indent, and the same contains will be used for x if and x while. You have to repeat the same contains each time. If you want to add another contained item, you have to add it three times. Syntax clusters simplify these definitions by enabling you to have one cluster stand for several syntax groups. To define a cluster for the two items that the three groups contain, use the following command. Syntax cluster x state contains equals x number comma x ident. Clusters are used inside other syntax items just like any syntax group, but their names start with at. So you must define them with contains equals at x state. You can add new group names to this cluster with the add argument with syntax cluster x state add equals x string. And you can remove syntax groups from this list as well with syntax cluster x state remove equals x number. Chapter 44, part 9, including another syntax file. The C++ language syntax is a superset of the C language. Because you do not want to write two syntax files, you can have the C++ syntax file read in the C by using the following command. Runtime bang syntax slash c .vim. The runtime command searches runtime path for all syntax slash c.vim files. This makes the C part of the C++ syntax be defined like for C files. If you replace the c.vim syntax file or added items with an extra file, these will be loaded as well. After loading the C syntax items, the specific C++ items can be defined. For example, add keywords that are not used in C, syntax keyword cpp statement new delete this friend using. This works just like in any other syntax file. Now consider the Perl language. A Perl script consists of two distinct parts, a documentation section in the pod format and a program written in Perl itself. The pod section starts with equals head and ends with equals cut. You want to define the pod syntax in one file and use it from the Perl syntax file. The syntax include command reads in a syntax file and stores the element it defined in a syntax cluster. For Perl, the statements are as follows. Syntax include at pod s file colon p colon h slash pod dot vim and syntax region Perl pod start with the search for start of line equals head and end equals start of line equals cut contains equals at pod. The equals head is found in a Perl file. The Perl pod region starts. In this region, the at pod cluster is contained. All the other items as top level items in the pod.vim syntax files will match there. When equals cut is found, the region ends and we go back to the items defined in the Perl file. The syntax include command is clever enough to ignore a syntax clear command in the included file, and an argument such as contain equals all will only contain items defined in the included file, not in the file that was include that includes it. <clears throat> the s file ph part uses the name of the current file, expands it to the full path, and then takes the head. This results in the directory name of the file. This causes the pod.vim file in the same directory to be loaded. Chapter 44, part 10, synchronizing. Compilers have it easy. They start at the beginning of a file and parse it straight through. Vim does not have it so easy. It must start in the middle where the editing is being done. So how does it tell where it is? The secret is the syntax sync command. This tells Vim how to figure out where it is. For example, the following command tells Vim to scan backward for the beginning or end of a C style comment and begin syntax coloring from there. Syntax sync C comment. You can tune this processing with some arguments. The min line arguments tells Vim the minimum number of lines to look backward, and the max line tells the editor the max number of lines to look forward. For example, the following command tells Vim to look at at least 10 lines before the top of the screen. Syntax sync C comment min lines is 10, max lines is 500. If it cannot figure out where it is in that space, it starts looking farther back until it figures out what to do. But it looks no further back than 500 lines. A large max lines can slow down processing, a small one might cause synchronization to fail. To make synchronizing go a bit faster, tell Vim which syntax items can be skipped. Every match and region that only needs to be used when actually displaying text can be given the display argument. By default, the comment to be found will be colored as part of the comment syntax group. If you want to color things another way, you can specify a different syntax group with syntax sync c comment x alt comment. If your programming language does not have C style, C style comments in it, you can try another method of synchronization. The simplest way is to tell Vim to space back a number of lines and try to figure out things from there. The following command tells Vim to go back 150 lines and start parsing from there. Syntax sync min lines equals 150. A large, a large min lines value can make Vim slower, especially when scrolling backwards in the file. 
Finally, you can specify a syntax group to look for by using this command. Syntax sync match sync group name group here group name pattern. This just tells Vim that when it sees pattern and the syntax group named group name begins just after the pattern given. For example, in the shell scripting language begins an if statement with if and it ends with fi. <coughs> to define a group here directive for the syntax, you can use the following command. Syntax sync mac sh if sync group here sh if if. The group there argument tells Vim that the pattern ends a group. For example, the end of the if phi group is as follows, syntax sync match sh if sync group there none equals phi. In this example, the none tells Vim that you are not in a special syntax region. In fact, you're not inside an if block. You can also define matches in regions that are with no group here or group there arguments. These groups are for syntax groups skipped during synchronization. For example, the following skips over anything inside of curly braces, even if it would normally match another synchronization method. Syntax sync match x special searches for curly brace dot star curly brace. More about synchronizing in the reference manual. Chapter 44, part 11. Installing a syntax file. When your new syntax file is ready to be used, drop it in a syntax directory in runtime path. For a Unix, that would be config and vim syntax. The name of the syntax file must be equal to the file type with .vim added. Thus, for the X language, the full path would be config and vim syntax x.vim. You can also make the file type be recognized. See chapter 43, part 2. If your file works, you might want to make it available to other vim users. First, read the next section and make sure the file works well for others, and then email it to the vim maintainer at maintainer at vim.org. Also explain how the file type can be detected. With a bit of luck, your file could be included in the next Vim version. Adding to an existing syntax file. We were assuming before you were adding a completely new syntax file. When an existing syntax file works but is missing some items, you can add these in a separate file. This avoids changing the distributed syntax file, which will be lost when installing a new version of Vim. Write syntax files in your file, possibly using group names from the existing syntax. For example, to add a new variable types to the C syntax file, you could do syntax keyword C type off underscore T U int. Write the file with the same name as the original syntax file, in this case, c.vim. Place it in a directory near the end of runtime path. This makes it loaded after the original syntax file. For Unix, this could be config and vim after syntax c.vim. Chapter 44, part 12. Wouldn't it be nice if all Vim users exchanged syntax files? To make this possible, the syntax file must follow a few guidelines. Start with a header that explains what the syntax file is for, who maintains it, and when it was last updated. Don't include too much information about change history. Not many people will read it. For example, include Vim syntax file, language C, maintainer Bram Moolinar, last change 2001 June 18, remark included by the C++ syntax. Use the same layout as other syntax files. Using an existing syntax file as an example will save you a lot of time. Choose a good descriptive name for your syntax file. Use lowercase letters and digits. Don't make it too long, and it used in many places. The name of the syntax file, name.vim, file type, b current syntax, and the start of each syntax group, name type, name statement, name string, etc. Start with a check for b current syntax. If it's defined, some other syntax file earlier in runtime path was already loaded, so then finish. Set B current syntax to the name of the current syntax at the end. Don't forget that included files do this too. You might have to reset B current syntax if you include two files. Do not include anything that is a user preference. Don't set tab stop, expand tab, etc. Those belong in a file type plugin. Do not include mappings or abbreviations. Only include setting is keyword if it's really necessary for recognizing keywords. To allow users select their own preferred colors, make a different group name for every kind of highlighted item, then link each one to one of the standard highlight groups. That will make it work with every color scheme. If you select specific colors, it will look bad with some color schemes. And don't forget that some people use a different background color or have only eight colors available. For the linking, use high def link so that the user can select different highlighting before your syntax file is loaded. For example, high def link name string string and high def link name number number etc. 
add the display argument to items that are not used when syncing to beat up scrolling and control L. Chapter 45, select your language, locale. The messages in Vim can be given in several languages. This chapter explains how to change which one is used. Also, the different ways to work with files in various languages is explained. Chapter 45, Part 1, Language for Messages. When you start Vim, it checks the environment to find out what language you are using. Mostly this should work fine, and you get the messages in your language, if they are available. To see what the current language is, use the command language. If it replies with C, this means the default is being used, which is English. What if you would like your messages in a different language? There are several ways. Which one you should use depends on the capabilities of your system. The first way is to set the environment to the de desired language before starting Vim. Example for Unix would be envlang equals de underscore de dot iso underscore 8859 dash 1 Vim. This only works if the language is available on your system. The advantage is that all the GUI messages and the things in libraries will use the right language as well. A disadvantage is that you must do this before starting Vim. If you want to change the language while Vim is running, you can use the second method, colon language fr underscore fr dot iso underscore 8859 one. This way you can try out several names for your language. You will get an error message when it's not supported on your system. You, um, you don't get an error when translated messages are not available. Vim will silently fall back to using English. To find out which languages are supported on your system, find the directory where they are listed. On my system, it's slash user slash share slash locale. On some systems, it's in user lib locale. The manual page for set locale should give you a hint about where it's found on your system. Be careful to type the name exactly as it should be. Upper and lowercase matter and the dash and underscore characters are easily confused. You can also set the language separately for messages, edit the text, and time format. See help language. Do it yourself message translation. If translated messages are not available for your language, you could write them yourself. To do this, get the source code for Vim and the GNU Git text package. After unpacking the sources, instructions can be found in the directory source slash po slash readme.txt. It's not too difficult to do the translation. You don't need to be a programmer. You must know both English and the language you're translating to, of course. When you're satisfied with the translation, consider making it available to others. Upload it to github.com slash vim slash vim or email it to the vim maintainers, maintainer at vim.org, or both. Chapter 45, Part 2, Language for Menus. The default menus are in English. To be able to use your local language, they must be translated. Normally, this is automatically done for you if the environment is set for your language, just like with messages. You don't need to do anything extra for this, but it only works if translations for the language are available. Suppose you're in Germany, with the language set to German, but prefer to use file instead of date. Date? Sorry, Germans. You can switch back to using the English menus this way. Set lang menu equals none. It's also possible to specify a language. Set lang menu equals nl underscore nl dot iso underscore 8859 one. Like above, the differences between dash and underscore matter. However, upper and lowercase differences are ignored here. The lang menu option must be set before the menus are loaded. Once the menus have been defined, changing lang menu has no direct effect. Therefore, put the command to set lang menu in your vimrc file. If you really want to switch menu language while running Vim, you can do it this way. Source Vim runtime slash del menu dot Vim, set the language, and then source Vim runtime menu dot Vim. There is one drawback. All menus that you defined yourself will be gone. You will need to redefine them as well. Do it yourself menu, menu translation. To see which menu translations are available, look in this directory, Vim runtime slash lang. The files are called menu underscore language dot Vim. If you don't see the language you want to use, you can do your own translations. The simplest way to do this is by copying one of the existing fi language files and change it. First, find out the name of your language with the language command. Use this name but with all letters made lowercase. Then copy the file to your own runtime directory as found early in runtime path. For example, for Unix you would do 
bang cp vim runtime lang menu kokr dot euchre dot vim to config and vim lang menu nlb dot iso underscore eight eight five dash nine dot vim and you'll find hints for the translation in vim runtime lang readme.txt. Chapter 45, part three, using another encoding. Vim guesses that the files you are going to edit are encoded for your language. For many European languages, this is Latin one, and then each byte is one character. This means that there are 256 different characters possible. For Asian languages, this is not sufficient. These mostly use a double byte encoding, providing for over 10,000 possible characters. This still isn't enough when a text is contained several different languages. This is where Unicode comes in. It was designed to include all characters used in commonly used languages. This is the super encoding that replaces all the others, but it isn't used that much yet. Editor's note, I think it's used, I think it's used pretty regularly now. Fortunately, Vim supports these three kinds of encodings, and with some restrictions, you can use them even when your environment uses another language than the text. Nevertheless, when you only edit files that are in the coding of your language, the default should work fine and you don't need to do anything. The following is only relevant when you want to change or edit different languages. Using Unicode in the GUI. The nice thing about Unicode is that the other encodings can be converted to it and back without losing information. When you make Vim use Unicode internally, you'll be able to edit files in any encoding. Unfortunately, the number of systems supporting Unicode is still limited. <laughs> Thus, it's unlikely that your language uses it. You need to tell Vim you want to use Unicode and how to handle interfacing with the rest of the system. Let's start with the GUI version of Vim, which is able to display Unicode characters. This should work. Set encoding equals UTF-8. Set GUI font equals dash misc dash fix dash medium dash r dash normal dash dash 18 dash 120 dash 100 dash 100 dash c dash 90 dash iso 10646 dash 1. The encoding option tells Vim the encoding of the characters that you use. This applies to the text and buffers, files you're editing, registers, Vim script files, etc. You can disregard encoding as the setting for the internals of Vim. This example assumes you have this font on your system. The name in the example is for the X Windows system. This font is in a package that is used to enhance Xterm with Unicode support. For MS Windows, some fonts have a limited number of Unicode characters. Try using the Courier New font. You can use the edit slash select font dot 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 menu to select and try out the fonts available. Only fixed width fonts can be used though. Example, set GUI font equals Courier New colon H12. If it doesn't work well, try getting a font pack. Now, you've told Vim to use Unicode internally and display text with a Unicode font. Using Unicode in a Unicode terminal. There are terminals that support Unicode directly. The standard Xterm that comes with XFree86 is one of them. Let's use that as an example. First of all, the Xterm must have been compiled with Unicode support. Start with the Xterm with dash U8 argument. You might also need to specify a font. For example, X U term or X term dash U8 dash MN dash mix dash fix dash medium dash R dash normal dash dash 18 dash 120 dash 100 dash 100 dash C dash 90 dash ISO 10646 dash 1. Now you can run Vim inside the terminal. Using Unicode in an ordinary terminal. Suppose you want to work with Unicode files but don't have a terminal with Unicode support. You can do this with Vim, although characters that are not supported by the terminal will not be displayed. The layout of the text will be preserved. Try editing a file with Unicode characters in it. You will notice that Vim will put a question mark or underscore or some other character in places where a character should be that the terminal can't display. Move the cursor to a question mark and use the command GA. Vim will display a line with the code of the character. This gives you a hint about what character it is. You can look it up in a Unicode table. You could actually view a file that way if you have lots of time at hand. Note. Since encoding is used for all text inside Vim, changing it makes all non-ASCII text invalid. You will notice this when using registers and a SHADA file. It's recommended to set encoding in your VimRC file and leave it alone. Chapter 45, Part 4. Editing files with a different encoding. Suppose you have set up Vim to use Unicode and you want to edit a file that's in 16-bit Unicode. Sounds simple, right? Well. Vim actually uses UTF-8 encoding internally, thus the 16-bit encoding must be converted, since there is a difference between the character set, Unicode, and the encoding, UTF-8 or 16-bit. Vim will try to detect what kind of file you're editing. It uses the encoding names in the File Encodings option. 
when using Unicode, the default value is UCS-BOM, comma, UTF-8, comma, Latin-1. This means that Vim checks the file to see if it's one of the encodings. UCS-BOM, file must start with a byte order mark. This allows detection of 16-bit, 32-bit, and UTF-8 Unicode encodings. UTF-8 is UTF-8 Unicode. This is, reje this is rejected when a sequence of byte is illegal in UTF-8 and Latin-1. The good old 8-bit encoding always works. When you start editing that 16-bit Unicode file and it has a BOM, Vim will detect this and convert the file to UTF-8 when reading it. The file encoding option, without an S at the end, is set to the detected value. In this case, it's UTF-16LE. That means it's Unicode, 16-bit, and Little Endian. This file format is common on MS Windows, for example, with registry files. When writing the file, Vim will compare file encoding and encoding. If they're different, the text will be converted. An empty value for file encoding means that no conversion is to be done, thus the text is assumed to be encoded with encoding. If the default file encodings value is not good for you, set it to the encodings you want Vim to try. Only when a value is found to be invalid will the next one to be used. Putting Latin first doesn't work because it's never illegal. As an example, to fall back to Japanese when the file doesn't have a bomb and isn't UTF-8 is set file encoding equals UCS-BOM, UTF-8, or SJIS. See encoding values for suggested values. Other values may work as well, but this depends on the conversion available. Forcing and encoding. If the automatic detection doesn't work, you must tell them what encoding the file is. For example, edit plus plus ank equals KOI18-R, Russian.txt. The plus plus ank part specifies the name of the encoding to be used for this file only. Vim will convert the file from the specified encoding, Russian in this example, to encoding. File encoding will also be set to the specified encoding so that the reverse conversion can be done when writing the file. The same argument can be used when writing the file. This way you can actually use Vim to convert a file. For example, write plus plus ank equals UTF-8, Russian.txt. Conversion may result in lost characters. Converging from an encoding to Unicode and back is mostly free of this problem unless there are illegal characters. Conversion from Unicode to other encodings often loses information when there was more than one language in the file. <clears throat> Chapter 45, Part 5. Entering Language Text. Computer keyboards don't have much more than 100 keys. Some languages have thousands of characters, and Unicode has over 100,000. So how do you type these characters? First of all, when you don't use too many of the special characters, you can use digraphs. This was already explained in Chapter 24. When you use a language that uses many more characters than keys on your keyboard, <clears throat> you will want to use an input method, or an IM. This requires learning the translation from typed keys to resulting characters. When you need an IM, you probably already have one on your system. It should work with them like with other programs. Key maps. For some languages, the character set is different from Latin, but uses a sim similar number of characters. It's possible to map keys to characters. Vim uses key maps for this. Suppose you want to type Hebrew. You can load the key map like this. Set key map equals Hebrew. Vim will try to find a key map file for you. This depends on the value of encoding. If no matching file was found, you will get an error message. Now you can type Hebrew in insert mode. In normal mode and when typing a colon command, Vim automatically switches to English. You can use this command to switch between Hebrew and English, control caret. This only works in insert mode and command line mode. In normal mode, it does something completely different and jumps to an alternate file. The usage of the key map is indicated in the mode message. If you have the show mode option set, in the GUI, Vim will indicate the usage of key maps with a different cursor color. You can also change the usage of the key map with the IM insert and IM search options. To see the list of mappings, use this command, colon L map. To find out which key map files are available in the GUI, you can use the edit slash key map menu. Otherwise, you can use this command, echo glob path, ampersand RTP, and key map slash star dot Vim. Do it yourself key maps. You can create your own key map file. It's not very difficult. Start with a key map file that's similar to the language you want to use. Copy it to the key map directory in your runtime directory. 
For example, for Unix, you would use the directory .config slash nvim slash keymap. The name of the keymap file must look like this, keymap slash name dot vim or keymap slash name underscore encoding dot vim. Name is the name of the keymap. Choose a name that's obvious but different from existing keymaps, unless you want to replace an existing keymap file. Name cannot contain underscores. Optionally add the encoding used after an underscore, for example, keymap slash Hebrew dot vim or keymap slash Hebrew underscore UTF-8 dash vim. The contents of the file should be self-explanatory. Look at a few of the key maps that are distributed with them. For the details, see mbyte dash key map. As a last resort, if all other methods fail, you can enter any character with control V. To enter an 8-bit character, type control V123. That's the decimal range for 0255. For 8 bits, you can do control V X and A1 for a hexadecimal 0 through FF. For a 16-bit, you can do control V, U, lowercase, and then something like 013B for a hexadecimal from 0000 to FFFF. And finally, for a 31-bit, control V, capital U, 001303A4, which would be a range of hexadecimal 0000000 000 to 7FFFFF. Don't type the spaces. See I underscore control dash V digit for the details. Wow, you're still here? <laughs> I assume by now you've probably left a comment of the thing that you really liked and smashed the like button and subscribe. If you enjoyed this, we're going to be doing other crazy stuff like this this year, trying all sorts of new things and new kinds of content. Hope you really enjoyed it. I enjoyed reading it uh, and... <laughs> just kind of ridiculous, but I'm glad that I did it, uh, even if my voice <laughs> sounded like this for the rest of the week. Thanks, everybody, and I hope you enjoyed this read-through of the NeoVim user manual. Look out for it on Audible or wherever else. You may buy audiobooks hopefully soon. Bye!